Hey everyone and welcome to the best of January 2022. It's crazy to think that we're already in 2022. We have a little bit over 10 hours worth of horror stories. I hope you enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Let's aim for 1500 likes. I definitely think we could pull it off. Subscribing if you're new is also very much appreciated as I post content just like this all the time. Enjoy the video, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. Here, your new mittens are done. These ought to serve you well after yesterday's snowstorm left the entire countryside covered in snow. You'll have to bundle up well if you want to go play outside. My older sister said right after she finished knitting me a pair of mittens. Knitting clothes had been her specialty for as long as I could remember. I'll never forget the time she grabbed a pile of spare wool and crafted an adorable sheep costume for me to wear in our village's Mardi Gras costume party. In fact, knitting clothes and selling them on commission or at the village's market was one of our family's main sources of income. And by our family, I only mean my older sister and I, since we were the only ones that were left being 19 and 9 years old, respectively. During its greatest extent, our household had consisted of five people. My father, my mother, my older brother, my older sister and I, the youngest child and second daughter. And I would see it gradually shrink before my eyes across my nine years of continued existence. My mother was the first one to go. My father and her attempted to bring another child to the world when I was only two years old, but something went wrong in the process, causing her to fall terribly ill and pass away a few weeks afterwards. My father was the next one. He left home when I was seven years old alongside a large number of other men, as our emperor had called them all to go to Russia and he never came back. Lastly, my 16-year-old brother had left us only a few months ago. Not unlike my father, he had also been called by our emperor. Only this time, it was to join him on a daring campaign to defend our country from an impending invasion by a coalition of other nations we were at war with. So I bundled up by putting on my new pair of mittens, as well as a thick and fluffy fur coat that covered my entire body from the top of my shoulders to the end of my legs. And lastly, a long woolen scarf, which my sister had also knitted for me in the past that I wrapped around my head, covering it as well as my ears and neck. After getting properly dressed to face the low temperatures, I joyfully said goodbye to my sister and stepped outside my house ready to spend that chilly December afternoon having fun in my snow-coated humble little village, tucked away at the edge of a relatively dense and remote forest. I loved playing and roaming around my village and its surroundings, especially now that the first snowfalls had arrived and had blanketed everything in a dense layer of white snow that made the environment twice as beautiful. My favorite place to spend my leisure time in was the forest right beside the village. It had such a magical feeling to it. A bustling sea of towering trees teeming with life, wonder, beauty, and endless possibilities for fun and adventure, practically begging to be explored from top to bottom by children such as myself. I happily roamed the woods playing with the snow trying to count how many wild animals, such as hares or birds, I could spot, and skipping around while pretending to be a fairy. After about an hour of aimlessly roaming around and enjoying myself in a plethora of different ways, I eventually decided to follow a narrow trail that I had never explored before, and that led me deeper and deeper into the forest, until I stumbled upon something that had left me puzzled. It was a tunnel. A man-made one, made out of stone bricks and concrete. What was a tunnel doing in the middle of a forest? It was about 50 meters long. Uh, the other end of the tunnel could barely be seen from where I was standing in. But the space in between the two extremes was shrouded in darkness. 
It didn't seem to lead anywhere, as the only thing that could be seen on the other side was just more woodland. According to my grandpa, the ruins should be nearby. Said an echoing voice as I was still perplexingly staring at the mysterious tunnel and theorizing about its reason for existing. It sounded like the voice was coming from inside the tunnel itself. The voice from the tunnel was soon joined by the sound of continuous footsteps and other murmuring voices that were getting increasingly louder and clearer with each passing second. It was clear the people from the tunnel were getting closer. Three silhouettes emerged from the shadowy tunnel. They appeared to be children. Two boys and a girl to be exact. All of them looked to be about the same age as me. But as the mysterious kids and I simultaneously and silently stared at each other for a few seconds, I couldn't help but notice several details about them that felt rather off, mainly concerning their appearance and the clothes they wore. I recognized their outfits as winter gear, coats, scarves, hats, and gloves. However, the materials, the textures, and overall design of their clothes were unlike any I had ever seen. Is... is that a girl? One of the boys whispered to the other two kids under his breath as I quietly stared at them from a few feet away without moving a muscle. Yeah, I think so. What's she doing here, though? And what's the deal with her weird clothes? The other boy replied. I don't know. Maybe we should talk to her. The girl of the group suggested. It was then when I noticed yet another oddity. The way they spoke, I could understand them well enough to recognize their language as my own and hold a conversation with them with relative ease, but still, their mannerisms and vocabulary contained several words and expressions that were completely foreign to me. Hi, are you lost? The girl said to me, taking a step forward and waving with her gloved hands at me. Uh, hello. No, I live in a nearby village and I visit this forest quite frequently, as a matter of fact. I uttered back after thinking it through for a couple seconds. Excuse me, but has anyone in your village ever heard about fashion? No offense, but you kind of look like an old lady, with that antiquated fur coat you're wearing and that oversized scarf you've got wrapped around your head. Have you ever posted a picture of yourself dressed like this to social media? Because you would gain quite a few followers for sure. One of the boys exclaimed. I wanted to reply, but ultimately decided to keep silent after processing what the boy had said and realizing I had only understood the part where he had called me an old lady and had made fun of my clothes. But as for the rest of the things that had left his lips, I hadn't understood a thing. Social media? Posting pictures of myself? Gaining followers? What in the world was he talking about? Who were those kids? Where had they come from? Come on, guys, don't be rude. It's okay, I think you look great. I'm Emily, and these are Lewis and Mathis. Do you want to be our friends? The girl comforted me as she put her hand on my shoulder. I'm Juliet. I introduced myself and accepted Emily's friendship proposal. As odd as they were... There weren't many children my age I could play with at the village, so it was nice to finally have someone I could spend my afternoons with. I came back home later that evening feeling quite rejoiced, as my new friends and I had plenty of fun playing in the forest. As odd as I had initially found them to be, they turned out to be pretty nice once I actually got to know them. So much so that we had accorded to meet the following day at the same spot we first found each other. That ominous tunnel they had come from in the middle of the woods. But right when I approached our bed, as my sister and I sleep together in the same large bed that had once belonged to our parents, I noticed an odd piece of paper under the pillow, which I identified as a note upon closer inspection. Be wary of those who have slipped through the tunnel of time, for they are potential sources of chaos that will be put down without mercy if necessary. Signed, Tunnel Keepers. The note read. What are you reading, Juliet? 
My sister asked upon entering our bedroom. A note I found under the pillow. I replied. A note? Has our brother finally sent us correspondence from the front? My sister asked again, briefly letting out a smile of pure joy at the thought of hearing from our brother for the first time in months. I shook my head in her face expression, briefly changed to one of disappointment before morphing back into one of intrigue. It's not from our brother. It's from some strangers who apparently call themselves the Tunnel Keepers. Here, you should see it for yourself. Should we be worried? I said to her before handing her the note. The Tunnel Keepers. I honestly have no idea who those people could be. I'll, I'll look into it tomorrow, Juliet. But now it's time to go to bed. It's pretty late already. Good night. My sister replied after reading the note, seemingly sweeping it under the rug rather quickly. As she fell asleep in less than 10 minutes of laying in bed, but I certainly didn't, as the thought of that note, its mystery, and its implications persistently refused to leave my mind and let me sleep. Could those so-called tunnel keepers be related to the mysterious tunnel I had come across in the middle of the woods? Could they be related to Emily, Lewis, and Mathis? I was unsure of the latter, but their name made their connection with the tunnel from the forest seem almost obvious. Still, it was clear I couldn't come to any substantial conclusions just yet, as I needed more information in order to be able to formulate valid hypothesis. The next day arrived. After spending the whole morning at the village's market selling pieces of cloth alongside my sister and after having lunch, I headed to the forest in order to meet with Emily, Lewis, and Mathis, just as we had accorded the previous day, but with the added feeling of lingering uneasiness product the ominous note I had found in my bun. This omnipresent disturbance only increased once I came across a fallen tree right in the middle of the narrow pathway that led to the tunnel actively blocking my path, which was odd, since it was the only tree that had fallen among the dozens of trees that surrounded that narrow trail, and the other trees did not show any signs of damage either. Only that one tree, which just so happened to have fallen in the right position so as to represent an obstacle in my path to the tunnel. I started at the fallen tree, and thought about it for a few seconds. And then I remembered Emily. Lewis and Mathis were waiting for me, so I kept the memory of the fallen tree in the back of my mind, jumped over it, and pressed on towards the tunnel. Juliet, we're over here. I heard Emily, Lewis, and Mathis excitedly shout from right outside the tunnel. Hello again. What game do you want to play today? I joyfully asked as I approached them. Actually... We want to do the thing that we wanted to do when we came here yesterday that we never ended up doing because we found you and forgot about it. You see, we originally came to the forest because we're looking for the ruins of an abandoned village that several grown-ups we know have told us about. According to the local stories, the village used to be located somewhere near these woods. Some people speculate that its residents abandoned it due to a war, but no one really knows for sure what happened to it. Emily explained. An abandoned village near the forest? How come I've never heard of it before? The village I live in is located right next to the woods, but it's not abandoned. I live there. My sister lives there, and over 200 people live there. I can show it to you if you want to. I said. And thus, Emily, Lewis, Mathis, and I headed to my village, bypassing the mysterious fallen tree along the way. To say they were impressed by the village would be a severe understatement. They followed me across the village, all the while carrying facial expressions of complete wonder as they fixedly stared at everything around them. And they weren't the only ones, as practically every villager we'd pass by would also stare at my friends with the same fascination. Noticing this, I decided to discreetly lead them to my house and lend them clothes that had once belonged to my older sister and older brother, back when they had been my age. In order for them to not draw as much attention to themselves. Oh, by the way, I also want to show you this. I found it under my pillow yesterday. 
I told them as I showed them that weird note from the previous day written by those so-called tunnel keepers. These tunnel keepers. I bet they're related to the tunnel from the forest. Lewis son. Well, duh. I'm more worried about the people they talk about. The ones who slipped through the tunnel of time, as they put it. I think they're talking about us three. Mathis replied at Lewis, and Emily started to get visibly worrying. But what do these creepy strangers want from us? I'm... I'm getting scared, guys. Maybe we should go home already. It's almost dinner time. Emily suggested. Everyone unanimously agreed, and so Emily, Lewis, and Mathis left my home and village and headed back into the woods where they had come from as I was left home alone, thinking about the mystery of the tunnel keepers for a short while before my sister finally arrived home from the village's market. As my sister and I were getting ready to have dinner, I found a small and familiar piece of paper randomly laying on the floor right under the table. My heart rate started to go up as I slowly approached it and picked it up. Just as I was dreading, another note. You let the sources of chaos in, and now you've become a source of chaos yourself. Therefore, we'll proceed to do what must be done. We'll make sure those who you've recently sent home shall not cross the tunnel alive. Signed, Tunnel Keepers. Wait, Juliet, where are you going? Don't you want to eat dinner? My sister asked in confusion as I frantically bundled up and rushed outside. It was a shame because my sister had made fried onion for dinner, and I loved onion. I loved onion fried in oil because it tasted good. I'm fine. I'll be back in a moment, I promise. I exclaimed to her before I sprinted to the forest, determined to help my friends and save them from whoever those tunnel keepers were. Juliet! Juliet! Emily shouted as she ran towards me, her eyes soaked in tears. Emily, what happened? Where are Lewis and Mathis? I worryingly asked, noticing her despair. We were about to enter the tunnel and go home, but then a group of monsters came out of it and, and I ran, but Lewis and Mathis didn't react quick enough and they ate them, the tunnel keepers. They jumped at them and swallowed them both right in front of me. They're coming. They're coming for us, Juliet. Emily uttered in between sobs as she broke into tears. It didn't take long before I spotted them in the distance. There were at least 20 of them. Their elongated bodies swiftly dragged themselves across the forest while staying low to the ground with the help of a pair of long and thin extremities that sported two huge claws each. A pair of pointy protuberances on their heads looked to be their ears. As for their faces, they had two bright glowing yellow eyes and nothing else. They seemed to have no mouths or noses to speak of. Emily and I rushed back to the village as the tunnel keepers crawled towards us. They seemed to be slower than us, allowing us to reach the village with a slight time margin we could use to warn everybody but they kept pursuing us relentlessly nonetheless. Monsters! Monsters, help! Emily and I shouted across the stream. The commotion caught the attention of the village's small garrison of Imperial troops, which came to us to find out the cause behind our sudden warnings. They're coming to the village. We're in danger. We need to hide. I nervously told the soldiers. Easy there, kid. Who's coming? An enemy army? Is it the Russians or the Austrians, perhaps? I need more information, young lady. The garrison's captain replied. They're not humans. They're monsters. Big, scary, and dangerous monsters. I'm telling the truth, I swear. I clarified, feeling so tense I could almost feel my blood boiling inside my veins. The captain responded with a silent and smug smirk. Clearly not taking my word seriously, but he admitted he had nothing to lose for playing along, so I convinced him to pull out a spyglass and check the forest out from a distance. His face expression of mockery instantly turned into one of utter shock and horror once he spotted the horde of 
tunnel keepers emerging from the woods. My, my god, I can hardly believe it. But I'm afraid the kid is somehow right. We need to tell all villagers to dig in and prepare themselves for an attack. I have no idea what in the world those disgusting creatures could possibly be. But we must have courage and defend our people. We'll gather at the main gate and deny them entrance to the village by all means necessary. Understood? Now go. Long live France. Long live the Emperor. The captain exclaimed as he rallied his small force of 50 soldiers. Mostly made up of young conscripts, much like my older brother, that were almost certainly just as terrified as Emily and I were. And rushed to the village's main gate to intercept the tunnel keepers. The garrison outnumbered the monsters and did not hesitate to increasingly shoot volley after volley of musket balls and grenades at them. But they seemed to inflict no significant damage as the creatures aggressively pounced at the line of troops, catching 15 soldiers at once and consuming them by slowly and painfully absorbing them as if the creatures' enormous bodies and skin suddenly lost consistency and solidity and became something akin to quicksand, swallowing their poor victims whole as they screamed and helplessly struggled to liberate themselves to no avail. Their desperate cries for help being abruptly silenced as they vanished into the tunnel keeper's stomachs in a matter of seconds never to be seen again. Upon witnessing their comrades' demise, the garrison's captain immediately ordered a retreat as his line disintegrated into a chaotic mob of horrified and traumatized young men fleeing for their lives. The tunnel keepers swept through each street one by one effortlessly crushing the few brave souls who had dared to make a stand behind the numerous, improvised, and extremely rudimentary barricades scattered across the village. Most villagers, including Emily, my sister, and I, gathered at the village's square and hid inside the church. The square was, by far, the most well-defended area of the village, with a line of trenches reinforced by wooden fences and parapets made out of piled up sandbags. Among the defenders were most of the village's adult male population alongside what remained of the imperial garrison, including its captain. Despite literally throwing away their lives for our village, the defenders only managed to hold the line for less than two minutes before the trenches were overrun, and most defenders were consumed by the tunnel keepers as the women, children, and the battered remnants of the force that attempted to defend the trenches could do nothing but cower inside the church, which the tunnel keepers besieged as they climbed up its walls like spiders and shattered its windows. As a last resort to preserve the village's most valuable lives, it was agreed to evacuate all the children through the church's back door as every man and woman that could hold a gun would make a final stand in a suicide mission to distract the tunnel keepers and buy enough time for the children to escape safely. Don't cry, my little sister. I'll always be watching over you, as long as you never forget about me. All right, my dear? My sister comforted me as we gave each other one last hug with our faces soaked in tears. I... I love you. I shouted at her as Emily and I left the church and my sister picked up a musket laying on the floor and armed herself like the other adults, preparing to sacrifice themselves and engage the tunnel keepers head on. The tunnel. We need to get to the tunnel and cross through it. Emily said as we both ran into the woods. I briefly looked back at the village, only to find a pair of tunnel keepers had abandoned their peers and were now chasing us across the forest at full speed. Run faster. Run faster. I exclaimed to Emily as we approached the infamous tunnel. We entered the tunnel without a second thought, with the tunnel keepers on our heels. It was so dark, I couldn't see a thing. Not the other end of the tunnel. Not Emily running right beside me. Not the tunnel keepers pursuing us. Nothing. It was all pitch black but I could still hear everything very clearly. Emily's footsteps and heavy breathing as well as my own, and of course the tunnel keeper's heavy footsteps that intensely reverberated across the tunnel's walls and ceiling. 
I could hear them getting closer and closer and closer. Then Emily screams the sound of her footsteps in coordination with mine abruptly seized. It happened so fast I didn't have time to fully process it, so I kept running. As exhausted as I was without slowing down, without looking back, I needed to reach the exit of that hellish tunnel or die trying. As I desperately gasped for air and dropped to my knees after finally having reached the other end of the tunnel, I was overwhelmed by a sudden and uncomfortable silence. The tunnel keepers that had been chasing me so relentlessly did not come out of the tunnel to continue to pursue me, and vanished without a trace. The distant screams coming from the village had also ceased. Everything had mysteriously stopped. I was suddenly all alone in the middle of the woods. Surrounded by nature, peace, and quiet, that didn't really make me feel peaceful at all. After spending a considerable amount of time thinking about what I should do, I ultimately decided to head back to the village. In hopes of finding any survivors and finding my older sister specifically, instead the sight I was met with upon reaching the place I used to call home left me with such a feeling of inner emptiness and devastation I can hardly put it into words. But to put it simply, that place was not a village anymore. An extremely deteriorated wall or two stood, as well as the outline of their foundations barely visible in the ground, was all that remained of most houses, with some having completely collapsed and having become nothing more than a pile of rubble. The pavement on the streets had been buried under several layers of mud, moss, and weeds, and the town square and church had been almost entirely taken over by brambles and bushes. Was that a dirty, withered musket hidden beneath the tall grass? Were those bones and skulls scattered inside the overgrown, derelict church? Was that a pine tree surrounded by debris and a couple crumbling walls growing in the exact same place my house used to be? It was apparent the tunnel keepers alone could not have been responsible for the village's current state. It did not look like a village that had just been raided and deserted less than an hour prior. It looked like a village that had been completely abandoned, forgotten and rotting away for a really, really long time to the point it had been enveloped by vegetation and assimilated into the forest itself. I aimlessly trudged down a long road I had come across after exiting the woods and what was left of my old village. Traumatized, fatigued, cold and homeless as tears poured down my eyes like waterfalls and my teeth began to chatter due to being exposed to the frigid winter air out in the open in the middle of the night. I was suddenly blinded by an intense light that emanated from a pair of glowing orbs belonging to a creature that advanced towards me at an alarming speed. At first, I thought the tunnel keepers were back, but I was wrong. That thing was an entirely different being I had never seen before. It emitted a constant roaring noise as it rolled down the road with wheels similar to that of a carriage, but it moved autonomously without being pulled by any horses or any animal whatsoever. It also seemed to constantly release an odd gas of some kind. My brain instructed me to run away, but my body had already been physically and psychologically pushed to its absolute limit. I couldn't take it anymore. So I responded to the new threat by dropping to the ground and losing consciousness. When I woke up, I was no longer in the same place I had fainted in. No longer in the middle of a road out in the open, but indoors. Laying on a bed beside a room mostly painted white and filled with all sorts of strange appliances I did not recognize. Oh, you're awake. Hello, how are you feeling? said a young woman wearing a white coat as she walked into the room. I did not answer her. Instead, I just silently stared at her while raising an eyebrow in confusion. It's all right, sweetheart. You're in a hospital and I'm the nurse that's been assigned to take care of you. My name's Anne. It's wonderful to meet you. A truck driver brought you here. He said he'd found you alone in the middle of the road and that he nearly ran you over. 
Thankfully, he was able to react in time and hit the brakes at the last second. But you fainted right afterwards, so he decided to collect you and bring you here. You've been unconscious for about two hours. Why don't you tell me a bit about yourself? What's your name? Where are you from? Is there any grown-up you know and trust who we can reach out to? The nurse said after noticing how lost I was. Uh, my name's Juliet, and I have no clue where I'm from. I used to know it, but that was a very long time ago. My home is gone. My family is gone. My friends are gone. Everything I've ever known is gone. I don't feel like talking about it right now. I faintly and sobbingly uttered using what little energy and willpower I had left. I see. Don't worry, Juliet. You're tired and cold, but you can take all the time to recover you need. I'm here for you. Anne replied in a soft, motherly tone before she wrapped me in a blanket and started feeding me a bowl of hot soup. What followed was several minutes of silence during which Anne fed me a spoonful of soup after another as I curled up to her swaddled from top to bottom in a bulky white blanket. With neither of us saying a word, my mind was too busy processing all I had been through that day to talk. The more I remembered, the soggier my eyes got, and the harder it got to contain my urge to burst into tears. It's completely alright, dear. You can cry all you want. Don't hold back. And gently whispered to me. It was then that I let everything out and cried on her lap like I had never cried before as she wrapped her arms around my torso in a long, comforting embrace for what felt like ages. I cried for my sister, for my village, for Emily, Lewis, and Mathis. I cried because they had all died 200 years ago and they were never going to come back. I cried because the tunnel keepers had taken everything away from me. A lot has happened since I first crossed the tunnel that fateful evening of 1813 and emerged in 2013. I've since grown into a teenager that's more or less gotten accustomed to the modern world. I've gotten a new home, a new family, new friends, the chance to go to school, to learn foreign languages, and to dream of someday going to college and becoming a historian. All thanks to Anne, who I now have the joy to call my adoptive mother. But still, that feeling of dread has never fully disappeared. I'm aware the tunnel keepers have not gone away. I can still feel them. I can feel the nightmares and hear the villagers screams every time I go to sleep. I know they still see me as a source of chaos that has slipped through the tunnel of time. Because deep down, I know that's what I am. And I know they'll come for me. Restoring order is their duty. It's just a matter of time before I find their next note under the pillow. After all, they have all the time in the world. City apartments are rough. My first two places were both basements because that's what you can afford these days if you're looking to live alone. Third place, no lie, had a window facing a brick wall only three feet away. I was never looking for a spectacular view, I just wanted a decent window, until last month when I got one. I moved in December 1st, to this super small but super decent apartment only a few minute walk from the subway. The main living space extended from the kitchen, and a flimsy sliding door separated that from a small bedroom space, and the east wall of that bedroom space, a floor-to-ceiling window. Sure, it only overlooked the dirty street to hen, a small coffee place, and a huge community housing building, but my god, the air, the sounds, the sunlight, it was perfect and so shockingly affordable. I'll make a note here that I've never been much of a horror movie person, just never caught my interest. So when I couldn't find any bug reports on the building, it just seemed like a lucky break. Anyway, after settling my debt with my moving helpers, 
A six-pack of beer and a large pizza, obviously. They were off on their way and I began putting together my home. I started with the Wi-Fi and living space so I could work to some tunes. Then unbox some stuff for the kitchen. As I was sliding some plates into my cupboard, a knock came at my door. Shit, maybe my music was too loud. Standing on the other side of the door was a small woman wearing a hijab. I smiled apologetically. Sorry, is the music too loud? No, it's fine. The walls here are good. She assured me. I wanted to say hello. Welcome you to the building. Oh, I hadn't expected such a warm reception. I'd never been greeted by a neighbor in any of my previous places. Thanks so much. I'm Louis. Kibla, love to meet you. She peered into my apartment. This looks good. Do you need curtains? I can give you some. I have extra. Thanks, but I'll get around to it. I'm excited to get some December sunlight coming through. I said with a laugh. She didn't laugh. It's no problem. They are lovely curtains, and you need your privacy. She said. I chuckled, feeling some tension in the air. I'll make sure to get some curtains up soon. In the meantime, I'll hide all this. I gestured to my lackluster physique. Under wraps. Again, no reaction from my neighbor. A moment later, she forced a small laugh, then nodded. If you need anything, I'm down the hall. 1710. She nodded once more before turning away and retreating down the hall. I waved as I watched her go. Nice lady. Odd, though. Which brings us to my first night. Dark hit hard and fast, but there were a couple of yellowed streetlights bathing the streets and parking lot outside the closed coffee shop. And the man that was yelling. It started just as I was laying down on my bed. A senseless hollering. Strings of profanity mixed with accusations at no one. But I'm not new to the city. I was near community housing. A place where folks with severe mental illness can very much end up. So above all else, I knew to be patient. Maybe this was why the place cost so little. It would have to be pretty extreme for that much of a price decrease. This set me on edge. After about an hour of the noise ebbing and flowing, I brought myself up and out of the bed into the window. I looked out over the cold street and watched the snow get caught up in gusts and brought to the man. He walked in jerky circles, flailing his limbs from time to time. I touched the cold glass. At that moment, he spun around and faced me, as if he could hear that barest touch. He froze. No more noise, no more circles. He just stared back up at me. He couldn't have been staring at me. I was standing in my dark room, alone, 17 stories up, but from everything I could tell, he was standing in that parking lot, leaning at the slightest angle, head cocked right up at me. This wasn't good. I took a step backwards, still watching him. The moment I moved, he broke into a dead sprint. He was running directly at me. My heart leapt, but I was inside. There were many locked doors between myself and him. It was fine. That didn't stop me from running up to my apartment door and triple checking it was indeed still locked. And then watching my apartment door from my kitchen table. Then watching the street from my window to see if I could see him again. Then the kitchen. Then the window. It wasn't a great night. The next morning as I opened my door, it pushed against something. I full panicked for a moment, but immediately recognized it as a bundled up window curtain with a note. For the nights, they aren't people, they are cold. Kibla. This was unsettling for sure, but also on a different level, incredibly insulting. Was she talking about the community housing folk? They were sick, not not people. I let my indignant humanitarian side overpower my anxiousness over all this, and tossed the curtain inside and continued on my way. I got a donut and some bad brew at the coffee shop, found out they only operate from 9 to 5, which isn't ideal for late night cravings, 
and head off to work. Night two was much quieter. I didn't hear a sound above the passing night traffic as I lay down to sleep. This felt much more comforting. And then it wasn't. It was too damn quiet. There were other people in the building. There was the community housing just across the street. Why was it so quiet? I stood up again and wandered to the window. Nothing of note out there. No folks wandering the street. Only difference from the night before was one street light had started flickering. Maybe I was just getting in my head over all this. Then I saw the group on the balcony. Five people stood on a balcony of the community housing building, about five stories higher than myself. I couldn't entirely tell if they were speaking or anything from this far, but one thing was for sure. Each stood facing out, facing me, staring at me. I whispered some curse under my breath and immediately turned to grab that curtain near my front door. I stomped around my house, hoping the sound of my own movement would help me establish some sort of connection to reason. I was imagining things. I was getting worked up over nothing. But if the curtain would help me feel better, easy as that. Let's get it up. I got back to my room just in time to see them jump. In unison, each of the five people on the balcony easily climbed over the rail and stepped off, still staring directly at me through my window. I dropped the curtain in terror and shouted a meaningless, Stop! I scrambled to find my phone and dialed 911 while I made a mad dash out of my apartment and into the elevator. Police and ambulance were on the way. As the elevator rang at ground floor, I ran out of my building and into the cold. And holy shit was it cold. The biting night stung at my skin all over. Seeing as I'd left wearing only my PJs and slippers, I ran across the quiet road and past the shop to the building, dreading what I was going to see. They stood there. That's all. There were the five figures I'd seen only moments ago, plummeting from over twenty stories, stiffly but casually looking at me with blank eyes. Nothing seemed to be wrong with them physically. I saw no signs of injury. But behind those eyes, I couldn't tell what I was seeing. I walked closer to the building, scanning the area to see if I was wrong. It was a different group of people, but only came back to them as sirens began blaring. They walked back inside. My mind was a mess. I felt like I was going crazy as the police talked with me. But I held my composure and assured them my eyes must have been playing tricks on me in the night. The sirens retreated back into the city. I slammed my fist against Kibla's door the next day. It opened only a few inches, revealing a chain lock and her eyes. What the hell is going on? I asked. You didn't put up the curtain? She asked as if this was some normal irritation. How is a goddamn curtain going to stop people from jumping from fucking buildings? I demanded. They can see well in the dark. They've noticed you. They won't hurt you, but they'll want to be close. She said as calmly as always. What do those people want? They aren't people. And they want to be warm. I sputtered. Wordless. How do you respond to that? Put the curtain up. It might not stop it anymore, but it'll give you peace of mind. Was all she said before closing her door again. So I did. I put up the curtain and started looking for another apartment. I didn't know what was going on, but I could stay here the two necessary months and head out without messing up my finances too bad. My last night, the curtains were drawn shut and my lights were all off, leaving me in pitch darkness. But there was no way I was getting to sleep. The past two days were running through my head on an endless loop. What was happening in that building? with those people. They were people, right? A quiet noise caught my attention. Barely a noise, really. Like the sound of a mouse speaking in the wall. It would be nice to have a normal issue like mice. The same sound, but slightly louder. I curled up in my bed. 
I didn't want to deal with anything tonight, but I also knew no sleep was coming if I didn't deal with whatever was causing the sound. I slumped out of bed and listened closely, tilting my head towards the wall. Silence. Maybe I should just attempt to sleep through it. A singular clicking noise. Like hail falling against glass. There was a chance I was just hearing something coming from outside, and I was fine. Or far from fine. They won't hurt you. I shuffled towards the window. They want to be warm. I pulled the curtain aside. Darkness. No street light. No snow. Nothing. But the same darkness as my room. I furrowed my brow, absolutely lost. I hit the switch on my lamp. Naked bodies stuck to the glass from the outside. Awfully contorted and piled bodies. All trying to touch as much of their flesh as possible to the glass dividing us. Their skin folded and flattened and still life before me. With patches of hair and scars and disease, the various faces clouded the window with their heavy breath, tongues and teeth pressed hard almost like a sucker fish, plastered and frozen in ecstasy. No, not sucker fish. More like moths. I screamed and fell back, holding down the bile trying to shoot up. I huddled into a fetal position. Rolled away from the sight before me, and I can only describe it as I lost my mind. I don't remember much until dawn came and I saw light piercing through my unmarred window. I left that day. I went to a friend's place and stayed on their couch. My friends and a couple cousins I have here in the city had to get my belongings. They all think I just had some sort of random psychological meltdown. It took me this long to get to the point where I'm even considering leaving this house and going back to work. I'm going to live with friends for a while, and if I do someday get a place again, I'm so fine with basements. Max, stop that, please! I mumbled trying to hide my mix of annoyance and fright. I really didn't want to make a fuss out of this, but he needed... No, he had to stop doing that. I was already getting goosebumps and couldn't hide it anymore. There's no one around here. Not even crickets. I'm just whistling to make the time go by faster. He said that and resumed his joyful whistle, but my calm ran out. Shut it. Now. I yelled louder than I thought my already shallow breath would allow me. The echo making me feel remorseful, but at the same time glad there was no whistle anymore. Not realizing I had also grabbed his shoulder. You really didn't have to say it like that, you know. I was just trying to lighten up the mood. I'll not do it again, but what's wrong with you? Your hand is ice cold. He looked at me awkwardly. Reminds me how much I hate football and that I can't whistle myself. I lied. But Max believed me and didn't question further since he knew football was something not quite up my alley. About the cold hands part, couldn't really give any explanation for it. It was a July evening. It had barely gotten dark and we were walking back home from our evening run through the park. I needed something to clear my head, but I had also needed someone to bring alone first. Due to my paranoid nature, so here we were. The thing is... I knew how to whistle. The problem, though, I was afraid to. And I was never going to do it again or risk being around someone who does. My grandfather always told me whistling brought bad luck if you did it outside your house. And even worse, things could happen if you whistled while you were outside or outside and alone. Like we were. Obviously, I was young and never heeded that advice and dismissed it as something the elders would say so we'd stop making so much noise. Needless to say, years later, looking through old photographs in the countryside house we used to own, I came across one depicting him and my grandmother, whom I never met or knew. I always assumed they either divorced or she had died before I was born since my mother never mentioned someone else apart from her mother. They looked... Content. Happy would be too much. 
nothing out of the ordinary, apart from the fact that the woman had her lips as if she were whistling while the photo was taken. Didn't strike me as weird at all, with all the duck poses my generation does nowadays. The next photograph was one taken around 10 years later. My grandfather was alone in the picture. He seemed serious, trying to smile for the camera, but his eyes were sad. But the one thing that made me stop and slightly choke, my hands getting colder as I grasped the photograph, was next, as I made the connection between what he's saying and the woman's lips were the message handwritten on the back of the yellowed photo. I wish I could bring you back, but it has to stay this way. I won't whistle you back home. That's the point where I realized something wasn't quite right, and I was split between actually believing it or dismissing it yet again as old man grief. The decision was never made, since being a teenager was a full-time job and I had no time to spare to actually think and consider things. Alas, my blissful ignorance was short-lived. Before having Max as a running partner, I used to take my dog out for walks every single evening. That was my one and only form of exercise. It all came to an end one cold, fierce winter night. No snow, just pure cold and a feeling of dread of going out and getting actual cold feet. I knew I had to walk the dog, both out of habit and for his daily walk and needs. He didn't seem all that enthused though more like restless and unnerved, as if he really would have rather stayed home. I live in a flat, so my choice was to either show him how nice it is outside, or to be awoken at night by him and his need to actually go out. The daylight was short, by the time I had realized it was getting late I had to rush back home so I wouldn't miss dinner. On my way back home the dog kept barking around the streets as if looking for something annoying me further on since no other dogs were outside, and he doesn't bark at people. His focus seemed to be a lady with a wide-brimmed snow hat walking and gently whistling while looking upwards. Unconsciously, I picked up the whistle and started trying to get my dog's attention. That got it right, and I got in the house, closing the gate on my way in. As I crouched down to unlace my shoes, the dog ran down into the yard and started barking again. But I didn't mind it since I was already home and I knew the whistling lady had been his attention. But she was three streets behind as well as walking in the opposite direction. The barking stopped so I tried whistling him back home as I had already gotten my shoes off. But after a couple of minutes, he was still outside yet no barking either. Night was already in full bloom, but I could still see that the gate was still closed after I came in, so I knew he must be somewhere in the yard. What stopped my whistling and made me freeze in place was the hat lady that was across the street under a street lamp, with my dog's red leash in one hand, her hat in the other, the whistling lips, and what's worse, the same eyes and face as in my grandmother's old photograph. Not a day older, or a wrinkle added. She waved at me with the hand that held the leash, put her hat back on with her other hand, and resumed her walk away from the gate. As she turned around the corner, the whistle was still audible, first due to the echo on the street, then due to the echo of my thoughts, keeping me awake at night. I told my parents that the leash had broken, hence why I missed that too, and the dog had run away. This lie was also believed. We put up some missing posters, but I knew he wasn't going to be back, even if I whistled. This history raced through my mind all over again when Max pointed out my distress caused by his whistling, but I couldn't help it. It was a loose thread in my life in the last few months. The house was the first one up the road. We'd split there, and he would walk on five more streets to his. Look, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel nervous or something. He said as my house came into view. I overreacted. I'll see you tomorrow. Everything's alright. I tried to get things back to normal between us. 
since we haven't talked since I lost my temper and shouted at him to seize his whistling. As I turned around to close the door, I waved at him thinking that I indeed overreacted, and he waved back while shouting. I did say I'm sorry, but now I can do this all the way back home since you won't hear it. See you tomorrow. As he said that, he started whistling and I closed the door. Slightly angry, he'd pick on me with that. But my rapid breathing was a product, rather, of inexplicable fear than of anger. The following day at school, Max skipped the first class. It seemed he was going to skip the second as well as the next one, so the teacher looked at me and said, Oh well, he whistled. Judging by your tired face, I'm guessing you and your deskmate had some late night fun last night. I smiled, nodded, and the teacher went on with the other absentees. After all, I could do no more than nod. I was frozen not only by the fact by hearing a whistle once again in such a scenario, but by the notion that my friend decided to skip school without saying anything apart from that joke whistle he did the previous night. The worst part? It wasn't only that day he skipped. Questions are popping up and my answers are still missing. I used to work as a missing persons detective. This is the case that made me quit. I joined the force young, 21 years old. From the start, I was always taken by the idea of missing persons cases. It was more morally straightforward than homicide, more interesting than drugs. There was a pureness and righteousness in finding missing people which was hard to find in other areas of policing. It was infaultable work. I would only ever be doing good. Of course, I spent my time walking the beat first. Six years before I could finally take the promotional exam to make detective. And after that, it was another four years before the opportunity came to transfer into the missing persons department. I was truly passionate about the job, something which not many people can say. Every day I could feel as though I was truly making a difference. Delivering a presumed dead child back to their parents is an indescribably fulfilling experience. Of course, on the flip side came the crushing despair every time a case went cold. No matter how impossible the case seemed, no matter how much I reassured myself there was nothing more I could do. There was always a voice in the back of my mind reminding me that the victim was still out there somewhere. The worst thing was when we found a corpse, knowing that I had failed to save a life. There are so many out there that I never found, or found too late. I see their faces over and over again in my dreams. The perpetrators have also stuck with me. I dealt with a lot of sick, sick people in my time. I had a lot of horrible cases. A lot of times I doubted myself. But like I said, this is the one which made me leave the profession for good and never look back. By now in my career, I was one of the most senior detectives in the department. I got the lead on most cases, and was generally looked to as someone to take charge when things took a turn for the worse. I walked into the station and was notified first thing about the call that had come through during the night. Five children. Two girls and three boys between the ages of four and six had disappeared from the same neighborhood, literally within a few blocks of one another in the same day. I'm not going to tell you their names or who they were, out of respect to them and their families. I'm also not going to give any place names or details which might give too much information about the case away. Trust me, you're better off knowing less. With the extremely similar circumstances between each disappearance, I made the executive decision to treat this as a serial kidnapping case. Normally in these situations, some creep is driven around the neighborhood in a van, taking as many kids as he can. So right away, we got to work. I know it's a cliche, but 
The first 48 hours really are the most important on these kinds of things. Wanting to move quickly, I and my partner went to interview one of the set of parents and sent junior detectives to interview the others. The parents I interviewed told me that they had last seen their son the previous morning when he had gone out to play in the front lawn. The mother had been out there supervising him, but she had had to step back inside for 30 seconds to turn off the oven. When she hurried back outside, her son was gone. Brief questions posed to neighbors gave no further clues. None of them had seen anything. The other detectives had come back with similar stories. Parents turning their back for a moment, and their child disappearing in the meantime. With no leads, we began our second step, checking CCTV in the surrounding area. Luckily, the suburbs where the kids were taken from were surrounded by dense commercial areas, high streets, and shopping centers. These kinds of places always have loads of security cameras, but it takes time accessing and checking that much footage, and we were losing valuable hours. I was able to get permission from my superiors to rope in more officers to check all the cameras as quickly as possible. Credit to my team, it only took us 24 hours to find the right piece of footage. Myself and a few of my higher ranking colleagues, as well as the two detectives who had found the evidence gathered in my office to analyze it. I remember that those two, only junior detectives at the time, looked a bit shaken when they brought the footage to us. When we all sat down to watch, they warned us that the contents of the clip was strange. Looking back, that was the wrong word for it. We asked them to sum up what was in the video first. They told us we needed to see for ourselves. The camera which had caught the video was at the back of a supermarket, facing into one of those street depots where food trucks pull in to unload and restock. You know, those creepy looking alleys behind stores, full of old cardboard boxes. They always give off an eerie vibe when you pass them in the street. This particular site had openings on two public roads, which is how the perp must have gotten access. The roads were unusually quiet ones for the area, which explains how nobody noticed. The CCTV footage began with a long alley empty. Then, far, far back, right at the end, we began to see a blurry, pixelated shape appear out of the dark. We couldn't make out what it was yet. It was still in the low-quality image stage. The shifting mass of fuzzy pixels grew closer and closer and closer until we could make out an adult on foot with several children behind him. We were taken aback. Unusual for kidnappers to stay on foot. This made it much harder to see how he could have taken the kids without garnering attention. Eventually, the group came within clear view, and we all let out audible gasps. A mixture of shock, confusion, and, at least in my case, fright. You see a lot of things in that job that give you the shivers, but not much like what was on that video screen. I'll do my best to describe the surreal sight that met our eyes. The man, and we could tell by his imposing height that it was a man, was wearing a disturbing getup. He had on one of those Mr. Punch masks, you know, like the classic puppet character, an unsettling thing with a too long nose, hooked chin, and bulging eyes. The skin on the face of the mask had been painted far too pale, almost snow white. Brazenly contrasting with the crimson tinted cheeks, giving the unintentional complexion of someone at death's door. The mask was cartoonish with heavily exaggerated angles and features, and I'm not afraid to say that it made me extremely uncomfortable. There was something about the popping eyes with their swollen veins and poorly sketched pupils that seemed to stare at me through the screen and pass that into my mind. And the smile, it was only a mask, but the smile gave off an unmistakable air of malice and insidious intent. 
When I looked at the mask too long, I felt deeply afraid. I felt as if something dark and terrible was searching hungrily for me. Whoever the creator of this visage was, they were an unhinged individual. The man wore a bizarre hat, black, shaped almost like a medieval gestures, complete with silver baubles and the end of each sleeve. The cap and bells went down the back of his head far enough that his hair was obscured. He had a strange kind of coat on, more like a robe. It had no buttons or a zipper, and it was long, too long, flowing past his ankles and pooling on the ground around him in folds, almost like a miniature bridal train. The coat was formed of hundreds of colored patches, stitched together, but you couldn't describe it as colorful. None of the patches were bright or vibrant, each was a different dark hue, some muddy brown, some gray, some a deep maroon, some dirty yellow, some chemical orange, some inky green. Not one color was actually aesthetically pleasing, almost if the coat had been sewed with intention of causing visual discomfort. The coat had many, many pockets, far more than could ever be filled. It seemed that almost every patch had a pocket stitched into it. From two of these pockets, the two on his left and right hip, stretched a handkerchief of ribbon. The handkerchiefs were composed of a pattern of black and white alternating diamonds. The handkerchief stretched a few meters behind the man, and gripping tightly into the fabric were the children. A scan of their faces confirmed these were the missing kids we were looking for. And yet none of them looked traumatized. None of them were upset or crying. They all smiled and laughed, gripping the handkerchiefs. The strips of fabric were like those magician tricks. The never-ending ones. The children held on with both hands. Three on one side, two on the other. They skipped along happily and energetically. Clearly, they had been groomed by the fucker in the mask. Disturbingly, he himself also skipped. He raised his knees in jovial leaps, almost like a dance of jive. Each time he frolicked up and down, he would lift his feet, which were encased in strange pointed shoes that curled upwards. Keeping time to this eerie jig down the dark alley, the man held a wooden pipe up to the mouth hole in the grinning mouth of the mask. He was playing the same tune over and over again. It was Green Sleeves. That tune has always been a personal favorite of mine. Something about the simple melody repeated over and over again is utterly entrancing. But hearing it in this setting, it was nothing but terrifying. The tune was too absorbing. It was almost hypnotic. When I listened for too long, I couldn't tear my eyes away from the screen. There was also something slightly off about the man's playing. Hard to pin down. A small discordant note every now and again. The procession continued through the alley. The haunting figure at the front leading the troop, until they passed out of the security camera's viewing range. My fellow investigators and I were gobsmacked. We had absolutely no idea what to think. Never, in any of our respective careers, had we seen anything like this. Could this really be happening? Was that eerie figure really out there somewhere? At least it did a little to strengthen our resolve. There was no way that we were going to leave those kids with somebody that insane. We quickly sent out reports calling for anyone seeing something matching the odd description of the man we had seen to come forward as soon as they could. At a point like that, witness sightings were our best bet. I made the mistake of reassuring the anguished parents that we were going to bring their children home. But as the days went by, we had to widen our search from city to district and then, after a week, the state. We wanted to be absolutely sure we caught him. We had our first conference. We released a still photo of the security footage along with it, leading to a lot of ridiculous questions. 
I think it was right at the end of the first week when the first newspaper gave the kidnapper his name. The Piper. I'll admit, it was fitting. His strange outfit, musical accessory, and most of all the way those kids were just happily skipping along next to him, as if in a trance, all harked back to the age-old Pied Piper story. The name stuck. Soon, all the press was calling him that. Then the public. The public loved criminals with a nickname. I'll admit, even us in the station began calling him the Piper. Unfortunately, no sightings came through. Nobody had seen the distinctive figure. We were just beginning to lose hope when we got the call. A man a few towns over had spotted a man dressed in attire matching the Pipers, with the children behind him, in the alley behind his apartment building, late at night. We went over there and interviewed the man, but he couldn't tell us much more than what he had seen. It was very late, he was very tired, and he was sure his eyes had been playing tricks on him. Luckily, the building had a security camera facing the alley. We were given access to the reels of footage over the last few days, and trawled back until we found the period of time during which the man had reported spotting the piper. This footage was watched only by me and my partner, Jeffords, in the security room of the apartment building. With a similar angle to the first video, the camera faced down the long, dark alley. The cobblers were littered with broken glass and junk. This was a much shadier district. Then we began to hear that same haunting melody. Green sleeves. It sounded as if it was coming from somewhere far off in the darkness at first, but it gradually got closer, and the closer it got, the more I began to shiver. Once again, we saw the same sight emerge as we had in the first piece of footage. The scene was practically unchanged. The Piper still wore the same disturbing mask, the same peculiar hat and coat. He again proceeded slowly, rhythmically forward, dancing through the night. Still, he held that wooden pipe to his lips and played. And still, the five poor children were behind him, either side. Still, they clutched tightly with both hands the long black and white handkerchiefs. But whereas before they had laughed and skipped along with their tormentor, now their faces were gaunt and tear-stained. They looked thin, horribly thin, far thinner than they had before. I had the awful thought that these children looked as if they hadn't eaten in a week, and they had been moving across the country on foot for most of that time. They did not frolic now. They stumbled and tripped, as if they were being pulled along by the piper and his handkerchiefs. Yet still they gripped the fabric. Still they refused to let go. They were clearly in tremendous pain and tremendously fatigued. God, why didn't they let go? As Jeffords and I watched in horrified silence, the piper removed one hand from his pipe though he continued to play, deftly manipulating his instrument with only five fingers. His other hand reached into one of the many pockets of his coat. As he drew the hand out, we could make out something pink and gray, squirming in his hand. I squinted at the computer screen we were watching the footage on, and made the dreadful realization that he was holding a rat. The rat looked well-fed. It was large and muscular, However, the mangy fur hinted at some kind of disease. The piper lifted the rodent by the tail as it clawed and twisted in the air, gnashing its jagged teeth. It looked mad with aggression, almost rabid. He suddenly tossed it backwards behind himself and the kids. It hit the ground on all fours and scampered into the shadows. He then reached into a different pocket retrieving a second rat and performing the same chilling ritual as he had with the first. As I looked closer, I could just about make out the way the cloth of his coat was wriggling. How many did he have in there? My brain suddenly noticed something. There were more rats, a little way behind the procession, 
Staying just within the shadows, but always following. They leapt and crawled over the trash and obstacles in their way, moving in small groups of threes or fours, tenaciously following behind. Eventually, the eerie figure of the piper and the poor children moved out of shot, but for at least ten minutes, the exodus of rats continued. Every so often, the small forms would dart along the alley, always following. The entire investigation team was utterly aghast. Whatever we were dealing with here, it was something far, far worse than we had first anticipated. We didn't tell the press or the public about the development in the case. This was just strictly confidential. I felt confusion. And I felt helplessness. And I felt fear. Fear for the kids trapped with that thing. And a deeper fear. Fear because I was beginning to realize that there are beings out there beyond what human minds are able or willing to understand. Now the trail began to go cold. We had no more witness sightings, and with a search area now so large, there was little we could do. I couldn't order car checks. The piper moved on foot. I tried offering a monetary reward. I tried helicopter searches. Nothing. I tried sniffer dogs. Still, nothing. I felt utterly unable to do anything to help the missing children, and I felt solely responsible for whatever horror was being inflicted on them. The worst moment was facing the parents, telling them that I had been wrong, that their little ones weren't going to come home. Soon, it had been a month. Then, too. The case was essentially dead. My colleagues stopped working on it. My superiors gave us new assignments. But I couldn't concentrate on any new cases. My mind was replaying the footage over and over again. My dreams were taken up with nightmarish visions of that horrible, spine-chilling mask. Then, three months later, I was on a visit to a different precinct, picking up some samples from their forensic lab. I overheard one of their officers talking about how, way upstate, the cops were getting flooded by reports of a massive freak rat migration. How, in one town, people were stuck in their homes as the streets were flooded with the rodents. My mind instantly began to whir. Of course, it was an absolute shot in the dark, but the Piper had been heading upstate, and it was completely the wrong time of year for that kind of behavior from the animals. Those kinds of migrations actually happen more than you'd think in some farm communities, but only in the late summer. One explanation I could think of was that they were being attracted to something, just like the rats in that alley. At that point in time, I was willing to do just about anything to find those kids, to bring some kind of closure. I asked the officers what town they meant. I'm not going to tell you its name, but it was a small rural community out in the backwoods, surrounded by farmland. I did my own research and found that the town was a day's drive away. I didn't tell my superiors about this development. There was no way they were going to authorize me to investigate such a tenuous lead. The only person I confided in was Jeffords. He was just as invested as me. He agreed to come up with me. By the time we got round to going, the migration had been over a month. But that didn't matter. I was sure that we would find something. From research and speaking to the locals, we discovered that the majority of the rats had been seen moving in the direction of an abandoned farm a half mile away. We arrived at the farm, and were instantly hit by the eerie atmosphere. The sight of the big, decrepit windmill looming ahead made me shiver and we noticed the rats immediately too. By the time we arrived, the sun was beginning to set, and as soon as we got out of our car, the rodents swarmed around our feet. They appeared from hay bales and shrubbery, and skittered away again just as fast under our boot heels. We made our way to the old farmhouse first, and went from room to room, checking for anything. Here, the rats were even more populous, 
filling up corridors and diving out of rotting pantry shelves. We found nothing in the house, though we tore it apart, searching under beds and in cupboards. Next, we trudged up to the big barn at the top of the hill. Looking up as we approached, I felt an unshakable sense of dread. The barn had been a true agricultural leviathan when it had been functioning. It must have been able to store more grain than could ever be needed. The red and white paint was peeling off now, and there was a large hole in the roof where the timbers had collapsed. Jeffords and I heaved open the large doors and entered. The smell hit us first. It was absolutely rancid, a mixture of shit and death. The interior was pitch black. We could literally see nothing inside. Turning on our torches, we cautiously made our way past the stacks of molding hay, which were piled on top of each other all the way up to the roof. The ground was obscured by layers of thick, muddy straw, which in turn was caked with rodent feces. The only light that was provided by our torches in the weak moonlight shining through the hole in the roof. The rats were all around us, constantly brushing up against our legs, scuttling past. When I pointed my flashlight at the stacks of hay, I could see it writhing and shifting, as if it was alive. Each bale must have been absolutely packed with the things. Every so often, one would leap out from the hay. The rats made me uneasy. They never quite plucked up the courage to attack us, but they had screeched and bared their teeth whenever we passed them. When I pointed my torch far into the distance of the path ahead of us, I could see thousands of yellow eyes staring from the shadows watching us, chittering. It was one of the most eerie sights I've ever had the displeasure of seeing. I noticed it first, a faint sound coming from the end of the barn. As we got closer, hearts pounding, my ears could make out to be that same damn tune. Green sleeves. Except this time, it was slightly different. It wasn't being played on a wooden pipe. It had a different kind of tinkle. Almost like a piano, but not quite. Now Jeffords and I were both extremely on edge, expecting any moment to see that horrific, smiling face peeking out from the shadows. Eventually we drew towards the end of the barn, but... The back wall came up too quickly. From the outside, the barn should have been gone on for a few more minutes. Then we saw the door. In the center of the back wall was a rusty metal door. It was thick steel. It looked like it had been taken from an industrial site. There were deep scratches and dents in the surface, and rust stained it all over. As I drew closer to the door, I began to feel an unexplainable fear. I wanted to turn away from that wretched place and never come back. I did not want to see what lay beyond that door. I knew somehow that whatever its contents was, it would be awful. We found the source of the noise sitting just in front of the door. An old battered music box. I couldn't find any kind of switch or lever to turn it off, so we let it continue to play its hypnotic tune. It acted almost as a background theme as we continued. The door, strangely, was not locked. We pulled the handle down and, with some effort, it creaked open. Instantly the smell hit us. It was a hundred times worse than when we had first entered the barn. Jeffords turned and vomited on the floor. I knew in the pit of my stomach that we were going to find in there. I'm going to describe what was behind the door as best I can, in such a way that is still respectful to the deceased. I don't want to go into graphic detail, especially not in this kind of case, but I have to. I must. I need to get across the horror if I come across as apathetic in my retelling of it that is because i have wept for so long that i am numb now there was a room behind the door 
Somebody had put up a fake back wall in order to conceal its presence. The room was small, but not cramped. There was a table set up in the center with five chairs around it. The walls, floor, and furniture of the room were smeared with rat shit like the rest of the barn, but in an even higher concentration. There were thick chains connected to the walls which ran all the way to each chair. Each chair had two chains, each with a manacle on the end, presumably to shackle the feet. In the center of the table, there was a pot of crayons and colored pencils, and there were some stacks upon stacks of paper drawings, children's drawings, of houses and stick figures and pirate ships and random scribbles. God knows how long that monster kept those poor kids in there. Every drawing was soaked with blood. There was also blood spattered on the table, chairs, walls, and floor. It was long dried and crusted. In. This is more difficult than you can imagine for me to write. We didn't find a single whole body in there. Only bits and pieces. A few gnawed limbs, appendages, and torsos scattered all over the room. Every body part we found was covered in bite marks, almost stripped to the bone in some places. Tiny little gouges made by tiny little teeth. The piper had kept those children in there. He had attracted the waves of rats. He had chained them up so they didn't have a chance. And he had left the rats to devour them. It has taken me a few tries to type this. I can't stop myself from gagging. We found that goddamn fucking mask lying in the middle of the floor, amidst the blood and the shit. It stared up at us, grinning, mocking, laughing. You couldn't save them, it giggled. We left the barn in a daze. I stomped on the music box, crushing it beneath my boot. We called for backup and it soon arrived. Already, Jeffords and I had decided to just tell the parents we had found the bodies. Nothing more, no details. Over the next few weeks, our team found more in the room. A few teeth, bones, strands of hair, fingers. DNA tests confirmed them to belong to the five missing children. All five accounted for. On the chairs, they found traces of human urine and feces, confirming our fears. The children had suffered for a long time. In one corner, they found the handkerchiefs. We tested them. They were covered in super glue. Scraps of skin and torn flesh where small hands had been ripped away. The Piper wasn't an eldritch being. He didn't lure the kids to follow him through mystical means. He was just a sick, twisted, depraved monster of a man. Wasn't he? You see, ever since that day in the barn, I haven't been able to get the green sleeves tune out of my head. Even after a year, I find myself humming it. No matter how much it revolts me. Even when I'm able to force myself to stop, it continues to play at the back of my mind. But nowadays, when it's late at night and I'm alone, either in my room or working a night shift in my new accounting job, I hear it. Clearly now, as if something is playing it on a wooden pipe just outside. And I want to listen. I want to go outside. I want to. Sorry, I've just had to stop my foot from tapping to the rhythm. I want to follow the music. Off into the dark. For the past three years, I was an exterminator. Despite what many may think, it's not that bad of a job as long as you weren't afraid of getting your hands dirty. Over my career, I dealt with everything from small mice to big snakes. As far as danger, the only threat I ever experienced was almost getting my eyes scratched out by a rabid possum. I wasn't 
particularly a huge exterminator. I was just a local guy working out of the back of his van. I spent almost a fortune on all my equipment. The best thing about the job was meeting my partner, Greg. Unlike me, he'd been in the extermination business for a long time. The craziest story he ever told me was about the time he had to remove a huge wasp nest from a church. As exterminators, we never got much business compared to the bigger names, but we made enough to make a living. I didn't have a wife or kids at the time, so making enough to survive wasn't all that hard. Greg was the same, despite being in his 60s. He never mentioned anything about a family. I didn't think it was ever something he cared for. I'm getting sidetracked. Though I have enjoyed the extermination business, what happened a few days ago has made me consider walking away from it forever. I've dealt with a lot in my time, but I never thought I could describe a job as downright unnatural. I received a call a few nights ago. The voice on the other end was that of a woman. She sounded somewhat shaken, but I could tell she was trying to keep her composure. Hello? Is this Pestaway Extermination? She asked nervously. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a pest you need rid of? I asked. I... I don't know who else to turn to at this point. I suppose you could describe my problem as a... pest. I was somewhat perplexed when she said that but I tried my best to understand the situation. Ma'am, do you know what kind of pest it is? Mice? Snakes? Insects? I asked. The woman remained silent for several seconds. Rat, she said. Rats? No worries. Rats are a very common pest, especially around these parts. Do you know if they're in your ceiling, floor, or walls? I asked. I... I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It's not my house. It's my mother's. She's old and bedridden. I was visiting her when I saw it, looking at me through one of the ventilation ducts. It was so big, she said. The woman's voice began to get shaky, as if she was getting emotional. Not to worry, ma'am. Rats are nothing to cry over. I'll set an appointment to be there in a few days, I said. The woman gave me the address and information. With that, the appointment was set. Within a few days, we would show up and help with this little rat problem. It was strange, though. As I laid in bed that night, I couldn't help but wonder why the woman was so emotional. When she described the pest as a rat, why did she seem like she couldn't definitely call it that? Something about the entire phone call sent a weird chill up my spine. However, I ignored it and went to sleep. I figured I'd call Greg about it in the morning. The days leading up to the reason I'm writing this were pretty slow. Greg and I dealt with a few minor pests here and there. Greg nearly lost one of his fingers trying to remove a raccoon that had found its way into a trailer. Despite all our fun... I couldn't help but get a strange sense of unease. These were just rats, right? Why did I feel so anxious? Regardless, the woman promised to make it worth our while if we could handle it, and I wasn't about to turn down a good payday. The day had finally arrived. Greg was less than helpful in getting me all the equipment into the van. The old man spent the whole time trying to figure out how to set up the GPS. Of course, I had to do that, too. We arrived at the house a little late. The place was big. Nice place for an old hag, huh? Greg said jokingly. Now's not the time for jokes, Greg. The lady's old and bedridden. She probably has more money than you'll ever see. I said. Greg disregarded my smart remark. I finally got to see the woman who made the call in the flesh. She seemed to be in her 30s and well put together. Despite that, I must also add that she appeared as though she hadn't slept in days. Gentlemen, thank God you're here, she said. No problem. When you told me about your problem, I wanted to help you out as soon as I could, I said. 
I didn't really know who else to go to for this problem. It's weird, she said nervously. Well, we better not waste any time. Let's see if we can't get rid of these little bastards, said Greg. The woman who introduced herself as Crystal invited us inside. The place was incredible. It wasn't exactly big enough to be a mansion, but I'll be damned if it wasn't close enough. The place was full of furniture that probably cost more than everything I own. As curious as I was to ask what these folks did for a living, I preferred not pry into their business. Crystal told us that she believed that vermin were located in the basement, as that's where she'd heard the most noise. You never considered getting a cat? Asked Greg. My mother actually had a cat before she fell ill, but it disappeared. I haven't seen it in a long time. I assume the poor feline just ran off to another family. My mother wasn't able to take care of him anymore. Answered Crystal. Crystal led us to the stairs of the basement. The sight of the old wooden stairs descending to an old door was awfully liminal. It seemed like the setup for a cheesy horror movie. Crystal left and allowed us to do our business. Greg went first, descending the stairs. Despite how new this place looked, it was clear that the place was old judging by how loud these stairs creaked as we went down. Greg opened the door to the basement. Immediately we were hit with a disgusting wave of a foul scent. Jesus Christ, what the hell is that smell? yelled Greg. The both of us simultaneously put on our gas masks. Yes, we carried gas masks in case we needed to fume the place. The basement was dark. Dust filled the air from the slightest movement. Greg pointed his flashlight around. Sure enough, there were rats. Several rats. Wherever Greg pointed the flashlight, we could see a rat quickly scurrying behind the nearest object. The floor nearly crunched from all the dried rat droppings. These rats were big. Greg began to set down a different assortment of rat traps. I started on the opposite side of the room, setting down different types of poisonous bait. Some of the rats were oddly fearless, immediately going for the bait after I placed it. The job only took about an hour. After we placed the traps, we packed up our stuff and called it a day. I gave Crystal a call and informed her that we would be back within a few days to collect the carcasses. As we ascended the basement stairs, Greg mentioned something strange. You know what's weird? This house is pretty big, but the basement felt so small. I don't know. It just feels like there should have been more to that, don't you think? Greg asked. Now that he mentioned, the basement did feel rather lackluster compared to the rest of the house. Why should it matter? It's a basement. Later that day, Greg and I went our separate ways. I couldn't help but think about what Greg said earlier. That basement seemed all too small, and there was no way those rats were just restricted to the basement. We would probably have to do a clean sweep of the entire house. We wouldn't want to leave any vermin behind. We arrived back at the house the next day. Crystal seemed in bad shape. Her eyes were red and her hair was a mess. She clearly hadn't slept. I could notice her sickly mother in her car. Crystal, what's going on? I asked. I'm getting my mother out of here. Whatever you guys did, it angered it. She said. What are you talking about, lady? We angered the rats? Said Greg. I assured Crystal that everything was fine. We were going to handle this problem, and she wouldn't have to worry about it. Crystal almost broke down in a heap of tears, but she managed to keep her composure. She hopped in the car with her mother. Please, end it, said Crystal. With that, she drove away with her mother. I looked over to see Greg had pulled out a revolver from his pocket. Jesus, man, where the hell did you get that? I asked. You can never be too careful nowadays, said Greg. We started speculating that maybe Crystal was trying to set us up to be robbed. 
We carefully stepped into the house. Immediately, we could hear them. There was scurrying in the ceiling, the walls, and the floor. One thing was for sure. These rats were on edge. Looks like they're partying, huh? Said Greg. We slowly made our way to where it all started. We headed down to the basement. This time, the smell was far more intense. I've smelled a lot of dead animals in my career, but this was absolutely horrid. We entered the basement to a gross sight. It appeared as though some of the rats had died from our previous traps. It seemed that other rats had been feeding on the corpses. I thought back to what Greg said. The basement seemed unfinished. Rats scurried left and right. The smell was becoming more and more unbearable. The smell was particularly strong behind a large wardrobe. I noticed that there seemed to be an opening behind it. Hey Greg, help me with this real quick. I said. Greg and I pushed the wardrobe to the side. Our theory was finally confirmed true. There was more to this basement than we originally thought. Behind the wardrobe was a doorway into a dark room. The room was pitch black, but the smell was definitely originating from here. Greg and I turned on our flashlights simultaneously. We scanned the room up and down. There was nothing more than more dusty furniture. At first, we didn't think much of it. That's when we heard it. Squeak. Something made a noise from the room, but we couldn't locate it. It sounded like a full-grown man with a deep voice. Greg pointed his flashlight up towards the ceiling. That's when he saw it. W what the hell is that? Said Greg. I looked up to see it myself. Sitting on an exposed beam was a person. The strangest thing, however, was that they were wearing a full-body rat costume. His fake rat tail hung down, gently swaying. The flashlight must have caught his attention because he looked straight at us. Squeak, he said. His voice was so deep, so human. While I was downright terrified, Greg was more confused than anything. I, excuse me, sir, said Greg. He did not respond. He merely continued nibbling on something in his hands. This is where the smell was coming from. The costume was filthy. Real rats crawled on the person's back and shoulders. Other rats roamed around the beams above us. The person turned to face us. We could see what he was nibbling on now. The person shoved a dead rat into the mouth of his costume. I could not see any trace of the person underneath. I could see no eyes, mouth, or exposed skin. Squeak, he said once more. Why the hell is this guy pretending to be a rat? Asked Greg. The person's voice was so deep, so nonchalant, it was as if he did not care for our presence. By this point, Greg had gotten infuriated. Listen, buddy. I don't know what kind of prank you're trying to pull, but you need to get out of here right now, demanded Greg. The person looked down at us. For a second, I swear I could hear him chuckle. Squeak. Several rats jumped down from the beams and attacked us. I felt the small bites of several rats biting into my suit. Greg pulled out his revolver and attempted to fire at the rat man. The rat man jumped down from the beams and merely stared at us. With each second, more and more rats began to overwhelm us. Seize, he said. In an instant, all of the rats dispersed from us. The rat man approached us. He crouched down to look at me dead in the eyes. I could see nothing but darkness past the mask. Was there even a person in that costume? Well, well, look what the rats dragged in, he said. Greg managed to sit up and pulled his revolver on the rat man yet again. Don't make another move, said Greg. The rat man chuckled yet again. 
A rat leaped from the darkness, biting Greg's hand. Greg dropped the gun. Another rat appeared, grabbed the gun in its mouth, and dragged it off into the darkness. Who are you? I asked. The rat man looked down at me once more. He began to laugh. I'm just a poor little rat, he said. The smell of death emanated off this guy strongly. This looked like a human, but was it? Why were the rats obeying him? It was clear that this guy wasn't intent on letting us leave alive. I had to think of something fast. I watched in horror as more rats crawled from the mouth of the costume. Squeak, he said. A swarm of rats slowly began to close in on us. Feast, he said. Just before the rats could attack, I managed to jump up and hit the rat man in the face with my flashlight. Greg managed to quickly catch on. For an old man, he was pretty quick. Rats attempted to crawl up my legs, but I managed to kick them off. I looked to see the rat man adjusting his head. I must have hit him harder than I thought. He twisted his head back in place. Though I couldn't see it, I could hear snapping as he twisted his head back into place. Greg made a break for the stairs. I followed closely behind. The large mass of rats chased us up the stairs. We managed to make it out of the house and into the van. Without hesitation, I stepped on the gas as hard as possible. Greg sat in the passenger seat, gripping his bleeding hand. I pulled out my phone and immediately called Crystal. She answered instantly. Crystal, what the hell was that? I exclaimed. Crystal remained silent for a few minutes before she finally spoke. I'm just as clueless as you. I tried to tell the police, but they didn't believe me. She said, Who was that? What was that? We nearly died in there. I exclaimed. Crystal didn't exactly have a definite answer as to what was down there, but she definitely knew more than what she told us. Basically, her mother would talk in her sleep. She would say strange things. Something about the fifth horseman and the horsemen of pestilence. Basically, her mother had been using her body to feed something in the house. That's why she fell ill. As far as the horsemen of pestilence, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Did she really expect me to believe that we somehow encountered an unknown fifth horseman of the apocalypse, and it's a guy in a rat costume? I've been doing everything in my power to try to find some rational explanation for what we encountered that day, but I can't. We have not gone back to that house since. Greg doesn't even want to talk about it. If anything Crystal said holds any weight, then her mother was into some pretty bizarre stuff. Somehow she managed to summon a fucking rat god and trapped it in her basement. If it sounds weird to you, imagine how I feel. I have not even thought about going back into extermination since this happened. I don't think Greg has either. Ever since this happened, I've become paranoid. Every time I close my eyes, I see it. I see that thing staring at me with its empty sockets. Now we come to the reason I wrote this. Today I heard a sound come from my ceiling. It was so quick, yet so noticeable. Squeak. The road signs are different at night. It's something my mom used to say all the time. She said it when I was a child in the back seat, and she said it when she was teaching me how to drive. Every stretch of highway or back road turn was different under the veil of darkness. I laughed at the concept at first, thinking maybe she was overreacting a little. I had just got my license, and I had driven many times before, but they had all been convenient, daylight drives in the past. I thought surely as long as I had a GPS and working headlights, everything would be fine. In the end, her words rang true, and it was something I learned the hard way. 
My 18th birthday was two months ago. I was working a part-time day shift job as a dishwasher at a country club since I had graduated high school. It wasn't a bad job and it taught me the value of earning and appreciating your paycheck. I found that despite my hate for school, I actually enjoyed working and making money to provide for myself instead of just hanging around and existing. My mom or my sister would pick me up after work in the family beater. An old Dodge Intrepin. So they could run errands and whatnot while I was at work. We didn't have a lot of money and I was helping out around the house with what I made as a dishwasher. But that all changed when I ran into my cousin at the country club. He had offered me a job, making twice as much where he worked. My cousin Scott was a steel worker. It sounded exciting to me at the time. A dangerous job, farther away from home than I was used to. Lots of overtimes and bigger checks. I didn't have any plans for college and I didn't have anything else lined up employment-wise. So it seemed like a lifeline when he offered it to me. It would be my first big boy job. And I couldn't help but think of the dollar sign swirling around my head. It'll be good for you. He said, you can get an early start, make some good money, try to get things on track, make it through probation, and you'll have a steady job to hunker down at for a bit. After an application, a ride to a job interview, and a drug test, I was on my way to doing just that. I would start as a laborer, doing grunt work, and when a bid came up, I might have a chance to move into something a little more concrete. I put in my notice at the dish pit, bought some steel toe boots and some heavy cargoes to wear until uniforms came in, and finished my two weeks with impatience. I would start out on second shift working 3 to 11, and probably get forced into some overtime, but I was cool with it. Once my notice was up, I said goodbye to the friends I had made at the country club, and got ready for bigger and better things. With a new job starting, my mom said I would take the Intrepid myself, just in case I had to work way later than scheduled. She was worried about being out so late, and more importantly, driving at night. The mill was in a port 20 miles away, whereas my previous job was just down the road. There were only two ways to get there. The expressway that would get me there faster, or the back road that went through the dunes that led to the port. My mother said the highway was out of the question, too many crazy people on the roads, and the fact I had never driven at night made her very uncomfortable. She said I would take the scenic route, it was covered in trees and traffic was light, and I would be fine as long as I watched for deer. I was nervous and excited, but before I knew it, I was on my way for my first day. I plugged my phone into the aux cord since my phone was an old hand-me-down. I had to find a sweet spot for it to come in clearly. I set my GPS and put on some music and started the heavily wooded cruise. On my way to work, the drive was beautiful. The trees were tall and danced in the wind, rays of sunshine shining down all the way to the port. It was a more touristy route, I suppose, being so close to the lake. Gift shops and gas stations could be seen every couple miles, and there were several elderly men taking their project cars out for a Sunday drive on a Monday. At the halfway point in my drive, I caught a red light. The intersection was small, and with an old train station next to it with a sign that read, Sandy Shores. There was a couple on a bench outside the station, cheesy smiles beaming as they posed for a selfie. It all seemed so serene, this beautiful drive, on the way to my much more profitable job, seeing these nice cars that maybe one day I would be able to afford. I looked forward to making this drive in the days to come, with my tunes playing on the stereo, nice easy speed limit and lazily listing turns. I found my way to work and got to my first day. The port itself was the farthest thing from beautiful. It seemed like a decaying hole in the land. Nothing but dusty gravel, loud semi-trucks, and loud bangs echoing from the factories on every corner. 
I parked next to the other soot-covered cars and headed in. After getting my own hard hat and shown around, I was led to my station, where I would spend the next eight hours putting bands on stacks of plate and verifying skid tickets. Some people were rougher than others, but the night crew seemed to be more populated with a younger crew, so I blended in just fine. I ended up with a guy named Terry. Someone a few years older than me, who showed me the ropes and made sure I was out of people's way. He was a pretty cool guy, hardworking and priding himself in being an overtime hog. The job was a little stressful, but the banter in between packaged loads made it a little easier. Despite the intimidation of the overhead cranes and loud percussion of the machines, I focused on the tasks at hand and doing the best I could. I wanted to impress management so I wouldn't get axed during my probation. The day seemed to fly by. Halfway through the shift, the supervisor let me know Terry and I were getting low manned to stay over a few hours after the shift to pick up the warehouse. Something about cleaning up to install cameras for the line. Terry was pleased and said he would have volunteered anyway. It was seniority based overtime, so if I wanted to keep my job, I didn't really have a choice. Even though the shift was extended, it went pretty quick. The labor was way less monotonous than doing dishes all day. I was told I could wrap it up for the day and head home. Terry said he would stay and try to milk it a little longer. And after a fist bump, I punched out and it was time to go home. I was feeling extremely accomplished and optimistic. That wasn't until I got to the parking lot. It was dark outside. Very dark. The parking lot was mostly empty, except for my car, Terry's, and the supervisor's. Out in the port, the air was chillier and more eerie than back home. It even felt darker, like I didn't belong there. Trying to maintain my high spirits, I walked to my car, which was now covered in the dust that blew around all day. I got in, started it up, and plugged my phone back into the aux so I could hear the GPS and music on my way home. I texted my mom that I was on my way, and after picking a song, I was ready to go. It shouldn't be too bad. I told myself, and as I pulled out of the parking lot, I prepared to cross another milestone in the same day. Driving home at night. Leaving the port was just as different at night. Instead of the sun lighting everything up, there was just a row of orange lamps lighting the way out. A few semis were shouldered for the night, drivers that were sleeping to get the jump on the next load first thing in the morning. It seemed so desolate compared to earlier this morning. As I drove through the exit and back on the scenic route that would take me back the way I came, I realized that the orange lights in the port would be the last of my light for a while. Once I left, it was just me on the road, my old beater car chugging away into the night. It wasn't too bad. The visibility was a little worse than I thought, but at least I had the GPS and music. The drive was only a half hour. Before I knew it, I would be back home and showering after the first long day of work. Entering the wooded part of my drive felt like driving into a cave. The tall trees leaning over the road blocking out even the slightest hint of moonlight. I focused on the drive ahead, the worn ox input cackling over the music. Each bump in the road seemed rougher than before, each branch reaching just a little further in the headlights. I white knuckled the wheel as I drove, feeling silly for being as on edge as I was. It was just a short drive. What was the big deal? Everybody drove at night. People did it all the time. Each winding curve seemed to turn into the same repetitive stretch of trees. Like I was driving through the same segment over and over again. Time seemed to crawl as my car chugged down the road. The high beams reflecting off every sign as I made my way. Old, beat up signs for no passing. Signs warning of a low shoulder. Signs for deer crossing. I looked at them all one by one. 
my eyes lingering long on the yellow square with the silhouette of a buck prancing. Watch for deer. To my surprise, there wasn't much to watch out for, except for the trees. Just when I thought I wasn't making any progress, I found myself at the same intersection from earlier, caught at the same red light. I slowed to the inevitable stop and sat waiting, my progressive rock drumming against long-blown speakers. My eyes drifted from the road in front of me to the train station. The sign for Sandy Shores not lit with a flickering neon. The bench with the couple I observed earlier now stood empty under a lamp post, littered with discarded trash from the commuters throughout the day. There wasn't a soul in sight. No other cars, nobody else making a trek somewhere in the middle of the night. It just felt so dark. I checked the GPS as I sat. I only had 12 minutes until I reached my destination. The drive was practically over already. As I looked down to my phone, I saw the green glow fill the cab as the light changed. I eased off the brake and continued. I thought of the work I did prior, and how my muscles were sore in a way I had never felt before. My joints ached differently, like I had spent all day long rolling down a hill. I thought of a hot shower and washing away the dirt and rust that circulated through the air of the plant as the production line ran. As fulfilled as it made me feel, in the back of my mind I wondered how people did something like that every day for work. I guess I would just get used to it. Ahead I saw a pothole in the headlights glow, one I wouldn't be able to swerve away from in time. The passenger side tire hit it dead center the impact rocking the entire car on its shot suspension. I winced at the crater in the pavement, and the crackling in the music got worse as the ox lost its sweet spot. The grinding distortion stood my hair up as I reached for the cord and found nothing but an empty scene. I felt for my phone in the dark, my fingers trying to trail the cord to the source. Come on, I said, fumbling in the dark. After several attempts, I couldn't quite find the phone, like my hand wasn't making the connection to my brain, what it was supposed to be looking for. I saw the eyes and the reflection of the fur too late, and I slammed on the brakes. The tire squealed as I flew towards the baby deer, my entire body seizing like a frozen statue. I could only squeeze the steering wheel and stomp my foot as hard as I could, unable to totally alter the momentum of the car. I stopped suddenly, but not fast enough. The car screeching to a halt just late enough to smack the fawn with the front bumper. The hit was quick, but solid, and I watched in denial as the young animal was tossed off its hooves and tumbled down the road in front of me. I gripped my teeth so hard they hurt. I looked at the body dumbfounded. It had happened so fast. There was no way it could just come out of nowhere. I didn't have enough time. Even if I wasn't distracted, there was no way I could have. How was I supposed to? The static was worse through the stereo. My phone lost somewhere in the abyss that was the passenger side floor. The cord had followed it, and it hung from the jack at a sharp angle like a tugged fishing line. I sat there with my jaw hanging, unsure of what to do, unsure of what to think. Before I had the time to even process what had happened ahead of me, another bright shape echoed off the headlights. Another deer with big ears and a shiny coat had walked into the road slowly like I couldn't believe what it was seeing. With hesitant steps, it crossed the pavement, and as I painstakingly watched it nudge the motionless body with its snout, I came to the horrifying conclusion of what I was looking at. Its mother. Ahead of me, the majestic plump doe nudged the still corpse of its child, and as it registered what it had found, promptly erupted in the saddest cries of pain I had ever heard from an animal. With its head whipping around in desperation, it called to the woods surrounding us, its calls echoing through the trees and chilling me to the bone. 
its loss, the emotion it felt was brought on by me, and the guilt washed over me like a smothering plague. I couldn't think. I could only watch. I watched helplessly, wanting to do something, but the cruel realization settled quickly. What could I possibly do other than run down its child? How could I possibly help the situation I had caused? From the passenger floor, my phone struggling against its lack of proper connection. The grinding static was worse and assaulted my ears, but I didn't dare look for my phone now. I could only look ahead at the grieving doe and the child I ran down over my convenience of musical reception. I thought about calling someone, maybe calling my mom, but then what? She would be asleep and when she woke up there would be a cataclysmic uproar and even then, I had the only car. It's not like she could come get me. I swallowed hard and after what felt like an eternity of mulling it over, I decided the only thing my piece of shit self could do in a situation like this. I would try to go around them and drive away. I felt the tears welling in my eyes as my nose started to run as I readjusted my grip. My foot was still stuck against the floor so I started easing off the brake, committing to my decision to flee. Before I could let off, however, I heard a faint tap on my window. When I turned to my window, my blood went cold, staring at me through was a giant set of glass-like eyes belonging to a large 18-point buck with wide bulky shoulders it stood in the entirety of the oncoming lane lunched down so it could look through my window its antlers reached far from the sides of its head each pronounced point bulbous with velvet after a deep inhale it snorted into the chilly air fogging the glass that seemed so thin under its size. The dark pupils were entrancing and terrifying, like the inside of the car was shrinking under their gaze. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean... It just happened. I'm sorry. I mumbled to the large stag, my hands shaking on the wheel. The swirling fear pulled at my gut, and I felt like I was going to piss myself if I didn't look away. For only a second, I looked at the doe and its child in front of me, my sense of fight, wondering if I could chance it and take the shoulder off-road and get past them. The groaning ox continued on the floor, the cord begging to be adjusted or pulled free altogether. I looked to the giant deer in desperation, wanting to apologize more, but knowing it would be useless. Only when it raised its head did I realize it wasn't looking at me, but past me, to the other side of the car. I followed its gaze and saw another of the herd had crept up, a younger male from the looks of it, two little velvet points sticking from its head. It investigated the car as it walked up, timidly observing the shape of the car before looking inside. It looked at me, then at the elder exchanging their unsettling silent glare on opposite sides. As I was caught in the middle of the doe, a head let out another pained wail. The great deer exhaled again, spreading the fog on the window. It tipped its nose to the younger deer, and I watched as it fluttered its ears. The younger one started looking into the car, its head panning the interior as the older one watched. The static on the radio came in and out, like a radio station tuning. After a moment, it paused and stared at something in the dimly lit cab. It didn't make sense to me. On my left, the elder was looking at the same thing. At first, I thought it was the dash, but they weren't looking quite at it. Slowly, I realized it wasn't the glow of the radio they were transfixed on. They were looking at the keys. In a fit of panic, I reached for the switch next to me and locked the doors. A second later, the younger deer lowered its head and hooked one of its nubs on the door handle and jerked up, trying to work the latch. The loud knocks on the handle slapping were loud and I jumped, and the larger deer snorted angrily. 
It looked at the lock on the windowsill in a way that I could only explain as pure anger. I blindly felt for my phone again and was painfully reminded it was still on the floor. The radio cackled as I fumbled with the cord, and I could swear I could hear words over the frequency. It was barely audible, but I could swear it sounded like, Let us in. The larger deer stared at me again and without warning smacked its antlers on the window. I jumped at the sound of it and I prayed to God the glass would hold. I looked forward again at any possible route to drive away. With them boxing me in, I would have no chance but to swipe one of them, or run into the mother directly. The larger one smacked the window again, this time busting the velvet, leaving a gritty red splotch on the fogged glass. It drug it across the window, making a dark smear as the bony point scraped along. Ahead, the doe rested its head on its still offspring, its chest heaving with human-like crying. Tears streaked down its fur, and at the sight of it was like I could hear the sobbing. Inside the car, over the radio. Let us in, or let him in. I tried to reach for my phone again. I chanced to glare at the floor, and I could see the outline of it on the floor in the far corner. I gently pulled on the aux cord, and the distortion worsened with every tug, assaulting my ears. I tried to turn off the radio, but it wouldn't work. The volume and source buttons only yielding the same digital error message on the display. The larger deer was rattling its rack against the window faster now, a bleeding mess trailing behind the shredding velvet. The younger deer pressed the side of its face against the passenger side window, its dark eyeball pressing against the glass as it tried to look in as close as it could. The mother deer's crying could be heard over the radio. There was a menacing chorus rising in the static, something that was trying to push through. The human crying was so loud it was like a woman sobbing in the back seat, sobbing in my ear. I looked at the window with the larger deer, with the array of bloody streaks, and as the streaks seemed to take shape, the crying of the chorus grew louder. The streaks weren't just random nudges. It was drawing something. It was drawing a pentacle. With the last crude stroke that completed the crimson star and circle formation, there was a fog rising from the ditch on the side of the road. The mother doe buried her face into the lifeless fawn like it was trying to hide. Now that the crying had subsided, the chorus seemed clearer, and it hit me that it wasn't just singing or anything like that. It was screams. Horrible, tortured screams. Through the billowing fog, a wicked amalgamation of antlers jutted from the damp leaves and grass. With bright red rays, it tore through the earth. The sounds of a hundred screaming souls droning over the radio as the rack poked through. The volume on the radio kept turning up. I covered my ears to thwart the punishing sound. The deer on both sides of me just stared in my anguish. The sound rising a pitch so great I thought the windshield would shatter. As the deer stared I could see their faces began to shake, like a movie stuck on fast forward. Their eyes rattled in their skulls as their faces blurred, the speakers in the car whining under the strain of hopeless cries and pleas. The phallics of antlers gave way to fur, wrapped around a skull bigger than a mouse. Through the cold mud it steamed in its ascent. Whether it was torn velvet or strips of flesh hanging from its points, I was not sure. They dangled like drying strips of meat. Beside me the deer shook so fast their features distorted in. Some of them animal, others human. It mashed the screams coming through the radio. As the full bust of shiny black fur was through the ground, the fog whispered away as if on fast forward as well. The head of the giant deer opened its eyelids to reveal two bleeding spheres the size of baseballs. Its jet black pupils narrowing in on me, cowering behind the steering wheel. I closed my eyes, wondering when I had started to scream. My scream blended with the others, one and the same. 
The screaming stopped. I sat there with my hands over my ears. My eyes squeezed shut, afraid to open them again. I heard the snort once again, and it was a moment before I gave in and looked in its direction. The large deer was still there, but it wasn't looking at me anymore. The screaming was gone. The bloody pentagram was gone. The mysterious fog and the shadowy black deer were gone. I lowered my hands to see the younger buck was looking as well, its ears fluttering with excitement. Not only were they not looking at me, they were walking away. Ahead of me, the fawn I had hit just minutes ago was blinking awake, confused and disoriented. After a struggle, it stumbled to its feet with the help of its mother, and weakly stood on its own after a few licks and prods with her nose. The large buck snorted and nodded at the baby, and after a moment of consideration, it nodded back. The large male gave an approving snort and turned to the mother, who nodded as well. I watched them in silence, not even sure what to do anymore. All at once they looked at me, a family of four, their many glassy eyes reflecting in the headlights. I put my hands up in defeat. I couldn't help but stare back, my hands shaking as they huddled closer together. With a snort, the large male nodded, once at me, then once to the open road behind them. I didn't believe it. Slowly, they moved together, giving me enough room to drive past them. I hesitated, but not for long. As soon as there was enough room, I let off the brake and started driving creeping past the family herd as they watched me go. I gave an apologetic look at the baby who returned it with twinkling eyes. As soon as I was clear of them, my foot pressed the accelerator and I got the hell out of there. Even though I was clear, I couldn't help but look in the rearview mirror behind me to make sure they weren't chasing me. I wish I would have just kept my eyes forward instead of behind me. They watched me go in silence, their dead stares unblinking as my car got further and further away. Just as they were almost out of sight, they stood up on their hind legs and one by one until they were all upright with their front legs at their sides. The mother and fawn looked away first, with the younger buck following close behind. The father stayed, however his stare following until all I could see was an open stretch and trees behind me. Michael, if you are reading this letter, it means that either the mail is late or it is August 8th and you have not gotten any phone calls from me. I know we're not on good terms right now, but you are the only person I trust to not just take the money I enclosed and not do anything. If it is August 8th and I haven't called, that means that an experiment of mine has gone wrong and I need you to come and help me out. Please take the money as an advance payment. I can give you more when you show up. 1. Go to the Last Chance Inn in John Day, Oregon. 2. Room 213 will be booked in my name through the 15th. Tell the owner your name, and they should let you in. If they don't, you'll have to break in. 3. Make sure that the TV and bed are exactly where they are in the drawing of the room I stuck in the envelope. Do not move anything around or place your luggage in the room. 4. Make sure your left hand is palm up in the correct spot of the bed, marked on drawing and that nothing else is on the bed. Five, with your right hand, grab onto something sturdy that you can get a good grip on. The radiator pipe might work. Six, remain silent. Seven, now for the weird part. If you did this right, at around 21.59, you should feel something grab your left wrist very hard and try to pull you. At this point, follow the steps below as fast as possible. 8. Close your eyes and hold on tight. Do not try to see what is grabbing you or allow yourself to be pulled. 9. 
Grab the wrist of the hand pulling you as hard as you can. Do not let it go, no matter what you hear. 10. Pull that wrist as far as possible. Do not stop pulling or let go of your anchor. 11. That's it. If it worked, you'll know it. This probably sounds like a lunatic rodent, and you might not be wrong to think that. I am sorry about what happened last year. I don't expect you to forgive me. Ed. That was the letter that I found waiting at my office yesterday in a wrinkled, taped-up envelope alongside $300 cash and a crude sketch of a floor plan. Ed was the sort of person who would enthusiastically jump into a wood chipper to test his new homemade anti-wood chipper suit, and, more unfortunately, was also the sort who couldn't fathom why others wouldn't want to be in the control group. I doubted that those last lines of the letter had any real meaning. More likely, Ed had read them in a book on how humans express regret and thought they might persuade me to come. I threw the letter in the recycling bin and resumed typing. Jack's smiling face propped over the gray wall of my cubicle. Seeing him under the bright fluorescent lights of the office never failed to make me wish for a power outage. Willis wanted someone to volunteer to come in this weekend. I told him you weren't busy since... You know, you never are. Under the desk, I discreetly pulled the letter out of the recycling bin. Actually, Jack, I'm afraid I won't be able to make it. I'm visiting an old friend this weekend. John Day, as I soon discovered, was an exceedingly annoying location to get to. It was squeezed into a river valley approximately 80 miles west of the highway in eastern Oregon which placed it about 300 miles away from anywhere worth visiting. Besides pine trees, farms, and smoky bear signs warning me that the entire state was a tinderbox, the only entertainment I could find was one of the seemingly omnipresent, religious, radio stations. A grandfatherly voice conning idiots out of their money. And remember, we are sinners at heart, and the path to redemption leads through holy fire. But all of you, my listeners, all of you can be saved. All may walk the path of the righteous. All it takes is to open your hearts to the Lord, to face the fire without fear, to accept judgment and beg forgiveness, and of course, to donate generously to this station. Seriously? On a more positive note, the long drive did give me plenty of time to think about the contents of the letter. Even for something Ed had written, this letter was, by all accounts, bizarre. Usually Ed's requests had involved me unwittingly purchasing and transporting chemicals that I strongly suspected he was no longer allowed to have. This, on the other hand, sounded more like an occult ritual than a science experiment. By the time I reached the town's welcome sign, I placed 90% odds on him just wanting me out here for some other reason, and 10% odds on him jumping out of the closet like a maniac at 10pm. My resigned annoyance turned to worry. Then, when the motel owner confirmed Ed's booking and showed me to room 213, he swore the room had not been open since Ed's arrival three days prior but it appeared as if it had never been used at all. No scientific equipment, no explosives, not so much as a single article of clothing, and no Ed to be found anywhere, even in the traditional monster hangouts inside the closet and under the bun. I was now faced with the very real possibility of actually following through with this, whatever it was. Just think of the money. I muttered to myself, flopping onto the bed. For all his faults, Ed had never failed to pay well. Something crinkled under the pillow. I lifted it up and took a look. A torn half sheet of notebook paper, half fallen behind the bed. The top has perforations where it had been torn off a binder. One side was blank but the other had the word convergences at the top and a chart below. Two columns, three rows before the page ended in a tear. I read them to myself under my breath. 
I could make out the top of 213 in the first column below that. The tear had erased the bottom of the number and, presumably, its corresponding four digits. A green circle had been drawn around that row. I stuffed the note in my pocket. Best not to think too hard about what Ed had wrote down. Hours later, with several drinks inside me and my luggage stored safely in my car, I found myself sitting on the floor of room 213, watching Pirates of the Caribbean on some godforsaken rural TV station. To fit my hands into the positions Ed had drawn on the diagram, I had sandwiched myself awkwardly between the bed and the wall. My left hand was laying on the bed, twisted palm up, and the right was next to the radiator. At least the awkward pose would keep me from falling asleep. The bedside clock read 9.58 p.m., and Jack Sparrow was just stepping off his dinghy when I noticed a faint blue glow in the peripheral vision and felt something brush my wrist. I had no sooner closed my eyes than something grabbed me so hard I felt like my forearm was about to shatter. The floor fell away beneath me, and I began to sink through what felt like tar my left arm being dragged downward and my body following behind. Even through my closed eyelids, I could see blue flashes. I began to hear things, whispers that wrapped around my head from one ear to another far slower than should sound. Sounds of laughter. I was not afraid. So easy now to let myself be dragged down. I could scarcely remember what I'd been doing. Something about pirates. I felt my right hand slide across something. The radiator pipe. My senses flooded back to me. I put the pipe in a white knuckled grip with my right hand. With my vice grip still on my wrist. Moving my left was agony. But I still managed to find and grab what felt like an arm. I pulled with all my might and felt a weight moving towards me slowly. Picking up speed as I pulled harder. The blue flashes turned to red, and the whisper stopped sounding joyful. The waves turned to roaring flames, and the laughter grew cruel, pounding in the back of my head like hammer blows. I felt the skin on my wrist begin to tear as the grip on it grew impossibly tighter. I tried to scream, but the pounding was so loud that I don't know if I did. Something shifted. Some cord holding the weight back snapped. And whatever I was pulling flew past me as I nearly smacked myself in the face with my newly freed left arm. The flashes stopped and I heard one last whisper as I opened my eyes. Ed's voice. Sorry. I had no idea what I had expected to see when I woke up, but I was still disappointed. The room was still empty and quiet. I was lying on the bed. Except for me slowly getting up, nothing moved. The TV was off and the clock face was dark. I sighed with Jack's face 800 miles away. A power outage was significantly less useful to me. Without the ceiling light, the only illumination was an eerie orange glow filtering through the curtains and illuminating the dust in the air. More dust than I remembered. Much more. How long had I been, wherever I was? First thing was first, though. I went to the bathroom and found, much to my relief, that the tap still worked. After a drink from the faucets and a truly legendary piss, I stepped out the door. The light of a setting sun blinded me as I stared across the parking lot, deserted save for my car. Even I had to admit that the pine forests and rolling hills were rather pretty. Less pretty was the fact that I didn't see a single other person, car, or lit window in the entire town. Had it been evacuated? The air smelled vaguely of smoke, but I could see no impending wildfire. I walked to my car and headed for the road back to the interstate. I still couldn't believe that no one had bothered to check the motel or notice my car. Then again, I still wasn't sure what had happened for 
most of a day at least. If the sun was setting again, evacuating a town, even a tiny shithole like this one, had to take longer than that. I added kill Ed to my to-do list right after. Leave without encountering the reason the town is empty. Drugging me and leaving me to maybe literally die in a fire was a new low even for him. It must have been drugs, right? No other explanation. The sun finished setting as I drove back east through the forest. My headlights now the only illumination on the road. There was still no sign of a fire, not even a glow above the trees. I should have felt relieved, safe even. I had plenty of gas to get back to the highway, but there was still something off. I hadn't seen anyone or anything on the road. No fire trucks, no evacuation route, signs, not even a speed limit sign. The road had been totally empty. I would never describe myself as much of a social person, but I would have killed to see some sign of life right now. I turned the radio on, but even the AM channels were playing nothing but static. I was so lost to my own worries that I almost pissed my pants when the radio came to life again with the same Jesus crap as before. The dash clock read 10.14pm. Shouldn't this old asshole be in bed by now? And as we wrap things up for tonight, we've got time for one more call. Listeners, please open your hearts for... An ear-splitting blast of static came from the radio, accompanied by a throb in my head. The same feeling from the motel room. My fingers scrambled as I spun the volume knob down, but the broadcast did not go quiet. As I frantically switched my gaze back and forth between the road and the radio... Flashes of orange appeared in the trees, keeping pace with my car and disappearing when I tried to get a better look. The grandfatherly voice of the preacher came back, chuckling like he had just heard an old joke. As our caller has gently reminded us, we collect more than just donations at this station. Now I know I like to go on and on about redemption, about how all sins can be paid in fire. But it is all too often that we forget there is a line. A line across which no soul may travel and still hope to see paradise. The voice became deathly quiet. I listened with growing unease. A line across which the Lord of Ash claims all. My faithful. Our caller has informed us that someone has paid the ultimate price tonight to try and escape our Lord's justice and that that payment does not yet realize he is in our Lord's realm. The voice became a bit more cheerful, chuckling again. My faithful, our payment is heading east through the forest, and I think we should give him a warm welcome. The radio went dead again. I checked my mirrors. Nothing. I accelerated away. I didn't like the sound of being a payment especially for the creepy old fart. That's how it worked in horror movies, right? The country preacher running some kind of sex dungeon out of the church basement. Yeah, no thanks. I tore around a bend drifting into the other lane and feeling the tires nearly lose their grip on the roadway. I forced myself to take a deep breath and let off the gas as I finally hit a straight section of pavement. In the distance, just at the edge of the headlights reach, Someone was standing in the center of the road. As I approached, slowing reflexively, I realized that the figure was charcoal black, even in the lights. My head started to throb again. I couldn't have been more than a few hundred feet away. Almost stopped when the figure began sprinting towards me. I could see its face by the time I was able to stop. Then it flung itself onto the hood. It was human. At least it had been. Horrifically burned skin. Little more than black flakes held together by some unnatural force, with boiling pus oozing and hissing through the gaps. Empty caverns where eyes should have been. A glowing orange maw behind perfect white teeth. The entire car jolted as I slammed it into reverse. 
two hands leaving bubbling paint and scorch marks on the hood. As I accelerated out of the creature's grasp, it ran after me, far faster than a person should have been able to run, barely slower than the car. This is the part where an action hero would pull a J-turn and say something cool. I didn't know how to do either of those things, so I reversed down the road for a half mile until the creature was just out of sight and I found a gravel pullout to turn around in. Fortunately, no more burnt sprinters tried to hitch a ride. I headed back towards town, keeping my speed down on the curves and my head on a swivel. A rational part of my brain told me to go back to town and try a different road. The irrational part told me that probably wouldn't work. Whatever rules the universe followed had gone to Lala, and along with that dude's eyeballs. For lack of other options, I continued westwards. After another four miles, an orange glow began to creep onto the horizon in front of me. A telltale sign of a wildfire. Fucking hell. Now of all times? With no creature in sight, I pulled over and took stock of my options. Forward or back? Town or forest? Possible death by monster or possible death by fire? Not a great set of options. With a boom, the roof of the car caved in. Two footprints pressed into it. The temperature skyrocketed as I floored the gas pedal, struggling to see with the roof now pressing into my shoulder. The acceleration failed to remove the monster from the roof. Instead, there was a horrible screech as a black claw tore through the metal and grazed my shoulder. My shirt smoldered. I felt my skin cook under it. Another hand reached in and began to tear the hole wider. The radio came to life again as I struggled to stay on the road. You have sinned. You will burn. The Lord of Ash will. I put my fist through the front of the radio, surprised at my own strength and anger. Fuck the Lord of Ash, whoever he is. Up ahead, a branch hung low over the road's shoulder. As a boiling hand grasped for my face, I passed under it. With a howl, the creature left the top of my car, the tree igniting behind me. I saw more orange flashes, the creature's mouths through the trees. They were making no effort to hide, trying to keep pace with the car. Speed was my only defense left. As I left the trees and re-entered the fields around the town, I saw the orange glow of the spreading fire crest the trees in my mirrors. No going back that way. I tore back into town with my gas gauge hovering on empty. The creatures were all around now, watching from the windows of the empty shops and sprinting across the rooftops. They had the numbers to jump on the ruined roof and drag me out, but they didn't. The wildfire would finish the job. The flames were the height of mountains now, surrounding the town completely and blotting out the stars with smoke. I had one plan left and it was a long shot. As I tore back into the motel parking lot and jumped out of the car, I noted the time on the dash clock, 12.36 a.m. Double checking Ed's note from my pocket, I ran upstairs and threw open the door of room 222. I almost cried with relief. There was a blue glow on the bend. I dove for it and felt a hand. I grabbed that hand harder than anything I'd ever grabbed in my life. Digging in with my nails as it tried to pull away. The temperature of the roof skyrocketed as one of the burned men appeared on the doorway behind me. Its already mutilated face twisted into a snarl. As my feet singed under a blackened hand, I closed my eyes and pulled even harder. The hand let go of my leg as I rose through a sea of red, then blue, then on to the bed of room 222. Her name was Sarah. Her driver's license said she was 27, and her still-running laptop said she had a husband and was staying in room 222 of the Last Chance Inn while on the way to visit her parents. I thought about calling the husband, but I decided against it. What the hell would I even say? Hi, I'm Michael. 
Sorry, I sent your wife to hell. Maybe you can get a new one. No, the police would probably do a more tactful job. Who knows? Maybe she'll figure it out too and pull in some other guests so she can escape. Or maybe not. The front desk lady was a bit concerned about my burn marks and painful limp. But she also handed me an envelope. I told her I had been in a grilling accident before I left. She seemed to buy it. The envelope just read, Mike open immediately on the outside. I wanted to sit in my car to read it, but my car was gone from the parking lot. Maybe it was still in hell. I opened the envelope and a set of BMW keys and a thick stack of $100 bills fell out, with a note visible still inside. That was when I noticed the brand new X6 in the parking lot. I sighed and loaded my luggage. Let it never be said that Ed didn't pay well. I drove out of town before I could get tangled in my, any missing persons cases. Ed had given me plenty of experience in dealing with legal trouble. Massive pain in the ass. Not like they were going to get that lady back anyways. Sitting in my new heated seat at a rest stop, I read the note. Michael, congratulations. If you are reading this, then you are the second living proof that intra planner travel is possible for a human. I hope that Lord of Ashes theatrics didn't scare you too badly. He's more or less at the absolute minimum level of power a demon needs to get their own realm, but he likes to act like, for lack of a better term, a big swinging dick. To make sure to follow up with him, if he asked, regarding whatever slash whoever you paid to get back out, he was extremely displeased with how long you took to get there and let me out. If he didn't heal whatever burns you got from his associates, I've got some ointment you can use. If you'd like to continue helping me with the research, my new sponsor is prepared to pay you 300 k a year and full health benefits. The car is yours. I told Jake, or Jack, at the accounting firm that you died in a car crash and had to make it look realistic. So I borrowed your old one. Side note, avoid I-84 for a bit. There was a big wreck. Hopefully that makes it easier to ditch the office job. Head south from Dayton, WA, on Touche Road until you see a sign for George's Towning Service Yard. Turn left there and follow the dirt track for about 20 miles and I'll find you. Ed. On one hand, I wasn't a big fan of the fact that Ed had been presumptuous enough to fake my death. On the other hand, I wasn't actually dead. And that was six times my current salary. Also, heated seats. I turned the radio back to the religious station and pulled back onto the road. The following is an excerpt from a notepad found in the back of a heavily damaged and weathered TTC, Toronto Transit Commission bus that went missing in August 2019. The bus was found on the coast of Hudson's Bay, north of Attawapiska, First Nation, over 1,000 kilometers from Toronto in early 2021. All I can do now is distract myself through writing. I don't know if waiting it out is my only option, or if I should do something drastic. With every second that passes, I can't help but think that this bus will be my tomb either way. I don't feel that I'm pressed for time. In fact, I feel oddly soothed. I'll write a bit of backstory for perspective. Like many other city living commuters, waiting for the bus was a fairly common occurrence to me. The trains didn't run early in the morning when I went to work. Often enough, I'd check the app, which said the same thing as the bus stop schedule. The bus would be arriving imminently, one to two minutes. One minute would pass, then two, then three. It's not infrequent that the city buses are late, with no real explanation as to why. What's rare, however, is when they simply don't arrive at all. I'd check my app over and over again, only to find that allegedly the bus had come and gone. 
News to me and the other two people waiting, as the roads were quiet and there's no way we could have missed it. I jokingly referred to these buses as Eldritch buses. Little did I truly know. Although not a totally common occurrence, it wasn't anything I'd ever given a second thought to, beyond fuming about being late. Typically, I'd brush it off as the same crap transit service I grew up with in Toronto. At first, I'd cuss and see the same displeasure reflected back at me in the faces of the other impatient commuters, as they, too, would check their phones in vain. I had no cause to care beyond my wasted time. That is, until I ended up seeing what happened to those missing buses. Today, I got on the bus as normal, around 5am on a Sunday. It was that late point in summer, when the days are hot and humid, but the early hours of the morning are cool. There tends to be quite a bit of fog, and you see the condensation is formed on the windows of quiet cars and dark storefronts. As the bus rolled up, I saw the yellowish-white glow of the fluorescent lights through the moisture-laden windows, piercing the darkness like a dull knife. The driver had that vacant end-of-the-shift look on his face. He probably wouldn't have noticed whether or not anyone who got on even paid their fare. As I stepped up to board, the only other person waiting with me shoved past rudely, desperately for a seat, likely to pass out and miss their stop. I didn't think much of it. It was too early to really kick up a stink anyway. Strangely, the bus was far less occupied than usual. In fact, there was only one other passenger on it. As the trains don't operate at this time, it's rare that I would see an open seat, let alone snag one. I didn't really care much about the why. I was just happy to get a rare, coveted seat for my... As of yet, caffeinated arse. I sat near the back, so as to keep the way clear for new people coming on. The bus trotted along as usual through the dark August morning. I tried to look out the windows as I tend to get motion sickness easily, but unfortunately, due to the condensation, I was out of luck. I dared to look down at my phone only to realize the commute that should have taken 20 minutes had been going for almost 30. Frustrated, I checked the app to see the expected time of arrival at my stop. Three minutes. Not much I could have done other than stew in my anger. Five minutes later, I checked once more. Three minutes again. Absolutely furious at this point, I stood up to gripe at the driver, but realized the bus wasn't moving at all. We weren't stopped at a light, so far as I could tell, but it felt like the bus wheels were in motion the engine was working hard, as if desperately trying to accelerate, but we were definitely not moving. I looked back down at the app on my phone. Zero minutes. Then, it started to display the time for the next bus, as if we'd glided straight through the stop. I ran up to the front of the bus to get the driver to let me off immediately, but stopped as I noticed something incredibly peculiar. I couldn't see a single thing through the front window. I hadn't paid any attention to the front windows until then, but there was no way in hell the driver could see through all the thick, creamy mist, and yet the engine was still roaring. As I turned to the driver, I noticed he was unconscious, foot off the pedal. I tried to shake him awake, but he wouldn't rouse. He was stiff and cold. If it wasn't for the wisps of breath I saw emerging from his slacked mouth, I'd have been convinced he was dead. I turned around to voice my concerns to the other two passengers, but saw they too were out cold. All thoughts of getting to work on time had completely gone out the window. Fumbling for my phone, I tried to make a call. Someone. Anyone. As I tried to call my wife's number. The call failed. No service. Out of options, but struggling in futility, I tried calling again. No luck. As I stood there, attempting to think of what to do next, I pondered, why have I not tried to leave the bus? I suppose it was because I was a little bit scared. There was a haunting nag of uncertainty in the back of my mind, a fear of dealing with the unknown all alone. 
Pressing my palm against the window of the bus door, it was cool. Far too cold to have matched the ambient temperature when I first left my home. By now it was almost 6.30 a.m. If anything, it should be warming up outside. I forced the front folding door open only to be overwhelmed with a vile, acrid scent. The vicious, almost gelatinous fog started to pour in. Desperately, I slammed the door closed as quickly as I could, gagging and choking on the permeating air. I raced back to my previous seat and put my head in my hands. What the hell do I do now? I tried to reason with myself that this was some kind of delusion. A dream, but the stinging feeling in my sinuses from the fog reassured me that I was very much awake. Although I definitely was starting to feel drowsy. More so than normal during my early commute. I knew I had to fight the urge to sleep. I was the only one on the bus who somehow managed to maintain consciousness. Every time my eyelids felt too heavy to bear, and I'd almost lose the fight against unconsciousness. I'd hear the faintest whisper come from all around me. It spooked me halfway back to attention. As my eyelids felt heavier and heavier, the whispers losing their shock value. I thought for sure I was done resisting. Then I heard a huge thump. The bus rocked back and forth. Against the window next to the rude dude who shoved me earlier, I saw there was damage to the glass from a significant impact. A web-like ripple, but strangely obscured. Upon further inspection, there was some kind of fluid or slime on the exterior of the glass. As I slowly moved closer to examine it, another massive thump sent me reeling backwards. Whatever it was, it hit like a baseball bat or a golf club. It didn't look like anything I knew, though. It looked like a fat, flattened hose. I only saw it for a second, but it was enough to know there was something out there. Whatever the hell it was. It was trying to get the rude guy. I worked up my courage, ran up, grabbed him, and dragged him to the back. No more thumps so far. I decided to do the same with all the other occupants. The back area was much harder to see into from the outside, as the windows are much smaller. Hopefully, whatever was out there would simply give up. I checked my watch. It was 7.30 at this point. No thumps since I dragged everyone to the back. I decided to look around. Maybe see if I could make out something else in the fog. I noticed something dark against the window on the left-hand side. Hesitant to approach the windows too closely, I tried to study it from afar. It looked like a big mouth, like one of those fish that suck the glass in fish tanks. I don't remember what they call them, a sucker mouth catfish, except this had several rows of and a massive body, more like an overgrown lamprey, as if they weren't creepy enough at their normal size. Wondering what the hell to do now? Not wanting to attract any more attention to the bus, I remembered my notepad in my bag. I pulled it out and began to write all of this down to help distract myself and to stay calm. I watched the mysterious leech for a while between thinking of all the details to add to my writings. I've lost track of time. I still feel torn between feeling like I'm going to pass out and being too jacked up on pure terror to sit. I looked again into its maw. It was almost hypnotic. The rows of teeth were orchestrated very strangely, almost like a psychedelic spiral, but dark and macabre. It became difficult to look away. Another huge crash interrupted my gaze into the abyss. Something huge collided with the bus, rocking it back and forth. Worse than the previous thumps. Something big. Bigger than the lamp, right? Slammed right on top of it and snatched it away. I couldn't see at all what it was, but all that was left behind was a smear of whatever juices ran through the lamprey's body. And another huge web-like crack in the glass, only this one looked more severe. 
It wasn't until I smelled that sour stinging scent again that I took notice. The fog was seeping in through the cracks. It was only a matter of time before the bus would be filled. I had no idea what I could use to block it. I rifled through my backpack and the belongings of my unconscious bus mates with very little luck. The driver had some cheap chewing gum in his rear pocket. Better than nothing. I put every piece in my mouth and started to hastily chew. I then attempted to smear the sticky goo over as much of the cracks as I could. It now caught up to the present moment in my writing. The whispers have come back. They make it hard to write. I wish I could understand what they were saying. By now, I can tell that it's brighter outside the bus. The fog has a gooey off-white appearance. Almost a little purple. I hadn't even noticed at what point the bus engine had stopped, but the lights inside are off now. I just looked up from my writing. Only for a second. What I saw briefly paralyzed me. There are shadows in the fog. All sorts of strange figures. Ranging in size from the average human to that of an elephant. Some of indescribable shapes. It feels like the bus is surrounded by these shadows on all sides. Like a cockroach scurrying for sanctuary. I'm now sitting partially under the seats next to my unconscious companions. To whatever these creatures are. I am little more than a fearful insect, hiding for dear life. Everything just got significantly brighter. The bus is jostling. It feels like an earthquake. I see the previous shadowy forms edging away out front. The light begins to dim. I had to pause from writing for a few minutes. It was too dark to see my page. We were in the shadow of something massive, but it's past now. The mist has eaten away at the gum-sealed crack. It's making its way in again. I don't know if I hope that someone finds this notepad, or if I'd rather that no one ever knows about this hellish dimension I've fallen prey to. I can see the shadows moving again in the distance. Closing in, moving faster. The whispers are so loud now, like screams, but I still can't understand. I want to understand. I have no hope here. In this place. I'm so lonely, but I don't feel as scared as I did before. If anyone finds my writing, finds themselves trapped as I am, don't be scared. It gets easier. I'm going to try to leave through the emergency exit hatch on the roof of the bus. Maybe it will give me a vantage. I need to get out of there. I don't know why, but I think that's what the whispers want. I think they're trying to help me. I don't remember why I was afraid anymore. I don't really remember what fear felt like. All of the damages reported in the notepad are consistent with the condition of the bus. With the exception of many additional signs of impacts not present in the aforementioned log. I open the door to the interrogation room. A dreary little room with a short metal table and two padded fold-out chairs. The long and bare fluorescent lights buzzed angrily in their sockets overhead, casting a clinical white light over the lone figure sitting on the chair opposite from my entrance. A young man was waiting patiently. His arms calmly and casually splayed out on the table in front of him, his tan skin standing out even more when juxtaposed over the metal. I noted that there wasn't a hint of anxiety or nervousness in him. I sat down slowly and deliberately in the chair opposite of him, plopping down two freshly opened yellow legal pads and a few pens, just as freshly opened. Every exchange we would make would be recorded, but who had the time to sit down and watch what could potentially be a multiple hour interview? We sat in silence for a few minutes, 
both of us carefully studying each other, almost as if we were two boxers in a ring sizing each other up before the first punch was thrown. What most of the people I interviewed don't know is that I am never their opponent. The other fighters standing between them and freedom. By the time I am called to visit them, the fight is already over and their fate is sealed. I am simply the referee. He had what I presumed to be curly hair, closely cropped, almost a crew cut, but the first signs of the curls starting to show at the ends. He was clean shaven with the hints of a five o'clock shadow, starting to take rut. His lips were full and a lively red, teeming with youth and life. A very attractive, clean cut young man, but the ones who get away for a long time usually are. I focused on his eyes, which were a light emerald, speckled with mesmerizing golden flecks. The eyes of an exotic sultan or a wayward bandit traversing through the endless expanses of sandy dunes. Considering the circumstances of our meeting, I would have to say he reminded me more of the latter. I earnestly studied his eyes. They say the eyes are the window to the soul, but most of the windows I have seen during my interviews over the course of the years were shattered beyond repair. I have seen bloodshot eyes, crazed eyes, eyes in immense pain, wrecked by withdrawals, and occasionally even grief and remorse. Never to their countless victims, but to the justice being served to them. His eyes were flat. So completely and utterly flat, they betrayed no emotions, the empty state of a bovine or the eyes of a fish on ice at a monger's stall, staring dumbly and endlessly upwards as if it was locked in eternal surprise at its fate. So you might be wondering who I am or why I am here. I began absentmindedly running my hand through my graying hair. Are you a detective? He asked with a voice that carried no inflection or emotion. Fitting, I thought. Handsome and the strong and silent type. No, unfortunately, I am not. I never had the brains to do it. The two very aggressive gentlemen you spoke to earlier are detectives. I am what you call a profiler profiler. He said slowly as if tasting the words as he pronounced it. Yes, I am asked to speak with people like you, people who do very unconventional things. From what the detectives told me in the hall, it seems you already confessed to everything. You killed those people. I killed those people. He stated in a matter-of-fact tone, not a hint of gloating or remorse or anger. He could have been stating another obvious fact like water is wet or fire is hot. I have interviewed more than a fair share who tried to put on a show of insanity. But I could count the amount of people who succeeded on one hand. This guy might actually be a nutcase. Thank you for your honesty makes our jobs a lot easier, and your processing a lot easier as well. Now all these other guys before me might have asked how, where, or even who you killed. I am not here to ask you those same questions. I want to ask why you did it. Why? Why? He dumbly repeated for the first time a flicker of emotion showing across his face. His eyes had winded in wonder as if he had never considered this question before, and to be fair, perhaps he never had. He limply raised both his hands and gestured around the room as if the answer was all around us to see. I did it because I could. He let his arms drop slackly back onto the table. The bovine stare returned as flat and lifeless as ever. Truly crazy. This guy wasn't just nuts, he was the whole goddamn peanut farm. So far gone on a one-way ticket to another dimension. Sayonara, hasta la vista. Return all mail to sender. Thank you and pretty please. 
All the information about the brutal slayings he had confessed to backed him up. No one had found any real trigger or rhyme and reason to his victims, which made tracking him down so difficult. Not only going after the girls that looked like a previous lover who jilted him, or victims who had the mannerisms of an abusive and controlling mother. No signs of anything even remotely sexual about his crimes. Even the method of his executions followed no modus operandi. No known pattern or preferred method of dispatching those unfortunate enough to cross his path. Is there a lot of others like me? The question had caught me by surprise. As I was pondering how to explain to my superiors back in Quantico that I ran into a real crazed killer. An empty report with all these needles, lives lost, and not even a crumb of useful data to be gained. Knowing my luck, the fight back up would be delayed just as same as the flight down to here. At least it would buy me some time to stretch the truth slightly to fill out a passable report. Beg pardon? People like me, he slowly continued, as if carefully choosing his words. I suspected it wasn't the deliberate slowness of self-preservation. Rather, it was probably the few crazed brain cells he had left working overtime to formulate the question he wanted to ask. You mean serial killers? Is that what you call people like me? Well, it's the generally accepted term, yes. So you talk to people like me. The gears in his head running hotter than ever now. But why? I decided to humor him and lean forward over the table as if letting him in on a secret. Our little secret buddy, until the meds they force feed you over at state puts that tortured little brain of yours finally to rest for what remains of your natural born life. Well, the people who do what you did think very differently from me or my colleagues. I began. This wasn't the first time I had to give this little spiel. I had given it countless times to curious people at bars, dinner parties, and first dates when they heard my job title. We want to know why you did it so we can try to understand how you think. We are hoping if you can help us, we can prevent others from doing what you did and get them the help they need in time. The words hung in the air between us, not even echoing in the slightest from the bare, soundproof concrete walls. Do you ever get curious? Curious about what? Curious about being a monster. One of my eyebrows cocked quizzically upwards involuntarily. Whether this was a whole act or not, the admission of self-awareness of his crimes would blow a hole wide open against a potential insanity defense. Why do you believe yourself to be a monster? That's what I am, right? You call me serial killer, but really, I am just a monster, aren't I? He had piqued my interest. I am no psychologist, but this was something much better to put in my report than simply checking the little box at the top of my reports marked insane. Why do you think you're a monster? Because you must think you are normal, and I think I am normal. But if the world thought I was the normal one, I would be sitting where you are sitting, not here. He concluded with great effort. Bravo, bravo. A far effort. There, my guy. My shoulders sagged in disappointment. Not exactly the bulletproof statement. The prosecution would need to throw the insanity plea out. I leaned a little bit more heavily onto the table in defeat. You talk to monsters like me all day? Not every day. Or I would be demanding a better salary than what I am getting now. I joked, knowing this would go right over the crazy little head of his. Still, one had to keep himself entertained to last long on this line of work. So, you walk among us monsters all day, and never consider yourself one of us. Consider myself one of you? 
I'm sorry, I don't really understand. Before I could even react, one of his hands darted over the table and quickly clamped onto my wrist. I almost yelped out in surprise as I tried to pull away. His grip was vice-like, and he kept my arm pinned firmly onto the table. I glanced towards the lone camera at the corner of the room, its red light blinking monotonously, uncaringly. I prayed that the desk jockey watching the feed wasn't fast asleep. Shh, he whispered and interlocked the fingers from his free hand into mine. I was taken aback by how soft his hands were and warm. An almost dreamy look came over his flat eyes, the golden fleck seeming to swirl in a hypnotic way. His lids drooped halfway over them like he was a bored child in class on the cusp of being free from the humdrum of school for winter vacation. Daydreaming of hot chocolate, Christmas, and dead bodies. Remember this? He said dreamily, still whispering. The slow and dumb speaking pattern was gone, replaced by an almost wistful tone of voice. These are the hands that killed eleven people. Eleven people? The detectives had confirmed he had only a body count of four before alerting us. Someone was going to get written up. Look, your hands are not so different from mine. We have the same hearts pumping the same blood to our same hands. His fingers were paradoxically gentle against mine, while his other hand retained its vice-like grip on my wrist. You think you can't do what I've done. Maybe you think you're a good person. Maybe you think you don't have the same disease in you that's in me. You think you can't lift that wrench above your head and have it come crashing down. You think you can't tighten the cord as the dance for life begins. You believe you can't pick up that shovel to begin digging that grave. The first grave of many to follow. I am here to tell you that you can. A sudden momentary flash of anger sparked across his face, so brief that I couldn't even tell if it was there at all. And it's easier than you think. With this, he suddenly released his grip on my wrist. I wasn't even aware of the force with which I was pulling entire arm back during his little speech. The sudden release scooted me in the chair I was in a few inches back from the table. He who walked among the company of monsters. He said, the faraway look still in his eyes, is destined to find in him a monster. It was silent in the room for a minute. The only sound coming from the ever-angry and ever-present fluorescent lights. I had not noticed I was panting and shaking. I rubbed my eyes with both hands to regain my composure. Once I felt that I could continue, I slowly returned my hands onto the table. The same idiotic look had returned to his face. Thank you. I finally said, gathering my unused material from the table. And good luck to you, young man. Take care of yourself in the future. He nodded, but otherwise made no further comments. His eyes followed me as I made my hasty exit from the suffocating interview room. By the time I am posting the recounting of this story, many years had passed since this chance meeting. I had moved on to a director position after a few dozen more interviews closing the chapter of my life that had me chasing the sickest of the sick all throughout the country. This was the only story that kept me up at night. It was only recently that my curiosity couldn't be kept at bay much longer. I had searched through my old records to contact the person I had run into this bandit devil. Many of the old faces had moved on, and the young man who picked up on the other end was enthusiastic and chipper, the telltale signs of a man who had just graduated from the academy and wasn't fully aware of what he had signed up for. 
I rattled off the time and date I had that ill-fated interview, and he took only a moment to check on the fancy new computer terminal of his. Sorry. He said in a tone to saturine for my liking. It's not only highly improbable you had interviewed him, it's impossible. The killer had been processed to a completely different county jail, as the judge had immediately designated him a flight risk and remanded him without bail. The note on his terminal said that I had showed up a few hours late and the powers that be had transferred him before I had even set foot into that building. I asked if there were any other prisoners who were being held at roughly the same time as him. He checked, but it appears it was only non-violent criminals who were being held at the time, probably on paid traffic violation fines or drunks. When the transfer of information happened from paper to the new computer systems, only the ones of interest had been transferred over. That list was lost to time. Who am I to stop the march of progress? Even now, I sometimes lie awake at night and wonder if it was just a local miscreant who was sobering up playing a prank on an overworked and aging government schlep. I sometimes wonder if he was ever truly insane to begin with. No matter. The words, whether it was said in jest or a darker thought from a monster, has stayed with me throughout the years. I am writing the story now because lately... I have been entertaining the thoughts of the things that I could possibly do. When I am driving home late at night from the office through the long stretches of a lonely highway and see a young girl thumbing for a ride. When I am in a different city waiting for the train alone in the wee hours of the morning with only another retiree also waiting, who's probably had a bit more than his usual six-pack that night. When I am hiking for my weekly exercise and cordially walk past another person in the thick wilderness and my hand subconsciously feels the outline of the survival hatchet I keep concealed for my protection. I am writing this to warn you. He who walks among the company of monsters is destined to find in himself the monster. I created a new plant. It's gonna hurt a lot of people. I'm a scientist, a genetic engineer working in a secret facility hidden deep within a remote area. For privacy reasons, not to mention the safety of the general public and my colleagues' reputations, I will not disclose the exact location of the site. The facility was small with two sleeping chambers fit for housing at most three people each alongside a testing chamber nearby, a common room fitted with uncomfortable, dull couches and a wooden ebony table. The cafeteria was connected to it by a narrow hallway and had enough food to supply us for a month. The purpose of this facility was the design of a new species of plant life. Not just any, though. It was meant to be a solution to global warming. The plant photosynthesized at a much faster rate compared to others, and if placed strategically across the globe accompanied by special growth enzymes, they could in theory remove enough carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to return Earth to a natural temperature. Of course, it was difficult, to say the least. It took us more than a few years to perfect. We had to find the exact, perfect speed of photosynthesis, not to mention the grueling effort of actually nursing the plant, it required much more carbon dioxide than normal plants, not to mention a greater need for water. Sunlight was allowed into its chamber daily through a specially modified rooftop, hidden underneath a thick, crawling canopy of tall, towering trees. It was the only area that received natural light. The rest of the facility was clothed in dirt and soil, a result of centuries of erosion and avalanches underground with the worms burrowing through the soil and the fossils of species long forgotten. They were our only company in the desolate building. 
I could tell the stress of such a mighty endeavor was taking a toll on our mental health. We were six in total. Samantha was a social media consultant. She would be in charge of releasing the actual news to the public and tempering their responses. She had decided to stay at the facility after leaving her comfortable apartment in order to oversee everything and ensure that all her reports would be accurate. I, Jake, and Corel were the scientists actually doing the work. The only other two employees in the building were janitorial staff meant to ensure a hygienic workplace. All of us were stressed. The first year had been satisfactory. We had bonded, or so I thought, over our love for science and our awe at what we were doing. However, the remote area and the isolation was beginning to wear us down. It rode our spirits until there was nothing but dust in the wind. I swore I could sometimes hear the janitorial staff muttering underneath their breath talking about how they missed their families and how lonely this building was. Corel and Jake were using their work as a distraction, attempting to melt away the mind-numbing boredom with random experiments. Samantha was busying herself with notes, rewriting them multiple times, seemingly with no reason beyond quelling the extreme boredom this place brought them all. I was honestly fine with being alone, but I think even I was beginning to experience the aftermath of being forced to live in a confined space for over five years. Talking to myself constantly, pacing throughout my tiny bedroom chamber. I reread my notes at least ten times per hour, attempting in vain to cease the endless isolation with my own voice. Always reminding myself of what we were truly doing. The magnitude of this entire project. I remember the day it all burned down. The ash is still around me. I can hear the slithering of vines and the gentle scraping sound of the thorns brushing against the cold stone floor. It is unyielding, merciless. It has no warmth or light. It devoured whatever was left of that hours ago. We were preparing to undertake the last component of our plan, to undertake the single, most important part of the entire project, the part that would prove to all of us that five years of all this work had not been for nothing. We were preparing to release the growth enzyme, only in a safe area, of course, far away from any form of life beyond our own and the forest surrounding us. If anything went wrong, the casualties would be next to none. We were unsure of how exactly the plant would react to the enzyme. It had not been tested in such a huge dose before, but we were prepared for anything. Or so we thought. I held the vial in my hand, clutching it tightly as if it was the most precious item in the entire world. I feared it would shatter in my grip any second but could not find the will to loosen my throbbing fingers. I stared at the glass separating me from my creation. My beautiful, stunning creation. It was colored a vibrant shade of green. Perhaps just an effect of the sunlight, but either way it was radiant. Its stem was clothed in thin, flexible, sharp thorns. The leaves were huge. An intricate web of light, dissonant veins shading the greenery. Their margins were bordered by lighter, little, leaf-like structures. It bore no flowers. We had designed it to be capable of survival, able to find some way to live through most things. It reproduced by use of vegetative propagation regrowing from the stem, leaves, or any other organ that had survived an initial attack. Therefore, it had no use for those attractive organs, despite the cosmetic appeal. The leaf stalks were adorned with curving spines and thorns, each capable of shredding an attacker's mouth to pieces, blood splashing onto the earth. I cautiously entered the chamber crouching down while holding the vial. I stared at the plant. We had never opted to enter the chamber ourselves before. The risk of the plant capturing any form of pathogens was too great. 
but this was necessary to ensure that the plant would be able to survive alongside humans. I entered. The glass door slid shut behind me. A voice rang out over the intercom. Easy does it. Jake's voice resounded around me, echoing along the sun-bathed walls. I rolled my eyes before carefully pouring the liquid onto the ground. The plant began to stir nearly immediately, and I swear, I caught a glimpse of the leaves perking up, as if reacting to the chemical in moments. That was unprecedented, but not entirely impossible. I exhaled deeply, letting out a breath I was not aware I was holding. My lungs expanded and contracted while my chest rose and fell. It was over. Now to observe what happened next. We all silently watched, sometimes leaving to grab a cup of coffee or a bit of food. Our supplies were dwindling, but that was no problem. They were airdropped onto the base every month, after all. Enough food to last a month and sometimes a few days longer, give or take. Finally, after noting no noticeable changes to the plant, we sighed collectively. I suggested that perhaps the plant would take a bit more time to process such a heightened amount, but I was not sure of that myself. Honestly, at this point, it took everything to not break down. We had worked so hard. For nothing. Of course, it was not for nothing. But it was not what we were expecting either. I still recall the looks of horror and awe as we all stared at Jake. He had volunteered to continue observing the plant, and his diligence was rewarded with death. His corpse was drenched in blood, and the thorns stuck out from every inch of his body. They rippled and dived deeper and deeper, and I resisted the urge to gag at the squelching sounds it produced. That was when I noticed the vines slowly creeping around Samantha's ankle. By the time I could scream, it was already slithering down her throat. She did not even have time to say a word. No last words. Not even a syllable. The vine flew straight into her chest, moving past bone and flesh to find what it so desperately craved. I kicked off another before sprinting. The facility was small but had tons of closets to hide in. I could hear the screaming voices of all my partners and, perhaps, even friends as the vines crawled all over their flesh, plunging deep within their chests and breaking past the barrier of bone. I can still hear their cries, to be honest. I do not know why the plant went after us, but I know that this place will not be its only victim. As of now, the facility has been placed into lockdown, but I know that someday, it will be freed. Remember how I said that supplies were airdropped? Well, it will happen again. The roof will split open to receive the package, and the plant will leap at the opportunity to find more of whatever unknown pleasure it gains from its depraved act of murder. Hell, for all I know, it might already be free, able to find some way out, some hidden entrance, a hole in a wall, whatever. I am writing this to warn you. I can already feel the vines creeping around my ankles, the thorns gently grazing my ankles. It's a dark place, the imagination. Sometimes it conjures up horrors greater than the truth. But I know what is coming. For me. And for you. If you ever find a vibrant green plant covered in thorns and as large as a fully grown tree, run. Do not even wait. Do not hesitate. Just run. Do not call the authorities. Do not do anything. Just run. Run as fast as you can. It might just buy you a few more moments. The trip was a surprise anniversary present from my wife. 
The holidays had been busy, so we figured what better way to start the new year than in a cabin in the West Virginia woods. My wife had found the place online. It was a newly renovated property right at the edge of a wildlife sanctuary, somewhere we could go to get away from the hustle of DC. A recent storm had just blown through the mid-Atlantic, so snow still blanketed the ground. Out here in the sticks, the back roads had yet to be plowed, so I carefully maneuvered our vehicle down the gravel paths. Wow, it's beautiful. I said to my wife as I pulled up the cabin's narrow driveway. Trees surrounded the property, branches and trunks glistening with ice. I told you, she said gleefully. It looks even better in person. The house sat at the top of a small hill so that it overlooked the wintry landscape surrounding it. Large windows adorned one side, and an expansive patio wrapped around the structure. It was raised off the ground, an impressive set of wooden steps leading up to the front door. It even has a fenced-in yard, my wife's son, so that Willow can play in the snow. Willow, our three-year-old Labradoodle, adored the snow, and a fenced-in yard meant she could be outside without me or my wife freezing in the winter weather. It's perfect. I said as I put the car in park. I leaned over the center console and kissed my wife. Thanks for such a wonderful present. It's going to be a great weekend. It only took a few minutes to bring our things inside. The interior of the home was just as beautiful as the exterior. Plush rugs dotted the solid wood flooring, and modern light fixtures hung from the ceiling. The cabin was small, but it was enough for the three of us. The main bedroom branched off to the right of the entryway, which lit up automatically when we stepped through the door. To the left stood the rest of the home. It was an open concept, with the dining room and kitchen flowing into the living room and door to the backyard. I set our bags down in the foyer and walked through the home, taking in the rustic yet contemporary design. My wife followed close behind, Willow's leash in hand. I crossed through the living room and opened the curtains to get a look of the backyard. I heard a jingle behind me and suddenly Willow was at my legs, already eager to get outside. I laughed, then unlocked the back door. Willow bolted outside, but didn't immediately go down the stairs. At first, I thought she was just hesitant of the snow-covered steps. I urged her to go down, but I realized she wasn't staring at the steps. She was staring at something lower. I couldn't see from my angle, so I poked my head out the door to see what it was, but there was nothing there. It was just the steps and the side of the house. Go on, I prompted Willow, but she wouldn't move. She just kept staring at the side of the house. Impatient in the cold, I nudged her back legs until she eventually ran down the steps. I took the bags into the bedroom. My wife called from the kitchen. You should go check it out. The bed's enormous, and the view's great. I told her to keep an eye on Willow, then headed toward the bedroom. The bedroom door led into a small hallway, which then opened into the rest of the space. The king bed faced a set of double windows which provided an almost uninterrupted view of the forest beyond. A small shed stood to the left of the window, only a few feet from the main house. Because the house was raised, I could just make out the top of the shed. I was about to turn around and head back into the kitchen when something caught my eye. A thin layer of snow covered the shed's roof, and near the edge, right next to a tree, looked like a small set of footprints. Isn't it great? My wife said, her sudden appearance making me jump. She stood in the doorway, the light from the entryway casting a long shadow into the bedroom. It is, I said. These woods are amazing. My wife smiled then walked to my side. Do you see those tracks? I asked, pointing to the top of the shed. She squinted, then nodded. Oh yeah. She said, maybe a squirrel or something lives in that tree. You think it's a squirrel? I asked. It looks too big to be a squirrel. 
She shrugged, then rested her head on my chest. Maybe a raccoon, then. I nodded, but wasn't convinced. A raccoon was closer in size, but the tracks still looked too big. Should we check on Willow? My wife asked after a few minutes. You go ahead, I said. I'm going to unpack in here. She nodded, then left the bedroom. Grabbing our bags, I wheeled them over to the dresser and closet and began unpacking. We were only here for a few days, but I hated living out of a suitcase. Crouched over, I unzipped the luggage and started pulling out our clothes. I was about to open the dresser drawer when I heard a whisper behind me. What was that? I asked, standing up and turning around to face the doorway. I expected to see my wife, but no one was there. The door frame was empty, just the wall of the entryway staring back at me. I stood frozen in my spot, slowly looking around the room. I pressed the clothes against my chest, as if they could somehow protect me. I waited to hear the whispering again, but nothing came. Just the wind outside and the creaks of the house. Slowly, I opened the dresser drawer and placed a stack of clothes into it. I bent over to pull out more clothes when I heard the whispering again. This time, I snapped around, bringing myself to my full height. But again, the small hallway was empty. I was certain I'd heard a voice, though. Not my wife's. It had been high and raspy, like the person's throat was raw. I remained frozen for what felt like an eternity, but I didn't hear anything else. Unsettled, I quickly made my way back to the living room. Rounding the corner, I saw my wife standing at the window with her back to me. Were you talking to me just now? I asked, trying to stay calm. She turned around to face me. No, she said, just watching Willow. Did you have the radio on or something? She looked at me quizzically, then shook her head. Nope. Everything's all right? I bit the inside of my lip, then nodded my head, a tad too aggressively. I just thought I heard something, I said, making my way across the room. I rested my head on her shoulder and looked out at Willow. We let her play outside for another few minutes before calling her back in. Like before, once she was at the bottom of the stairs, she stared at the side of the house instead of coming up. My wife had to call her three times before she eventually came. We spent the rest of the evening playing games, eating dinner, and watching TV. Close to midnight, we decided to go to bed. After getting ready, we crawled under the blankets, and my wife pulled up a show on her phone. Within a few minutes, I felt myself drifting off to sleep. The next thing I knew, a soft thud woke me up. A jolt of panic ripped through me before I realized it was just Willow jumping down from the bed. Throwing the covers off, I followed Willow to the bedroom door. The entryway light bled in from underneath the door, so I closed my eyes before walking out. Blindly, I shuffled toward the back door, Willow right behind. As I placed my hand on the doorknob, Willow began to growl lightly at my feet. She'd peeked her head through the bottom of the curtain and was peering outside, staring at the darkened yard. Goosebumps crawled across my arms, and I slowly lifted my hand from the doorknob to the light switch. I squinted to see outside, but I wasn't wearing my glasses and couldn't make out much. I scanned the yard but could only see the soft outline of trees and the small scattering of chairs that surrounded a fireplace in the back corner. Willow let out another growl before releasing a clipped bark. She almost never barked at home, and it was only ever at people. My heart thumped against my chest as I pressed my face right up to the small pane of glass set in the door. With a flick of my wrist, I turned on the porch lamp. Bright light instantly flooded the yard, and I scanned for any motion, any sign that someone was there. Nothing moved, and I almost let myself relax. Then I saw it, and my blood ran cold. There, in the back of the yard, 
Something sat atop one of the chairs. The trees cast long shadows over that part of the yard, but something was definitely there. A solid mass atop the chair farthest from the house. It looked to be about three feet tall, but without my glasses, I couldn't make out any more details. Cursing, I ran back to the bedroom. The sudden commotion set Willow into a barking fit as my feet slammed across the floor. In just a few seconds, I'd made it to our room and was scrambling for my glasses on my nightstand. My hands met cool metal, and I grabbed the glasses as I ran back toward the window. Jamming the glasses onto my face, I nearly slammed into the door as I peered through the pane again. Immediately, my eyes found the chair. There, resting atop it, was a thick piece of firewood. I stared at it, as if my attention would suddenly reveal what it had been. Had that firewood been there all day? Had I seen it when I'd let Willow out before? I was ripped from my thoughts by my wife stumbling out of our room, shouting my name and asking what was going on. I told her what had happened, that Willow had woken me up to go outside, that she'd started to growl, that I'd seen something or someone in the chair and that I'd run into our room to get my glasses. She peered out the window before letting out a sigh and telling me it was a piece of wood. I agreed with her and apologized for having woken her up. Something was off about the scene, but I couldn't figure out what, so we let Willow out and watched her together. Me keeping a close eye on the area around the fireplace. After a minute or so, she came back inside and all three of us went back to Ben. For the next few hours, I still couldn't sleep. Something still bothered me. I tried to shut off my brain, but it kept working at some unseen problem that was just below the surface. I was just about to drift off when I realized what had been bothering me. There hadn't been any snow on top of the firewood. All the other chairs had an inch or so of snow dusting their tops but the wood had been absolutely clean, which meant it couldn't have been there when the snow had been falling just a day earlier. Either the log had been placed on the chair the day we got to the cabin, or someone had been sitting there and had used the log as a replacement when I'd run to grab my glasses. A few moments later, a second realization hit me. When I'd gotten out of bed to take Willow outside, the light in the entryway had been on. Neither of us had stepped into the foyer yet, which meant someone else had triggered the light. Someone else had been outside of our bedroom door. The realization made my stomach drop. Someone had been in the house. Someone maybe still was in the house. I resisted the urge to shake my wife awake, instead thinking through what to do next. I laid in bed my eyes open and staring at the ceiling. I tried to think of any other explanation, but there were simply too many things that weren't adding up. My thoughts continued to spin when suddenly the light in the entryway clicked on. I laid frozen in my bed, not daring to move a muscle. Then, from the foyer, a long shadow slipped into the room. Someone was standing on the other side of the door. They stood there for what felt like ages, and I didn't dare move. Even though my heartbeat was thudding in my ears, I heard the quiet noise of the doorknob being turned ever so slowly. However, after a few moments, the handle stuck. I'd at least had the foresight to lock the bedroom door. The person on the other end tried a little more forcefully to open the door, but they weren't able to make it budge. A few seconds passed, then I heard the doorknob be released and the shadow slipped away. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. We weren't out of this by a long shot, but at least the person hadn't been able to get into the bedroom. I decided to give them a few minutes to leave and then I'd wake up my wife, call the police, and drive to the nearest hotel. Just as I was about to roll over and nudge my wife awake, another shadow entered the room. This time, though, the entryway light didn't click on. It took me a moment to realize where the shadow was coming from. And then I realized. 
There was a full moon tonight, and the shadow was coming from the window. Without being able to stop myself and having more courage since I knew the person was outside, I bolted up from the bed. My eyes went straight for the shed. I knew that's where the culprit would be. I'd expected to see a man staring in through the glass, a burglar trying to assess his target, but what I saw melted my bones. A small figure crouched on top of the shed, a clawed hand grasping the tree for balance. Even at its full height, the creature couldn't be more than three feet tall. Its flesh was gray and emaciated, as if it hadn't eaten or seen the sun in years. Beady red eyes sat sunken in its bony skull, and a row of sharp fangs glinted in the moonlight. Upon seeing me rise, it released a wretched screech, like the sound of an animal caught in a snare. Instantly, I knew what it was doing, screaming a warning that it had been seen. As if on cue, a loud thumping noise burst from inside the closet, the sound of fists slamming against a barricade. Our luggage. After unloading our things, I'd placed the bags on the floor of the closet. Whatever creature was outside must be a counterpart trying to get through some sort of passageway in the closet floor. As if egging on its comrade, the monster outside slammed its fist against the glass and began to shriek even louder. By now, Willow was awake and barking, and my wife was upright, her eyes wild with fear. With no time to explain, I picked up Willow and grabbed my wife's hand, pulling both of them from the bed. I only let go of her hand to grab the keys on the nightstand. When we rushed into the entryway and out the front door, clawed feet scrambling across the patio behind us, but I didn't turn back. Instead, I clicked the car unlocked and, fully awake now, my wife grabbed Willow from my arms before ripping open the passenger door and throwing herself inside. I dashed around the side of the car and jumped inside, my wife having already opened the door. I slammed it shut with one hand while I plunged the key into the ignition and started the car. Something heavy slammed against the back window, and I glanced in the mirror to see a pair of red eyes slide out of view. I threw the car into drive and peeled away from the house. It wasn't until we were near the end of the driveway that I risked another glance back. The front door of the house was wide open, but other than that, everything seemed normal. Then, I noticed something in the yard. The side of the house had a small door in it that was hanging open, a door right at the foot of the stairs. Depending on the ground under the home, it was possible the door led to a crawl space, a few feet tall, a crawl space that spanned the entire length of the house. We drove until we found the nearest police station. It was early Saturday morning, but we talked to the officers on duty. I told them what I saw, but they seemed doubtful. However, they said they'd check it out and asked if we wanted to go back with them. I told them hell no. My wife and I stayed in the nearby hotel that night, and the police called us a few hours later. When they said nothing was out of the ordinary besides the door we'd left open, I asked them to check the crawl space. They said they already had and confirmed it indeed did go underneath the entire house. Other than a few animal skeletons, though, there wasn't anything under there. They said I likely just saw a raccoon or some other animal outside and that I probably just dreamed the person at the bedroom door. They said they've gotten quite a few similar reports from the other city folk vacationing in the area, and that it was likely just our imaginations, not used to the woods. When I asked about the passage into the closet, they also confirmed it was there. They agreed it was strange that the house had a direct entry point from the crawl space into the main bedroom but it wasn't big enough for an adult to get through. Maybe a child, but not a full-grown man or woman. Once the sun was fully up, and with a police escort, my wife and I returned to the cabin to get our belongings. She still wasn't sure what happened, but she believed me that someone tried to break in. After we collected our stuff, I walked through the house for one final check. 
Certain we hadn't left anything in the main bedroom, I went to close the door when I noticed small scratch marks on the handle. Looking more closely, I noticed that someone or something had broken the lock. I shut the door and suddenly realized how dark it was in the foyer. Looking up, I saw that the bulb in the light had been removed. I told the police about it, and they said they'd check it out. But I could tell they didn't believe me. There wasn't much else my wife and I could do. So we loaded up the car and started our drive back to D.C. It wasn't until about an hour into our drive that I noticed the smudge on the back window. A smear of red blood. I clicked on the rear windshield wipers and held the button down until the smudge was gone. Then, we drove the remaining hour back to the city. The entire trip behind us now. Every working stiff on staff at the Ledoux Hotel knew about the man with the hatchet. I thought it was a load of garbage, a patoy of urban legend, construction site tall tales, and the inherent creepiness of an old building, particularly one in downtown Los Angeles. Once upon a time, the Ledoux was a gold-leafed den of luxury frequented by movie stars and foreign dignitaries. It devolved into a flea bag with cum-stained sheets between the 60s and 70s, stood abandoned and crumbling by 1985, then was snatched up in 2019 by the Hassan Group, an out-of-state hospitality conglomerate, taking advantage of city incentives to revitalize Spring Street. By then, the Ledoux had been bank property for over three decades, and the bank was not known for taking good care of its properties. It was a real snake pit before remodeling started. The first round of construction workers found used syringes, exploding pipes leaking filthy black water down the walls, rotting food crawling with cockroaches, and uncommissioned artwork all over every flat surface courtesy of local street gangs. Then there was the man with the hatchet. They found him on the second floor, Forever in profile on the south wall, someone, for some reason, had painted the crude black silhouette of a man on the cracked plaster, holding an axe with both hands over his head. In triumph, said some. In surrender, said others. He seemed to shoot out of the floor, and he had no feet. It appeared as though his feet had been cut off at the ankles. The construction workers didn't like him much. Most felt uneasy when looking directly at the man with the hatchet. The jumpiest of the group went so far as to insist they'd seen him move. Out of the corner of an eye, he'd be out of place. Sometimes turned around, sometimes with the hatchet hanging at his side. But by second glance, he'd move back to his original position. They tore out the carpet. They rewired the electricity. They slopped layer after layer of primer on the walls, then pale yellow. But even after five coats, the faint outline of the man with the hatchet on the second floor could still be seen through the paint. No matter, it was decided. The decorator shoved an antique chest of drawers up against the wall, and no one was the wiser. The revitalized hotel opened in mid-2021. I, slimming my way through a gap year between liberal arts college and law school, took a job working the graveyard shift. It was a pretty easy gig. Sure, I had to deal with the occasional over-friendly transient or sloppy drunk, but most nights I spent poring over my LSAT study book and answering the occasional phone call from a guest with a bug up their ass. The Ledoux was a month into its comeback when I received my first odd call. Business had been consistent but south of mind-blowing since our soft open. Last weekend, however, there was a large finance event at the convention center. Something with tech and synergy in the title. And we were booked solid. The call came at 2am on Saturday from a guest I'll call Lois. 
an investment banker in town for the conference. Staying alone in room 212. Can you tell the neighbors to keep it down? Lois snapped. It sounds like they're smacking something with a stick. My fucking door is shaking. It's a weird complaint. I hadn't heard anything from my desk and I could hear a toilet flush on the third floor. The walls were thin. But for the sake of due diligence, I went upstairs to investigate. Nothing. The halls were silent and still as a tomb. I went back to my desk under the impression Lois was either seeking attention or batshit. Two hours later, I was jolted up from a catnap by the lobby phone ringing again. Are you kidding me? I recognized Lois's voice. They're at it again. Thump, thump, thump. It's four in the fucking morning. Make it stop. Again, I dragged myself upstairs. I went right to room 212. Stood there with my eyes closed and my ears peeled. Even pressed my ear to the door. I heard the creak of someone turning on their mattress. Then nothing. Later Saturday morning, as I was half-assing the last of my tasks before the morning guy took over, a bony brunette in her thirties with a round face and a wrinkled gray pantsuit stumbled into the lobby. And when I say stumbled, I mean she half fell, half slid down the stairs in dumpy flats. From her heavy eyes and pinched frown, I deduced this was Lois. She made a limping beeline for my desk. Did you manage to get some sleep? I asked. With as much sympathy as I could scrounge up at 7 a.m., Lois tossed me a pouty glare. Of course not. Every 15 minutes, the idiot was at it again. Thump, thump, thump. And what is wrong with your beds? I woke up today and my feet are killing me. I apologized for her distress and promised a discount. I would have moved her or directed her to another hotel, but thanks to the conference, there wasn't a free room in a 10-mile radius. Just after midnight, Sunday, everything got stranger. Five minutes into my shift, I looked up to see Lois plodding her way down the stairs, appearing even messier than she had in the morning, descending slowly and laboriously. She clung to the railing like a crutch, her face contorting with each step. Finally, painfully, she made it to my desk. Hey you, she said to me. Have you noticed any unsavory people hanging around? Drunks, stalkers, druggies, whatever. I shook my head. Why do you ask? She leaned in close. Her face was blanched. Her eyes were bloodshot and her breath was sour. You're going to think I'm crazy, she said discreetly. But I keep on getting that weird, tingly feeling that someone is watching me. And I swear, in the hallway, I saw a shadow move. But there was no one there but me. I pitched another apology speech and said I'd keep an eye out. She thanked me, turned, and began her lumbering ascent back to room 212. Three hours later, I heard the scream. The scream came from upstairs. I ran for the night security guard, a Gregorius meathead named Bill and together we searched for the source. We didn't have to look far. Lois, dressed in a nightgown, huddled on the floor against the wall on the second floor. A blubbering heap. Several other guests had rushed out of their rooms. They hovered, impotently, in a confused circle. The woman in 210, Lois's co-worker, was trying to calm her down. Upon seeing Bill's uniform, Lois's dark-rimmed eyes bulged. She rolled onto her feet, got a half foot off the ground, and fell back down with a pained cry. There was a man in my room, she said. I, I saw him standing over me. He had an axe. Did you happen to see what the man looked like? Bill asked, reaching for his radio. Lois shook her head. It was too dark. I just woke up, and this dark, shadowy figure was right above me. I screamed and ran. 
it was determined that none of the other lodgers had seen this man. No shadowy figure with an axe had come through the lobby. The second floor windows don't open, and the emergency back exit trips the fire alarm. Thus, Bill and I came to the conclusion that the mad assailant must still be in room 212. The story of the man with the hatchet fluttered in my head. I'm sure it kicked at Bill's conscience as well. We'd both heard the same fish stories. We shared a half second of wild, anxious eye contact before the crazy flew out of our ears, and we remembered we were not only adults, but the professionals expected to control the situation. Bill nodded, hand on his nightstick, me at his elbow. He opened the door of room 212 and flipped on the light. We saw nothing. No deranged axeman in the room. No deranged axeman in the closet or in the bathroom or under the bed. Window shut tight. The other guests rolled their eyes and shuffled back off to bed. Lois was a wreck. Her co-worker in 210 let her sleep in her room. Bill returned to the front door. I returned to my desk, and we all enjoyed a quiet, boring rest of the night. At 6.30 a.m., I was rudely torn from the logic problem I had been pretending solved by the jangle of the lobby phone. On the other end was a shrill female voice. This, this is Kate Wong. The woman stammered. Room 210, I need an ambulance now. I didn't ask questions. I put Kate Wong on hold, dial 911, radioed Bill, the security guard, to keep a lookout for the paramedics, grabbed our dusty first aid bag, and dashed up the stairs to room 210. Lois lay on her friend's couch. Frizzy brown curls stuck to her shiny round face, flushed and swollen with tears. Her pastel pink nightgown clung, soggy and darkened, to her clavicles. The thin sheet she'd thrown over herself was similarly moistened, tangled, and hiked up to her knobby knees. I started towards her with the first aid bag. She hollered at me to stay away. I caught sight of her feet and I almost puked. Her feet looked like two gobs of chewed bubble gum on a dirty park bench. Swollen patches of raw pink cauliflower flesh from her ankles to her soles, surrounded by tough black leathery skin. Her left heel was gone. In its place, a crater of bulging red globs and dried yellow discharge, ringed by thick white dead skin. The two littlest toes on her right foot were shriveled and black and ashy at the ends, like cigarette butts discarded in an ashtray. My feet are burning, she screamed. My feet are burning. The paramedics arrived. I was unceremoniously hustled to the hallway as they lifted Lois onto a backboard, carried her down the stairs, strapped her onto their gurney, and hauled ass to good Sam. Sirens wailing. 18 hours later, Kate Wong strode back through the doors of the Ladoo. It was shortly after midnight, Monday, right as I clocked in. She'd been at the hospital all day. She came to my desk to thank me and to offer a rudimentary, if unsatisfying, conclusion to the saga of Lois and the mysterious axe-wielding creeper. Lois was going to be staying in town a little longer than she'd planned to. The doctors didn't know exactly what was wrong with her. Their best guess was some mutant breed of aggressive staph infection. Complications of untreated type 2 diabetes had also been tossed around. One way or another, during her two-night stay at the Ladue, the tissue and blood vessels of Lois' lower extremities had sustained irreparable damage, and now, amputation was the only option. They were going to remove both of her feet, hack them off at the ankles. I don't know what became of poor Lois. For all I know, she'd picked up a bug in a dirty hot tub. Maybe it was diabetes, and maybe she'd had it for months. But was too busy to properly manage her health. 
Maybe it was a side effect of systematic ailment that also tormented her with loud thumps no one else could hear, and made her hallucinate a shadowy man with an axe standing over her bed. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for it all. A logical explanation that has nothing to do with the footless, pitch black man with the hatchet. Buried under so many layers of paint and an antique chest of drawers at the end of the hall on the second floor. There has to be. I'm not crazy. I don't believe in curses or ghosts. And I know a spray-painted figure couldn't possibly become sentient and turn a pair of perfectly normal feet into those blackened, bloated hunks of rotten meat jutting out from under Lois's nightgown. And I'm equally sure there's an equally logical explanation for what I saw. Three days later, well, zoning at my desk at two in the morning, staring mindlessly at my shadow against the pale yellow wall across from me. I slumped on one arm. My shadow slumped on one arm. I drummed my fingers. My shadow drummed its fingers. Then loud laughter and the sound of the front door opening. A group of 40-something businessmen filed in, faces flushed, loudly debating some call made during the football game they'd just watched at the sports bar across the street. They didn't so much as look at my way as they tromped across the lobby and up the stairs to their rooms. But they jolted me out of my half-asleep haze. A ton of bricks dropped in my stomach. A second later, my conscious mind caught up to my body's instinctive panic. My shadow was gone. The businessmen, as they crossed the lobby, cast no shadows on the pale yellow wall. It would have been impossible for them, or me, to cast a shadow on the wall across from my desk. The light was in front of us. I snapped my head to the closest door. I looked just in time to see a pitch black body, like a three-dimensional silhouette exit the hotel. I only saw it for a fraction of a second, but a long-fingered, completely opaque human hand lingered on the doorframe for a millisecond more, before the figure disappeared into the night. I quit my job the next morning. Later, I took to the internet. I googled hatchet man graffiti, axe man plus black paint, scary graffiti plus axe, and such for hours. It took a while, but I found a photograph on Reddit. The OP claimed to have taken it at an abandoned facility in Maryland. The picture was of the crude black silhouette of a man, painted on cracked plaster, holding a spiked ball in one hand. He seemed to shoot out of a corner and one of his arms was missing. I scrolled through the comments. The post was from 2014. The OP had commented once more in 2017 to clarify that none of the urban explorers upvoting the thread should bother trying to find that abandoned facility in Maryland. It had been torn down after one of the OP's exploring buddies contracted flesh-eating bacteria there. The poor guy's arm had to be amputated. The next Reddit photo I found had been taken at a foreclosed commercial warehouse in Epping, Victoria, Australia in 2012. It depicted a crude black silhouette of a man, painted 30 feet high on a cinder block wall. A sword dangled from one two-dimensional hand. This one was missing his head, cut off at the neck by the ceiling. I read the comments on this post as well. Most of them were disappointed adventurers who'd schlepped all the way to that abandoned warehouse, only to find that the silhouetted man with a sword was nowhere to be found. Then the OP rejoined the discussion. He'd apparently returned to the warehouse himself. To his surprise, he realized the disappointed adventurers were right. The black spray-painted man had disappeared, and it wasn't as though he'd been painted over. The cinder blocks of the walls were untouched. Hands trembling, icy tendrils tightening around my spine, I googled Epping Australia plus crime and Epping Australia plus fatal accident. With a burning rush of adrenaline, I deemed my hunch correct. 
on February 20th, 2013, the body of a 26-year-old Australian woman, Jessica Fallo, was found on the side of a road. The crime was horrific and still unsolved. Someone had, in one quick, precise sweep, beheaded Jessica with the brutal efficiency of a guillotine blade. I glanced back at Reddit. The foreclosed commercial warehouse was on the same street where Jessica's body had been found. And based on the comments, after February 20th, 2013, no one saw the headless silhouette man ever again. So yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a logical explanation for what happened at the Ledoux. Just like I'm sure there are logical explanations for what happened to the urban explorer in Maryland and Jessica Fallow in Australia. There's no way a two-dimensional army of spray-painted figures, wielding weapons, lurking in destitute places all over the world. And it would be utter fantasy to suggest these silhouette men are seeking out their missing appendages and commandeering them for unsuspecting victims. Just... Be careful out there, will you? I think my wife cheated on me in college, but I'm afraid that's not the worst of it. I would appreciate some help not freaking out. I found it early on the third day of the project I thought would take an afternoon. Wedged tight between a yellowed flip book of baseball cards. Nothing but nickel and penny backs it would turn out. And a dry rotted box of moth hole linens. Probably more than the cards after a wash. I almost threw out the small plastic case along with the box. It wouldn't have even caught my eye if I wasn't so desperately looking for something to make the purchase of the storage unit worth it. Scanning everything. Not a CD case, a floppy disk weighted inside, piece of masking tape covering the front labeled FTA. I set it on top of the measly pile designated keep, right on top of the rickety rocking chair. Wow, real treasure there, my wife Jane said, already wiping off the thin layer of sweat onto his sleeve. It didn't take long for these metal boxes to get hot in the Florida summer. Might have some clip art on there if you're really lucky. A fresh copy of Windows 95. That's how this stuff goes. You sort through all the junk until you find the one thing that pays for the auction by itself. I said, surveying the last bits of crap we had left to sort through. I love you, Bun, but you gotta realize there's a big difference between reality and reality television. She yelled as she threw down the box she was holding and started batting herself. A centipede worked through the handle hole and back into the void within. Jesus, you're definitely going through that one. It's some kind of game, I yelled from the office later that night. I managed to dig out the old floppy disk drive from the ancient computer left in the storage unit and was amazed when I managed to hook it up to my laptop with a little creative adapter use. I waited to click the game Dot .xe file and look through the only folder. A bunch of files without extensions. All with random strings of digits. More than seems like should fit on a single floppy disk, but I didn't actually remember how big they were. I just remember the Oregon Trail took too. Great. Really hope it's worth the $500 you blew. Jane called from the kitchen. Her voice got raspy when she was tired. Because nothing else here is. All this jewelry's fake. Deciding an apology would just frustrate her more, I held my tongue as I clicked the XE, hoping whatever viruses there were too old to do any damage. I was instantly greeted by jarring music and a spinning aerial view of a campus. FTA slash start. There were no other options. I click start. Like a stop-motion movie, the camera clicked down quickly down to the ground. The quality of the pictures was actually pretty good. The whole game seemed to just be a series of images taken at different angles. Kind of like Google Street View. Huh. I said trying to do some quick math in my head for how much space all these pictures will take on the drive. 
Must be a short game. The camera stopped moving as it centered on a walkway leading into a large building with an arched section showing a courtyard inside. I knew this building. It was the clock tower quad at the University of South Fork, my alma mater, on the other side of the country. Just as I was pondering the coincidence, white text flashed across the screen, jarring me with that beeping music again. Find the abomination. I typed all over the keyboard, finally ending the music and causing the text to fade as I figured out you controlled the camera with the numpad. Each step changed the photo to one a little bit more in that direction. Tap, 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 and I was walking down the path I took every Tuesday and Thursday to biology. A girl clutching books was walking towards me, a little further with each step, wearing that oh-so-popular-of-yesteryear combo of Ugg boots, puffy vest, and a jean skirt. I tried tapping backwards to see if she'd walk in reverse, but she continued forwards no matter the direction I moved. Something about that seemed wrong. I tapped my way to her, catching her quickly. The two chipper tone was replaced with a gravelly roar, a bit like a toy with a low battery. A white line highlighted the girl as a question flashed above her. Abomination, question mark, slash yes, slash no. Of course, I clicked yes. My stated mission was to find the abomination after all. The screen shook as the outline fully enveloped her, then the whole screen turned white. When the photo returned, a wah-wah sound accompanied the words. Try again. Find the abomination. The girl was lying on the walkway now, a thin line of blood coming from her mouth and one of her eyes. What was this game? I heard Jane's footsteps through the bedroom across the hall and checked the time. Almost midnight. I'd already blown the whole evening getting this game set up. My cursor covered over the X on the window before an idea struck me. I moved past the girl I had apparently killed and turned around. Sure enough, I saw the finger felt dorm, ugly and blockish as it was a decade ago. I clicked forward, careful to not get close to any of the stutter stepping students around me on their way to class. I got to the side entrance door, the one that required a key card to get past. There was no option to open it, only rewarded with a staticky, ung sound as I tried to walk into it. I tapped back and forth, letting time go forward slowly until the door finally opened. A young man, collar popped around his puka shells, highlighted white as the eerie sound returned. Abomination. Yes, slash, no. I clicked no this time and the outline faded as the proto-douche continued on his way unharmed. I tapped through the open door and into the dorm building I lived in for most of two years. Again, just as I remembered it. This must have been a school project of some kind, made by a CS student taking pictures throughout campus. Maybe it was to show off some kind of image comprehension technique. I walked across the common room to the stairwell door and again had to pace in place while I waited for someone, a stressed looking older student, to open the door for me. I hoped the door to the third floor would be propped open as it always was when I then realized that was stupid to expect because it was only while I was there that the door to the third floor of dorms was indeed propped open. I could have told you the name of the book wedged between the door hinge without looking at it, but I tapped myself close anyway. The busted copy of Norton Anthology of American Literature. Volume D wadded right where my roommate had crammed it. It was his little social experiment to see how long until someone removed it. The surprising answer? A year and a half. So all of these pictures were taken while I was a student. What are the chances? The vibration of my phone on the desk shook me from my focus. I had been jaw clenched, leaned so far I was almost touching the computer screen. A text from Jane. 
Take the dog out before you go to bed, and don't spend all night on that thing. We're waking up early tomorrow. I sat down the phone and looked back to the strange window into the past. I tapped excitedly down the hallway to room 309 at the end of the corner turn. The door was closed. I checked all the keyboard keys, seeing if there was somehow a door open button I missed. There was not, so I began my now familiar back and forth shuffle to progress time as I waited for the door to open. Would I see a younger version of myself? Of course not, I realized. I would have remembered some creep running around taking pictures of me. The door opened and I backed up to see Jane, hair up in a messy ponytail. Just a girlfriend back then. It looked like she was wearing my hoodie, actually. I took a picture of the screen with my phone and sent it to her with a caption. Do you remember this? The picture, not the hoodie. But I could already hear her lightly snoring across the hall, so I set the phone down and returned to the game. It wasn't that hard to get around when you followed someone, because they opened all the doors for you. This was clearly the way the game was meant to be played. As I tapped along behind her, Jane turned away from the dorm and followed the sidewalk to the streets across from campus. More than one permanently installed beer pong table stood in front yards more rug and astroturf than grass. She was trekking through the classy part of off-campus housing. She flipped open her pre-smartphone and started to call as she stepped onto the porch of one of the less run-down houses. A bearded guy answered. He looked vaguely familiar. She snapped the phone closed, smiling in that sly way of hers. As I made my way up the stairs, the first frozen pictures that greeted me was of them locked in an embrace, lips millimeters apart. One more tap and they were connected kissing passionately. I stopped and rolled myself away from the keyboard. With a backdrop of tandem snores from Jane and Tanto now, who had apparently given up on me for that walk and gone to bed as well, I started my existential crisis. Somehow, whatever this game was, it had to be real. There's no way something would have all that real detail in it without actually being real pictures. But no one reacted to the camera, so the camera must be invisible or really small somehow. I finally realized what bothered me about the way people moved. In Google Street View, there is one picture for each spot you drive through, because the camera car went through that area only one time. This game doesn't work like that. There isn't just one picture for each spot. There's one every second because you can stand in any spot at any time, or follow someone around. If there were 10,000 different places to stand in the zone of the game, and there were probably more, I hadn't found the edge yet. I had already progressed time in this game about 2 hours, so that's 7,000 seconds. That would be 70 million pictures. The answer was obvious. It must work off a server. The floppy disk just has the software to grab the pictures from the internet. So, with that sorted, I closed my eyes and leaned back, letting my heart sink. This was real however this game was made, and this really was my wife kissing some other guy. I looked back at the screen, irrationally hoping I wouldn't see them trying to swallow each other. Like maybe I missaw it somehow. There they were, kissing still, frozen and waiting for me to walk forward another second. I looked closer at the guy and I don't think I really let myself believe until then. I did recognize him. He worked with Jane at the coffee shop in college. His name was Tucker and always had a shit-eating grin when I stopped by, past punchable face and into hammerable if that was a word. A sudden urge to close the game and try to purge all this from my mind struck me. I tapped forward, making sure to follow them before they closed the door behind them. He was already halfway through getting her, scratch them, my hoodie, over her head. She eagerly raised her hands to help him. I tapped forward again, 
The white outline surrounded him as the growling music started up. I plugged in my headphones and put them in. Abomination. Yes slash no. Yes, dear game. Yes, please. The screen filled with white again and returned with Tucker smiling no more, laying face up, blood working down either side of his face. A small pool of it obscured one eye, the other staring up blindly. What confused me was Jane's face. Shirt half on, makeup smeared. She looked horrified staring down at him. How had the game coded that? The game answered. Try again. Find the abomination. I tapped closer and she was on the ground beside him, hands preparing to shake him. The white outline covered her now as well. I couldn't stand to see that look in her eyes. She really cared about this piece of crap. Didn't he comment something on her profile picture last week? My stomach sank further still. It had bothered me when I thought this was some college fling she never told me about, but I only now considered it might still be going on. We were going to have quite the talk in the morning, Jane and I. For now, a little catharsis. Abomination. Yes, slash, no. Sorry, Jane. I whispered, pursing my lips as I pressed yes, feeling oddly ashamed, like when Kid Me forgot to feed my Tamagotchi. The white light came and went, and Jane laid face down over Tucker's chest, a single drop of blood on the carpet below her nose. The dog snoring got louder from the bedroom. Do dogs ever need CPAP machines? It didn't seem to bother Jane, at least. She was sleeping soundly now. Ding ding. A new sound greeted me. You win. You have wounded the abomination. Level 1 complete. The screen showed the flashing text as the image panned back on its own up and up. Through the roof and up further until the camera or drone or whatever was above the city again. The words faded and the original screen returned. FTA slash start. I looked at the clock. A little past 1 a.m. I closed the game but didn't feel the least bit like sleeping, despite feeling ragged as I ever have. Eyes half closed from his nap, Tanto tumbled into the room in that clumsy German Shepherd way of his, eagerly displaying that universal tap tap dance. Ready for that walk, boy? I had to focus on the simple things. Tomorrow would be a hard day. I closed the laptop and tossed on my jacket. The green light still glowed on the floppy disk drive. I unplugged it and after a few seconds, it turned off with a click. I heard the ping of my wife's phone from her bedside table. I walked quietly across the hall, Tanto at my heels and peeked in. The glow of the phone screen lit up the room. But Jane was still as stones, unstirred by the chirps. Part of me didn't want to snoop, but I already had the phone in my hands before I could stop myself. I got her password on the third try. She only had a few she used. I opened the notifications. Three missed calls from a number that wasn't in her contacts. All in the past few minutes and one voicemail. I hit play before I could stop myself and quickly hammered the volume button down as a girl started loudly sobbing on the other end. Hey, it's Tucker's sister. He's really hurt. He fell over and hit his head on the table. Now he's just laying there. I called 911, but they aren't here yet. Call me back. I'm freaking out. He's bleeding from his eye. The line clicked and I brought the phone back down. As I stared, a text came through. They said he's dead. Call me back. Another call chirped and I silenced it, letting that last line of the voicemail roll in my head. I shined the camera to the Jane-shaped lump in the bed. I listened. The only sound was the whispered whines of Tanto beside me. No, I said 
surprising myself with how neutral my voice sounded. Jane, wake up. I yelled, wake up. My feet felt pinned in place. One step closer and I could touch her, shake her awake, unless she was dead. A black thought reminded me. She was still laying there, unmoving. No, no, no. It's just a fucking game. I backed up to the door and flicked the light on, slowly walking back towards her, looking for what I was afraid would be there. A single drop of blood on the pillow beneath her, dripping from her eye. I saw nothing. She yelled, pulling the blankets up to block the light. What is wrong with you? Oh, thank God. I said, almost losing my balance with a wave of relief that washed over me. When you didn't answer, I thought, I'm not that old dummy. You're not getting rid of me anytime soon. She said, stretching as she sat up. Now, what's so important? Your phone was going off like crazy. I handed the phone to her after she finished rubbing her face. A bunch of missed calls. I watched awkwardly as she flicked through her phone and listened to the voicemail. I think a friend from college is in the hospital. I gotta take this. Sure, sure. I said stepping aside as she slipped on her house shoes and robe. Tanto followed after her, clearly giving up on me after I failed him a second time. I was left alone in the bedroom, staring at something that stopped my breathing with rising fear as one word repeated in my mind. There on her pillow was a small stain, a single circle. Not red, but darker. Black as ink. Is this all a coincidence? Am I going crazy? Everything I'm about to tell you had taken place over a short period of time last year. Another hurricane had just finished battering southern Louisiana and they needed contractors to fix houses as soon as possible. With the amount of homes that were damaged, they needed more inspectors, so they outsourced. That's how I got here. They flew us there, trained us, and we started inspecting houses within a week. Suburban neighborhoods and townhouses had been damaged and destroyed en masse, and they needed us to figure out which houses were the highest priority in which families needed shelter. Basically, triage for buildings and the people who lived in them. During this time, my employers took note of my work ethic, or maybe my skill, something of that sort, and paired me with another sign-on, Andrew. Andrew and I took care of some of the rural houses that had gotten hit, spending a few days together, driving around the outskirts of the city before we finally got the call. Our mutual supervisor called to pull us off the job immediately, taking us off the scheduled route and telling us to head back into town. He didn't bother telling us why, only that it wasn't something which could wait. A small number of important looking individuals in EPA raincoats and a few other legal looking men in suits waited for us in a large fly tent staked into a parking lot. Beside them was a large table full of organized folders and documents. Across was our supervisor. This them? One of the EPA gentlemen said, Yes, this is Andrew and Dylan. They're going to be checking it out. Our supervisor replied, and already the suits began to funnel out of the tent. Good, hopefully it's nothing. Get it sorted, the EPA officer said before turning to follow the rest out. With the three of us alone, our supervisor wasted no time and quickly began afflicting us with his anxiety over the situation. Listen, the old man said, I picked you two out for this job because you are the only sign-ons competent enough to get it done. Andrew and I stood in silence as the situation was explained. Some warehouse that was marked as a possible illegal dumping storage site was caught up in the storm. Badly. 
It's near the shore and the law can't investigate it yet. But someone needs to get out there and make sure a chemical leak isn't about to flood the gulf and the aquifer. He stopped a moment, backing away and glancing over the paperwork. They think the owner was a shell company who they couldn't get a hold of. I tailed it out of town before the storm hit. No one should be left there to bother you while you investigate. What exactly are we looking for? Andrew asked after a brief moment of silence. Any visible evidence of chemical spills, leaks, or containers of any kind? I want no pictures. Only an account from the two of you, understood? I responded with a yes sir. As Andrew nodded, after further explanation and directions, we were back in the truck driving towards the supposed site. The sun was at its worst by the time we got near. The few stray rain clouds did little to blot out the blinding orange sun of late summer evening. Rays of the harsh light pouring through the cypress trees and elms that began to surround us. As we made our way further into the marsh, as the drive went on and the sun fell further, the world around us began to feel a little more desolate. Debris and abandoned cars still littered the roads and fields from the hurricane. Shops and homes were left to rot with smashed windows and torn roofs. The distant shoreline signaled we'd gotten close to our destination, but as the sun fell behind the trees and horizon, the sea darkened, blending into the night sky, our headlights soon becoming the only source of light around us. No shops, no street lamps, no stoplights, only the thick air, heavy with the scent of a freshly upturned swamp. After the long trek, the GPS finally said we'd arrived. It was a gas station our supervisor told us would be the closest spot on a map to drive to. From there, the directions were handwritten, into the marsh about a mile in. Andrew and I sat in the truck, preparing with only the timid lights of the truck's dash and radio. The thin crescent moon hiding behind the cypress jungle that surrounded us. You ready? He asked me, looking out into the darkness, backpack over his lap. Should have asked me that three hours ago. I said, stuffing my gear back into a small pack. Yeah, same here. God damn, it's hot out here. Andrew said as he opened the driver's side door. As our doors opened, the previously muted sounds of the swamp flooded us. An orchestra of amphibians and insects over waves breaking against the near shore. Marshy grass squelched beneath our boots as we trekked through the flooded field. Our flashlights barely able to break through the sultry air. Wasn't even this muggy up north. No wonder no one wants to come down here, Andrew said, looking down at his footing. How close do you think we are? I asked, shining the flashlight to the end of the field on its brightest setting. The barest suggestion of a tree line revealing itself in the darkness. He said it was on the other side of this, didn't he? Near the water? The grassy field had led to a large expanse of swampland bordering the ocean inlet. As we reached the field's end, the sounds of the ocean grew, the breeze chilled, and through the darkness and the trees, we could see a strangely rectangular object. There, on the coastline, I said, pointing my flashlight down to reveal the dull shine of sheet metal. That's gotta be it, right? He asked, the two of us stepping over small sinkholes, ferns, stumps, and vines to reach the warehouse-like building. It was obviously a new building, much of the sheet metal. Exterior was newly painted, and a very expensive-looking security door was the only opening we could find. It sat nearly halfway into the water. We couldn't get a good look at the water side, but it seemed to be deliberate positioning, not from flooding. Dylan, check this out. I heard from the front of the building. Andrew was inspecting the very large double security door. Some kind of card reader was attached to it, but no handle or lock was visible. Well, how are we going to get inside? 
I asked, trying to peer through the eye slit. Andrew looked at me with a face of smug disbelief as he pushed gently onto the door. With a heavy metallic creak, it slowly swept open, unlocked already. I guess it's not breaking and entering if we don't do any breaking. The second door opened with just as much ease, the latch unsecured, giving no resistance. I don't like this place, so let's get this shit over with. Andrew said as he closed the front door behind us, leaving it open just a crack. The smell and sounds of the swamp became faint as we stepped through the hall, replaced with metallic creaking and the billows of wind against the walls and outside trees. The scent of industrial cleaners, solvents, and rotten fish held stagnant in the air. What the hell is that smell? Andrew and I seemed to say in tandem, both of us pulling on our air respirators. It's fishy, but... Not the normal kind of fishy, right? I asked, Andrew answering with a perplexed stare. Let's just make sure it's not a gas leak or something first. You got the meter on? He asked, holding up his gas sensor. Clicking it on, the device lit a small red LED, which turned green after a few moments. We both looked at each other, implicitly agreeing and continuing through the hallway. The entrance made way to a small common area. It was windowless. Not even the smallest LED light broke through the pitch dark before our flashlights illuminated what they could. Against the sheet metal walls, we could hear the wind gaining strength outside, masking the faint and familiar sound of heavy raindrops against the metal roof. The two of us inspected the room. An ordinary room that felt strangely out of place. Some kind of reception desk, chairs, folding tables, everything upright and neatly placed, unaffected by storm or apparent retreat of the owners. We searched it quickly before moving on into the closet doorway that Andrew had already entered. Hey, Andrew peered out from the doorway. Take a look at this. Behind the reception desk, Another security door, unpowered and unlocked. A small office room stood cramped together, pillars piled on papers, printed photographs, maps, and charts pinned to boards that hung on the sheet metal walls, but no computers. The wet smell of mildew crept in, mixing with the dusty dry air inside. Taking an air through the mask required effort, like breathing through a straw. Desks stood pressed against the inner wall and windows looked out into the main warehouse type area in the center of the building a few feet below. With what light could penetrate the thick, strangely dark glass, I could see two large boat sized objects side by side, each covered by some sort of tarp. If they're storing anything in this place, I'd say it's down there. I said just loud enough for Andrew to pick up. Those definitely look like containers of some kind. Or boats. They could be dumping the stuff right there. He said, squinting at the things for a moment. But before we go down there, look at this stuff. He motioned me towards a collection of papers. He'd taken off the boards. Photos, graphs, diagrams. Most were blurry. Labeled in ways I couldn't decipher, lacking enough context to understand, however, a few stood out to me. First, there was a photograph of a small beached boat. This stood out to me only because it was labeled, Last Known Location, Remains Yet to Be Discovered. Second was some sort of map. It was of the Louisiana coast and the further Gulf of Mexico. Diagrams and grids were drawn across it mostly centering on the center of the gulf. Points crossed out here and there, labeled with dates stretching back nearly a year. Sighting, X-band, 15,000 feet, untraceable. Was noted next to a large circle. Lastly, there was this colleague of sorts. A collection of headshots from random people, as if they were pulled straight from some social media profiles. 
Each was labeled with a name and their status. Judy Henderson, female 27, A9160, status, subject 1, recovered, stage 3 decomposition. Andrew Baker, male 13, B4196, status, subject 2. Dylan Hall, male 26, B1420, status, subject 2. This went on to list over a dozen more people. Those labeled subject 1 had more information on them, but for those labeled as subject 2, the information ended there. Piles of paper littered the desks and floor. I tried to read some of them, but the government legal speech was too heavy to break through for either of us. I skimmed for keywords that might hint at chemical dumping, but no sense could be made from any of it. The hairs on my neck stood straight, and I could feel a tingle course through my body. I shivered. Andrew, have you seen this? I turned, paper in hand as the metal building rung with an ear-deafening crash. The entire room vibrated and I nearly collapsed from the sudden shock of the ear-bursting explosion. And the familiar sound of thunder above that followed shortly after. Jesus Christ, Andrew said, gripping his ears. A torrent of rain began pouring against the sheet metal roof, echoing throughout the building. We should probably pick up the pace, I said as another sound rung out. Something very large shattered in the room beside us. The haunting sound of distant shattering glass that filled anyone with a sense of immediate panic and dread. Andrew and I said nothing, sharing a short glance before moving towards the side door. Just like the others, this door was unlocked, but was exceptionally heavy. A few steps led into a large room, concrete foundation and walls this time. Our flashlights scanned the room quickly centering on a sparkling pile of broken glass and spilled liquid, something large flying in the midst of it all, dark, decayed, stretching across the floor. A body. A human body. The smell of formaldehyde choked me through the mask. I think I would have vomited if not for the adrenaline and panic I was experiencing. You're seeing this too, right, Dylan? Andrew said, his flashlight revealing the subtle shake of his hands as it illuminated this thing that looked as if it was exhumed from a grave. I think we need to get the hell out of here. Now. I said, unable to take my eyes off it. Dylan? Andrew said and I realized his flashlight had moved, illuminating something else. The place where the body had broken free from. There was more of them. Contained in large glass pillars. Silhouettes floating in a tank of dark yellow liquid. The smell became more unbearable than the sight of it. But before I could leave. I could see something written on one of the tanks. Dylan we need to leave. Andrew said behind me. But I was going to be quick about it. I stepped forward leaning in, trying to ignore the chemical-soaked corpse only a few feet away. It was a white label stuck onto the glass, reading only A9160, written in marker. Another crash reverberated through the building, shaking the metal structure and anything not pinned down, including myself. This time was different, though. It wasn't thunder. The screeching howl lasted mere seconds, but it echoed. A inhuman call that no machine or billow of wind could produce, and I immediately could tell that it came from the center room, a few feet beside us. I couldn't bring myself to move or to look at Andrew. I was too affixed on trying to lower my heart rate, my chest beating up my throat, echoing through my ears. I tried to take a deep breath. The smell of formaldehyde causing me to almost pass out. Andrew took my shoulder with a hard grip and I snapped back. We left the place quickly and without speaking, opening the heavy, unlocked metal door once again. 
Only this time, it seemed a bit larger and harder to push. The room was far too large. The smell of rotten fish and salt water replaced the chemical odor. My eyes began to burn. We went the wrong way, Andrew said in a whisper, but he was equally compelled to move through the center chamber we'd found ourselves in, instead of backtracking. It doesn't smell like chemicals in here, I thought aloud, shining my light across the room. Across the two large objects sat side by side in the center of it. Closest to me was the smallest covered object. Smaller than the hulking silhouette on the other side of the room, but still larger than a rowboat. Andrew was inspecting the far wall, looking for an exit. I carefully made my way through the chamber. The floor crowded with tools, soaked papers, and tattered clothing. Until I was close enough to see the fabric lines of the heavy canvas tarp covering this thing, and a small label reading simply, Number One. It was a smell like a seafood market, not quite rotten, not yet at least. There was something else there, I could smell it through the respirator, the smell of a freshly butchered fish. I lifted the tarp, peeking underneath. Andrew, get over here, I said, almost melancholic in disbelief. Stop messing with that stuff. We need to... He stopped mid-sentence, seeing the small part of the thing I'd uncovered. I couldn't quite make out what he had said underneath his mask, but it sounded Spanish. I tore in the tarp away as best I could, both of us stepping back as if we'd lit the fuse on a stick of dynamite. It lied there, unmoving, distended. I could hardly see any of the dark skin. With all the red there was, it was impossible to tell at first glance which part was the dissected, hollowed out cavity, and which was the thing's mouth. I cannot express the intangibility of it. It was no beast I'd ever laid eyes on before. In life or fiction, no features familiar to me stood out. Besides the possible presence of organs, but none of those sickly dark, glossy things looked like any organs I'd ever seen. I could tell what had to be its head, but every primal sense within me spoke against that assumption. It was a flabby, almost melted mass of fleshy coils, protruding growths, glossy black beads embedded along the outer layer of its cylindrical head. I could hear something like wind, and it was then that I realized just how quiet it had become. The rain and thunder gone, and not a word from either me nor Andrew. Only the racing of my heart pounding against my eardrums. The louder the wind became, the less it sounded like wind. Follow me, Andrew said quietly, urgently, inching towards the front door, gripping my shoulder. The wind grew louder and became methodical. It shook the metal, vibrating the tables and tools strewn across the floor. As we came closer to the exit, my mind became clear enough for me to realize something. There was another one of those things in the room. A much, much larger one. And that sound was not the wind. My dim flashlight only caught the slightest glimpse of the tarp caving in on the larger thing. Before expanding again, it was breathing. Time went by faster than my mind's ability to comprehend its passing. The loud metal clanking of the door behind us opening, matching with the deafening chaos that unfolded in the dark chamber ahead. Among the sounds of metal snapping and glass shattering, I could hear the resounding noise of an animal grunting in the darkness. As we pulled ourselves through the exit door, the back of the chamber opened. Large gates to the coast slammed open with overwhelming force. The darkness of the chamber gave way to the inkling of moonlight from outside and the glimmer of the dark waterfront. Masked by a silhouette that towered over the opening, dragging itself closer to the edge. The door slammed behind us, just as we made it through. 
The foundation of the entire building shook in the marshy soil, threatening to collapse into itself. The heavy metal doors swung back and forth on their hinges, almost knocking both of us unconscious. We made our way through the final exit, the humidity and buzzing sounds of the swamp finally returning to us. But beyond those noises of nature, beyond the pounding of my heart and the sound of my own breathing, I could hear something behind the structure, something large sinking into the shallows, disappearing into the ocean. What followed after we escaped that place was a sleepless night in a locked car, hidden away in an abandoned gas station. Neither Andrew nor I were capable of driving in that darkness for more than just a few moments. Every sound and creak jolted me. My eyes burned in the stench of rotten fish and formaldehyde. Would not escape my senses. I could see only in Andrew's red eyes the desire to forget everything we had seen, and to assume nothing from what we had not. I have never felt time pass slower than on that night. The still, unmoving darkness that surrounded us until the early morning. Once the sun had broken and revealed the cloudless sky, I felt like reality had returned. They came looking for us. Soon after, I had told our supervisor that something had happened over the phone. Only capable of driving far enough to get some reception. Nothing happened after this. At least, nothing to do with either of us. They sent us home. There was no interrogation. No questions. They didn't even take our phones. Andrew had not spoken a word to me since leaving that place and thinking back on it. I hadn't spoken to him either. Neither of us spoke to anyone but ourselves in our minds. Only I had said anything. Over the phone... I had said something to our supervisor, something I don't remember, but it was enough to signal that we needed help. Or maybe I didn't say anything at all. That was all it took. Walking tours are always a good idea. They're a great way to see a city learn some local history, and particularly if you're a solo traveler, to meet people all on a budget. So when one of my old travel friends, Nils, decided to come visit me up in Edinburgh, I suggested we go on a ghost tour. I'd been on the tour several times before with my parents, when visiting before I'd moved here, and with several friends coming up for the fringe, so I knew it was a safe suggestion. The tour guides were usually very friendly and excellent actors, and the ghost stories were really just a mechanism to teach about the history of the city, which, in all its macabre, gory details set amongst gothic spires and centuries-old smoke black and stone, was the perfect tone, when in the deep recesses of the ancient city, the plague victims. Edinburgh had a higher death rate than the birth rate for many years gang members, and Highlanders crowded around small, fitful fires roasting rats to survive a desperate escape from the bloody Highland clearances seemed not so far away, in time or in space. As a bit of a history nerd, I loved it, and I knew Nils, who'd shown me around most of Belgium, would love it too. A ghost to her. Is that where I get murdered in the dark and no one knows it was you? I promise it'll be fun. No stabbings. Maybe later on when we go out and lay, though. As long as I get to have a beer first. So it was decided. The week came around and he arrived without a hitch at the airport. We met at the train station and had a wander around the Christmas markets. Sipping on mulled wine and daring each other to shoot for prizes. Eventually, we got cold. So, wandered into the end of the world to warm up over a whiskey before heading to the tour. So, what is this ghost thing? I didn't know you believed in ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts. I laughed at him. 
but it's a fun way to experience the history. They bring it to life a little bit more than some of the normal walking tours. And they take you underground to see the old city, which is pretty cool. To be honest, the scariest part is facing the ghosts of my own poor decisions right next to all the historical sites. But that can be a parallel tour in the meantime. He looked around at the walls of the pub, sipping his Lafroy. It is a historical city. I mean, not so different from many places in Europe, but it has a certain... It's very gothic. Yes, the architecture is very striking. I smile. To be honest, I don't believe in ghosts. But you start to get the feeling that if they do exist, there would be the place. Well, I don't know about that, but maybe your tour will change my mind. Drowning our whiskeys, I hastily rolled a cigarette and we headed back out into the bitter wind. Meeting our tour guide along Giles Girk. As the actors usually did, he dressed the part, a long black trench coat, dancing around heavy studded boots, red beard tied with a cord, and a look of mischief in his eyes. Welcome to Scotland, he began. Leading us around the back of the church, he pointed before us. In medieval times, this Kirk was the only one in Edinburgh, due to religious practices at the time. All those who died had to be buried on consecrated ground. And back then, this was uh, a relatively frequent occurrence. There was the Black Death, of course, not to mention the cholera, tuberculosis, smoke, crime, wooden buildings catching on fire, people drowning in sewage. It wasn't so common to leave your home one evening and never return. As you can imagine, after a while they started to run out of space. Nowadays, of course, it's all been paved over to make a car park for the lawyer's office just there. You know what they say about lawyers and souls. We went down the Royal Mile, him pointing out the winding, narrow alleyways and describing how the tall buildings would have been taller, half wooden, and prone to fire. That sewage had run in the streets downhill on both sides although only legally to be tossed from the windows after 10 p.m. That the mile length of the city was enclosed by a thick wall of stone, which one needed to pay a toll to get in or out of, and so the city had simply grown up and up and up. Life would have been dwelt in the growing shadows of ever higher buildings, the skyscrapers of the era, in smoke, and the sounds of madness and revelry echoing on stone. Here, death walked hand in hand with life and often shared a drink or two. We paused between two right-hand turns, one broad road leading flat across a bridge to the rest of the old town, the other a narrow winding path dipping sharply downwards to the valley below. In case you haven't noticed, Edinburgh is built on a hill which was fairly convenient, for the most part. All the waste drained downwards. However, the road below us used to be the market entry to the city, and all the wealthy merchants didn't like wading through the muck, so they had the brilliant idea to build a bridge over it. He pointed to the wide road lined with gleaming shops to one side, then began to lead us down the winding alleyway on the other. They convinced the merchants, workshop owners, nobility and the like to fund the building of the bridge and in exchange they would be able to live in houses on top of it and run their businesses from the rooms inside he stopped at a black wooden door set in the high stone wall of the solid bridge to our right hidden in shadow these are what we call the vaults by this point we were most excited to get inside to escape the cold the temperature rarely dropped below zero Celsius here, but the wind carried a bitter chill not held entirely at bay by our drams from earlier. What would bring the ghosts here, you may ask? He smiled. Come inside and I'll show you. We barely spared a second glance for the outside world before plunging into the black cave in the side of the city. Our guide switched a flashlight on beneath his chin. 
waving us into a circle around him. Well, the merchants and the like were all thrilled by this idea. After all, real estate was scarce in those days. The reality proved to be underwhelming. He pointed the flashlight upward, and the stone arches not far above us. Tendrils of some sort of ossification trailed down towards us like stone cobwebs. What they failed to take into consideration was that, well, this being Scotland, it rains. The bridge was hardly waterproof, and very quickly the mortar between the stones began to melt, making those strange mineral formations you see up there. The damp crept in, and the legitimate businesses fled, leaving room for the less reputable. Eventually, the city had to fill in these caverns to reduce the body smuggling, deaths, disappearances, nefarious characters, etc. It's only in the last 50 years or so we have begun to re-excavate these tunnels and found the remains of it all. Not just the bodies, of course. Although some of those, too. He led us from room to room, downstairs and through pitch black hallways winding between rock and rubble. A few standard jokes, some tales of nefarious ghost sightings. And here's where people often felt a chill. Ooh. And the reassurance that no, no one would be jumping out at us. Because it wasn't terribly COVID safe and also the tour company had realized it saved them money. Sighs of relief all around. The claustrophobia was a bit stifling and I found myself having to take some deep breaths to calm down. I looked over at Nils to make sure he was doing all right. A smirk drifted on his face, and his arms were crossed as he looked skeptically at the tour guide. I made my way to stand next to him. Believe in ghosts yet? I teased, whisper muted by the shuffling of the group. Wait, I think I felt a chill just then. Uh, we're underground and it's freezing. He laughed as we moved to the next room. Before we had left the narrow corridor, however, the tour guide paused. In the flashlight cast upward towards the features, I could almost make out a calculating look, like he was deciding whether to let us in on a secret. I've told you of many ghosts who dwell in this place, but there are some we don't know about. As we excavate more, we find new things, some more macabre than others. We just opened up a new level. Don't worry. It's been cleared out of all the gross stuff. Normally, we can't go in, but they're opening it for the tour in a few weeks anyway. And it's the last tour of the evening, so perhaps tonight we'll have a preview. And with that, he swung open a near-invisible door to our left and guided us down a downward sloping floor for some meters before coming to a stop at a steep drop. The tip of a ladder peeking up over the edge. I wouldn't make anyone come down this way if they don't like, but you look like a fairly adventurous crew. Shall we? I looked at Nils, who was starting to seem excited. Thoughts? Who doesn't like a sneak preview? Similar muttered conversations were going on around us. There were maybe eight people altogether including our guide, and quickly a consensus was reached. And so, one by one, stifling our inhibitions for the sake of novelty, we followed him down into the darkness. The room we entered was clearly less trafficked than the one above us. There was more rubble, few tools scattered about, and a slightly putrid edge to the otherwise normal musty odor of old stone buildings. He led us between the piles, pointing out tanning equipment discovered here and cow skull found there and piles of rat remains here. We don't know why so many tangled together at the tail. Despite being so far underground, the air down here seemed to move. Not like a fresh breeze from outside, but a restless shifting of stale oxygen. I felt a rush of anxiety partnered by a sweaty flush over my skin and realized the drop of nicotine withdrawal was starting to kick in. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. How long have we been down here for anyway? 
So, wrapped up in the hankering of my next fix, I didn't notice the sounds of the group slowly changing, as though we were underwater. Looking around, I realized the light of the torch was drawing farther away, flickering yellow as they turned a corner. I gasped for air that now seemed scarce and stumbled towards them in the dark, reaching out a desperate hand as my foot caught on a jagged piece of stone and felt myself falling. My fingers brushed fabric, and when there were more hazy moments before I could hear the whispered voices of concern around me, felt hands lifting me up and was helped forward. Nils? I mumbled. Who's Nils? Tall, Belgian guy? I came on the tour with him. There is no Nils. You came here alone. A chill crept up my spine. I felt something brush against my cheek and gasped at its coldness, like black ice. Squinting in the hazy, flickering light, I couldn't make out the faces, but they seemed to be familiar. Someone took my hand and led me forward. What happened to the lights? I can't see. The last light. Now you see it. A stale gust of wind blew past my face, a low, drawn-out groan accompanying it. Now you don't. The lights went out, and the dark was filled with screaming. It took them three days to find me, apparently, wandering beneath the city. One of the other people in the tour happened to notice I was missing. No one could remember the tour guide's name, and he was seemingly nowhere to be found. And no one remembered Nils. I swore up and down that he must also be trapped inside the tunnels, offered our ticket receipts as proof, showed them his bag of things still in my living room. I didn't understand the look in their eyes until I realized they weren't sure if I was crazy, but every time I opened my phone to show them, a blinding headache would obscure my vision and I'd need to lay down. These scenes are fading. They come and go like a dream, sometimes in hyper-realistic color, sometimes fuzzy and faded like the old cotton of curtains in forgotten windows. Sometimes I wonder if they even found me, or if I'm still beneath the city wandering alone in the dark. Every time I close my eyes, I hear the whispers. Sometimes when I lay with my mind drifting, I feel the cold touch of black ice raise goosebumps on my sides. There are moments if I stare too long at someone's face, the shadows on it will begin to move, stretching, reaching until their eyes disappear into darkening sockets, teeth stretching into vengeful grins. Now you see it. I will jolt back to reality, the voice echoing in my mind. No, you don't. Please help. I don't know if I'm even writing this, or if I'm imagining it. Today I woke up in the dark, laying on cold stone with dirt beneath my fingernails. And it was only the tolling of a church bell which seemed to bring in sunlight. I am always out wandering the city's paths, but no one seems to notice me. Not since I've been found. I've seen no one I know. Heard no familiar voices. Or are they all familiar? I am lost, I think. I don't remember going to sleep, and I don't remember when was the last time I was touched by anything but icy fingers in the dark. And everywhere I go is shadow, and the sounds of madness and revelry echoing, echoing off the stone until it fills my mind and I cannot help but join in. What's happening to me? What triggers the extraordinary? What are the ingredients for it to strike at a specific moment or place? What are the requirements for it to strike in someone's life? These are only three among the many questions I ask myself every day while remaining unable to answer to at least one. Perhaps you will help me after you read my story, a decisive, extraordinary event. 
My name is Stephanie V. The story you are reading happened eight years ago in December of 2013. I was still living with my mother back then and managed to secure a position as a rookie 911 dispatcher. Only a few weeks after I started, on that particular day, I arrived at work and started my 12 hours shift at exactly 8 a.m. It was one of those days I like to call tsunami days because it starts so soft and smooth before hell is suddenly let loose and total chaos just ravages everything. I received a amount of calls until it was 7.46 p.m. This will be the last, I thought, unaware of how significant the memorable that call and that day overall would be. 911, what is your emergency? I said, I've been stabbed. I'm bleeding. The lady painfully said on the other line, I shivered at the quick realization that the situation was highly tense and it was my first time handling that type of emergency. What position are you in? Are you sitting or lying down? I instinctively questioned. Lying down on the floor. She answered. All right, madam. Can you apply pressure on... I'm all ready, she said. Okay, all right, madam. I would like you to calm down and tell me where exactly you are. I said, not knowing at that moment if I was handling the situation the right way. In an alley between Davis and Colbert Street. I'm dying. She replied with a voice that sounded very familiar to me. You'll not, madam. Help is on the way. We know exactly where you are. I said hoping it would give her hope and enough strength to fight for her life. I understood we were both in the same town. The alley she mentioned is not so far from where I stayed. And my mother and I often took it to go and come back from work. What is your name? I asked. After dispatching the police and an ambulance to the location, at that point, I started shaking because I was very afraid to hear her die before even being rescued. Please, can you please send help at my place? The farmer, I think he knows my address and went to my house. He's gonna kill my mom, the lady revealed. Things were getting worse. I could not just ignore that specific detail because she could be very right. I guess that she referred to her aggressor as the farmer, but I wondered why. What is your address? I asked, ready to do the needful to prevent another attack. 136 Swift Lane Street, she replied. I remained silent for seconds, just hearing her breathing after she just mentioned my address. I looked at the caller number and my heart almost exploded when I recognized my own cell phone number displayed on the screen. I took out my phone and of course there was no ongoing call or any specific activity. No, this had to be some traditional sick joke engineered by my colleagues to terrorize the new hires for sure or serious system bug, I thought. Are you there? The lady asked, now crying. Yes, sweetie, I'm here, I said after collecting myself. Are you sure 136 Swift Lane Street is the correct address? Yes, it's almost nine and my mom's already back for work. If the farmer gets there, he will stab her with the sickle, like he did to me. She revealed. It was almost 8 p.m., not 9 p.m. I put it on the shock and her situation, maybe. I tried to find any way that could help me clear the air concerning the address to send help at the appropriate location. A few seconds later, I thought that identifying her mother and directly contacting her would further help to get her to safety. What is your mom's name? I asked, hoping that she has her records in our system somehow. 
My only V, she said, mentioning my own mother's name. Look, if this is some kind of joke, it's really not funny, okay? What? She asked, surprised. What's your name? I questioned, upset and ready to put an end to this joke. My name? She answered back, filling my veins with ice and my heart with fear at the realization that her voice sounded very familiar simply because I was listening to my own voice in a dire situation, but I could not bring myself to just believe it. I had to hear it. I'm Steph. Oh no. Oh no. He's coming back. He's going to kill me. No, no, no. Please, no. Several chop sounds followed. Again and again. Sounds of flesh hit with an object. The gurgling sounds of her mouth filled with her blood were enough to make me jump. Remove my headset and walk backwards. I stared at my desk, hyperventilating trying to piece together how I just heard myself die. All my colleagues helped me calm down. I explained everything to them. However, I did not want to hear anything coming from them as I was certain that they had a hand in the matter. They all denied. Some suggested hackers. Others did not shy away from mentioning the supernatural. I called my mother and asked her to come fetch me right after the end of her service in a supermarket. When she arrived, we also discussed what just happened and while well, she comforted me, it was reported to us that I had dispatched the police and an ambulance to a place where there was no trace of violence or murder, as if what I heard never existed. My number was indeed displayed as the caller number, but... In my own cell phone call logs, there was no trace of a 911 call, further making the whole incident dubious and strange. To top it all, for some reason, no record of the call was available. My supervisor said that investigation would follow, and I was given a three-day rest that did not really sit well with me. Some of them suspected me. I was very aware of that. However, I know that I did not invent it at all. It really happened. I sat at the back and right side of my mom's car ready to be taken home. I had finished my shift anyway. Cars, festive decorations, lights, and the sky were among the few things I contemplated on my way to home. Oh my, my mother said unable to finish her exclamation. I looked at my mother while she looked at something on her left. I moved from the right side to the left side of the car to see what prompted her reaction, only to be introduced to a pure vision of horror. There he was, standing in the alley between Davis and Colbert streets. A black jacket on top of a grayish bib overall and a red shirt. He stared right back at us with his sickle in his left hand, his feet somehow deep in the snow. His face pale under his black hat that made his eyes glow in the dark like those of a cat. We looked at him as my mother completely forgot about the road until he was completely out of view. She decided to take me to my aunt and call the police on the way. She avoided describing him exactly like he was to avoid being ridiculed and taken lightly and just said that there was someone very suspicious in the neighborhood. Needless to say, they did not see him or anyone suspicious. But we know who we saw. He was the farmer himself. That was how I knew that I was not crazy. There was indeed a psycho walking around in a farmer's attire, with the intent to stab and slash people with a sickle during the festive period. However, I could not explain how or why future victim Stephanie called actual Stephanie to initiate the events that would later save my life. Hence, all my questions at the beginning of this story, and of course, all investigations did not lead anywhere. After we saw him that night, my mother and I struggled to find peace and sleep for days. We moved weeks later for our mental state. 
Fortunately, we never saw him again, and I have never experienced something as extraordinary as that call up to now. And I still work at the same place. Somewhere in my heart, I still feel the dread born from the possibility that the farmer could be watching me from afar. Waiting for the right moment to strike. I'm thinking some of you might not know what the woods in Louisiana are like, so let me help you. Take a normal, perfectly good, pleasant forest, add a little bit of poison ivy, a hell of a lot of boars and deer, and then as much mud as you can imagine. I'm talking metric fucking tons of the stuff. Every trail, every foot, everywhere. If you want to avoid pure foot blistering hell and the realm of all things mosquito, Wait for a two-week dry spell, and then try hiking. The mud will be gone and the mosquitoes won't be bad until dusk. But otherwise, wear jeans, wear a t-shirt, and suffer. And here's another little fun fact. It loves to rain. It loves to flood, too. So much, in fact, that our 57-acre property has a ramshackle levee that borders a stream to the north of our house. You normally couldn't drown it in if you tried, but the little shit gets higher than a stoner every time the sky gets so much as dribbles on us. You might be thinking that I don't like the rain, and you'd be right, for a good reason, trust me. Let's get to that in a second. So this levee, right? 70 years old, as best as we can tell. Already here whenever we bought the property, and it keeps us high and dry. Without it, we'd basically have the vague outline roof of a house surrounded by an impromptu lake, followed by whatever piss-poor fish that actually live in the stream. As best as we can tell, there's a larger brook further up north than this creek branches off of. But it's just a small runoff route, thanks to a log jam. Except for when it rains and the water bursts right past the jam, and damn near drowns my house. But it doesn't. Thanks to one of the only useful pieces of redneck engineering to ever exist. Our little rinky-dink ass levy. Since my family's in the business of not choking on swamp water every time it rains, we check the levy after every bad storm. They come once, twice a month, or something like that. Sometimes back to back, sometimes once a year. Doesn't really matter. What does matter is that I'm one who gets sent out into the muddy hellscape that is our woods trail to check the damned bank whenever a storm passes. It's pretty much a routine at this point, but things get a bit weird sometimes. The woods have a lot of crazy shit in them. Old sheds and clearings no one's ever used. Car seats miles away from the nearest major road and hundreds of feet off the trail. Random piles of sheet metal and tire rims. Y'all get it. But every now and then, something new turns up, or gets uncovered, whatever you'd like to call it. Sometimes it's just an old water well that was covered up and it turns the concrete plug of whatever was ceiling had just finally given out. And other times it's the remains of some poor family's stray trampoline. But last time was different. That's why I'm writing this. Consider this whole post a warning to anyone who likes poking around rural properties. Stay away from any drainage or runoff systems. Flash floods are real after a rain, and sure as hell real enough to bulldoze you into the nearest tree. But more specifically, avoid the levees. If you have to check them, wait until the mud dries up to look over them. Until the sun beats down and the woods are as bright as can be. Don't wait till it's late. And the sun has a chance of setting. And don't fucking do it alone. Don't trust the levees. Last time I went out, it was creepy and quiet, which is pretty much the norm of the woods. You start to hear the bugs and the birds as time goes on, but they seemed a little slower to get revved up after this rain. Nothing to worry about. It was just a couple fallen trees, I thought. Unlucky, but expected. 
water turns the dirt into mud, and the wind takes care of the rest, but usually the things are already half rotten and blow down during the worst of it. Which is why it was a little more concerning when I saw one fall down right in front of me. Contrary to popular belief, trees that have leaves and branches fall awfully slow. If you aren't right next to the base, so I had plenty of time to get clear, but it didn't bode well for me. I couldn't even imagine the last time a storm had been bad enough to knock down hardwoods like that, or the last time I had checked to see if our chainsaw worked. But it was work for another day, one less muggy and miserable, for damn sure. That was closer to the entrance of the tail leading to the levee, so I forgot about it pretty quickly after a few minutes of walking. You focus more on trying to find solid ground so you don't have to spend a few minutes pulling your feet out of a mud hole. Or two. Or ten. And then, there were the deer rubs. They're patches on younger saplings that backs rub the bark off of. Sort of as a claim to the land. Or maybe because their antlers itch. Hell if I know. My paw was the hunter. You might see one every now and then, but... Well, everything looked dead. Or dying. Deers wander in herds, sure, and you might see quite a few bucks around in hunting season. It was that time of the year, but... But it was like every male deer in a 50 mile radius had saw fit to scrape every inch of bark off of every tree they could reach. There were even a few broken nubs on the ground with blood like they had rammed the older oaks, or fought each other. There was another weird thing. It wasn't even just the saplings. It was the pines and the water oaks and whatever else too, with the ground stamped to hell and back. If any hunters know anything about this, or hell, any arborists either, let me know. I'm just guessing at what happened, but there were tracks leading every which way, and the trees were more naked than... Well, I'm running out of metaphors anyway. You get the gist. Exaggeration only goes so far. I'll cut to the chase. Shit got weird. Fast. It was supposed to be a 30 minute walk after that. It was a bend in the trail I took every trip, and I knew the way by heart. But I walked for at least a couple of hours, just plodding through the mud and swatting away the bugs. The trail never ended, and the sky never got dark. I even started marking trees to see if I was going crazy, but I never passed the same tree twice. The sky was starting to get dark. I had put the walk off until after an early supper, but I kept going. There wasn't much else to do since I had no idea where the hell I was and I didn't have another two hours to spend doing the same way back. I figured I'd run into the levee eventually. It ran across the entire northern property line, a few hundred feet before our land actually ended, and I couldn't orient myself then, and cut back across the property properly. But I never did. Another 30 minutes later, with me trying not to piss myself at every sound I was hearing in the trees. The trunks around me started to look different, blacker, darker than they should have been, even giving the setting sun. Diseased, almost. Like they had rot, but the air smelled fine, still like it does after a rainstorm. I'd like to say I was a cool, calm, and collected son of a bitch, but I wasn't. I kept throwing glances over my shoulder and up at the sky and glancing at my phone occasionally. It was telling me it was 4.30. That gave me a little bit of a pause. It got dark around 5.30 or 5.40 at this time of year, and I must have left the house at 4. Given that I ate supper and had to wash the dishes afterwards, but I was more worried about getting out than my phone bugging out, so I kept going. Running, even. That's when I heard it. It was a low rumble at first, like an earthquake or a train, but it just kept getting louder and louder growing from behind me. When I turned around, I was facing directly down the length of the levee, the side to my left sloping away at a steep slant, 
the right just a mud plain going on for miles and just around a bend about a mile down the glorified ditch i could see something getting closer here i think my words are going to fail me maybe my fingers too with the way they're shaking right now Imagine staring down at a speeding train with your feet glued to the tracks or a bull charging you while your shoelaces are tied together or something big and watery and beady eyed tearing down a concrete and mud trench that hurts to look at in a way you can't comprehend stretching from right in front of you to the rightmost edge of the horizon. Yeah, it was mostly that last one, but I can't do it justice. It felt... evil. I don't say this lightly. I grew up vaguely Christian, and if there was one thing Pa taught me, it's that evil is real and rare. It was his reason for being religious. He said he had stared down true evil in this world and could only cope by believing in true good. And that's the feeling that hit me. True evil, rolling off the damned thing like an oily smoke. It looked like a hunk of flotsam one moment, riding on a giant wave, and in another it was something long and muddy, with pincers and black eyes, like a crawfish ready to bite back. My feet were moving before I wanted them to, already bringing me towards the edge of the levee. It was impossible to climb up the thing normally, but one of the dark trees had branches of ivy trailing down its trunk, and one of these vines had continued on down the side of the levee. The other direction wasn't even a choice. There'd be no running in that, just tripping and slipping in the gunk. I don't know how fast that beast was going, but it covered the mile between us in less than a minute. I was barely on the bank when it blew past sucking the air along with it and nearly sending me tumbling back down the dip it stunk like death where it had passed not sickly sweet but rancid and rotting like seafood baking under the sun for a week it's hard to say what happened after that i didn't stick around to find out if that thing could scale the banks of the levee if it had flood over like a rising tide and continue on its merry way i just sprinted for how long I was running and stumbling and cussing, I can't tell you, but eventually my foot snagged on something good and sent me tumbling down to the ground. I thought it was the pincer branch of the thing that nearly got me earlier back to finish the job, but it was just a pile of sticks. Or rather, it was a pile of sticks now. It was hard to tell in the gloom, but it had definitely been something deliberately made before I smashed it. There were two halves of a square twig base, crudely tied together with a wooden figure of something laying on the ground next to me that must have been on some sort of platform. Or altar. Now, I don't know what you know about Cajun culture, but there's something called voodoo that we joke about. Black magic is what we mean, really. And I know that this probably wasn't real voodoo. That it was something else. By a more prim and proper name, but there's some superstitions, some hates that you can't just throw off. Voodoo was the first thing that popped into my head, and fake enough when we were joking around, but less so when you're staring at a witch's doll. And then I crushed the damn thing beneath my heel as soon as I got up. Some things just feel right, and I didn't have any tinder with me to give the figure the proper scorching it deserved. After that, a relatively uneventful trip back to my house. It must have only taken 15 minutes to make it home, and the sky had been lightened a bit once I was out of the trees. Even after I had stopped running after my fall, when the black beast didn't come after me when I crushed the figurine, the talisman, whatever it was. I'm inside right now, in front of the fire I've built, I don't feel like being in the dark at the moment, and the heat helps me relax. But I can't help but wonder. The woods were never like that before. The levee never bordered a mud flat like that. It should have been more woods. Calmer woods. Something was different. Or rather, 
something had changed it. My mind keeps going to that talisman or idol and witches and black magic. Tales about things lurking in the swamps and the bayous. Bedtime stories I wasn't supposed to hear as a kid. And I'm starting to wonder if me and my family are the only ones living on this land. One thing is for damn certain, though. I'm not checking the fucking levy next time. It's an open secret in our small village. My great-grandfather Nicholas was not buried under the tombstone bearing his name in the local graveyard. His last wish was for his remains to be lowered in a hole in front of his house and an olive tree planted above. The tree is the first thing I see every morning when I open the front door, and I have to watch it carefully. I'm in my late fifties now and I live alone. My name is not important, and the name of the village is better left on Sen. Once something takes root in people's imagination, it never lets go. It just keeps growing and adapting with each generation. Over the years, whispers have turned into scary stories used by parents to frighten children into obedience. When I was a young girl, I even overheard some of the other kids sharing these tales. Some say old Nico grabbed did the devil himself to the olive tree before he died. And if an unassuming wanderer rests his hand on the trunk, he will be absorbed and become one of its gnarly branches. More recent tales involve a UFO that landed where the tree is now, and entities that shared their alien knowledge with my great-grandpa in return for something. There is a grain of truth in every story, I guess. But here is what I know to be true. The tree does not want anyone who's not a member of this family to come near. If you're with me, you'll be fine. But if I'm not there, I can't guarantee your safety. Best case scenario, you'll get really sick. Worst case, well, you'll see soon enough. The fence surrounding my property is tall for that reason. There is a sign in front of the olive that warns, Do not come near the tree. For extra precaution, my later father wrapped barbed wire around the trunk of the olive to discourage anyone foolish enough to climb it. I don't have dogs to guard my property. The poor animals would last only a few days before going crazy and then die or disappear. Birds avoid the olive tree and never land on its branches. About three weeks ago, on a cold and cloudy November day, I was returning home from work and it was just starting to get dark. Before I got in the house, I spotted something orange beneath the olive tree. It was a jacked caught in the barbed wire. A chill went through my spine. Next to the jacket, on the ground, there was a small digital camera mounted on a stick. It was still recording. I will describe the content of the footage here as best I can. 12.04 p.m. You recording? Okay. Hi folks, Johnny here. You loved our narration of the creepypasta Old Nico's Tree, and today we are doing something special. Said the boy standing by the tall wire fence. My house and Olive included in the shop behind him. Johnny? Wore a skull mask with horns. The image suddenly dropped and there was a loud thud as the recording device hit the ground. Malik, watch it. My dad's gonna kill me if we break his camera, said Johnny. The other boy picked up the camera and for a split second, I saw the sleeve of his jacket. It was orange. Sorry, dude. Alright, go on, said Malik. Oh, and tell them to like and subscribe. People actually hate that shit, you know. Johnny objected, but he said it anyway. Here behind me, you can see the actual tree that the story is based on. We are going to go closer in a second and show you the tree, but first, we are going to see if anyone's home. They walked along the fence and came to the gate. To my surprise, it was open. I never forget to close and lock it. Or 
So I think when you do the same thing mechanically every day, you start to question yourself if you really didn't. Oftentimes, I don't even remember driving to work. Inaudible, quite remote. We had to walk like two hours from the bus stop. Thanks to commenter D's Nuts 6969 for telling us the location. Alright, you can pause until we ask the owner for permission. Johnny said and took off the mask. He looked about 18. 12.21 p.m. No one's answering the door, but the gate was open and Malik said he saw something walk behind the house. Right, Malik? Said Johnny. Right. Just as we walked through the gate, I think I saw someone with long gray hair go behind that corner. I'm not sure. As I said earlier, I live alone and I was at work at the time. I do have long gray and curly hair though. So it was a bit strange that the boy said that. There is nothing behind that corner other than some stacked firewood as the footage showed a second later. I think we'll just film the tree really quick and go home. Johnny said. The footage was a bit jumpy as they walked to the tree. They stopped to film the sign. Whoa, warning. Do not come near the tree. And look at the trunk, dude. Zoom in on that rusted barbed wire. Spooky stuff. Who knew that an olive could look this evil? Alright, go stand in front of the tree and say a few words. And then we're off. Said Malik. Wait, the sign says not to. Pfft. You really believe that shit? As John walked to the tree, I noticed something stir in the branches above. I had to replay that moment a few times just to be sure. For a fleeting second, a dark shape like a shadow moved from one branch to the other and vanished from view. I don't think the boys noticed it since they didn't say a word. This tree right here behind me is old Nico's olive, said Johnny. Masked up and looking at the camera, he was burnt. Did you hear that? Johnny's eyes went wide and he froze for a moment. The camera's microphone barely caught the sound. A faint clicking noise. What was that? He gasped. I don't hear anything, said Malik. Johnny looked to the branches above, jerking his head left and right as if trying to follow something that moved rapidly. What? Shh, Johnny's son. Malik pointed to the camera and to the branches. The leaves moved to the slight breeze. All was silent. There's nothing. What did you see? He asked. Give me the camera. Johnny whispered. 12.44 p.m. Johnny went around the tree a few times filming the branches. Finally, he pointed the camera at his friend. Malik looked a head shorter than Johnny and wore glasses. What's the matter? What did you see? Asked Malik. I don't know. I didn't really see. I sensed something. Johnny said slowly. His voice lowered to almost a whisper. I kind of think it was too fast to be seen or filmed if that makes any sense. It absolutely doesn't. Now stop trying to scare me and give me that camera. There. Johnny jumped. Do you feel that? He pointed the camera at the tree and moved slowly upwards to the gray sky. The clicking sounds had returned. No. What? Said Malik. It's clearer now somehow. I... I can almost make sense of what it's saying. Johnny said. Who? Just stop it, Johnny. There's nothing here. Hold this. I need to get closer. The camera changed hands. Johnny took off the mask and touched the tree carefully, avoiding the barbed wire, and placed his hands and feet in the holes of its gnarly trunk. He started climbing. What are you doing, dude? Get down! Malik shouted. Look, just trust me. I can hear it. The tree is speaking. This is stupid. We're cutting this out. Malik said. I'm not losing subscribers because of your bad acting. Johnny was silent and continued to climb carefully. He crouched in the branches and, after a few moments, started nodding. 1.20pm. 
Are you still filming? Asked Johnny. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what I've learned now because... Because for some reason, I think I'll forget it the moment I'm back on the ground. Johnny frowned looking down. Oh, for fuck's sake, Johnny. This is getting weird. Malik's son. Just shut up and let me talk, okay? Johnny hissed. The mask fell out of his jacket pocket. He paused as if collecting his thoughts and continued calmly. His name was Nicholas. He was an only child. His parents were simple farmers. Nico's life was hard before the war. The war had dragged him to remote corners of Europe, and he returned home a changed man with a dusty tombs of books under his arm. Wait, said Malik. I said don't interrupt me. But, but that's not how the story goes. Johnny looked quietly at his friend for a moment and continued. Nico refused to tell exactly where he found the books and did not let anyone near them. To his wife's displeasure, he started spending money on more books, mainly Arabic and Greek dictionaries. He learned a great many things. One of them was grafting and he was sought after in the village because of it. Nico had three sons. Two of them died young and he swore he was going to do anything he can to protect the rest of his family. Years passed, and when old Nico saw that death was just around the corner waiting for him, he gave his son instructions on what to do after he's gone. Johnny pointed to the ground. The son buried him here, and planted a young olive tree that his father had specially prepared for that occasion. Nico didn't want anyone peering in his books, so he took them to his grave. A funeral was also organized at the local graveyard where an empty coffin was lowered in the ground, as Nico did not want to anger the church, nor did he want the villagers to know. I was shocked at hearing that because it was word for word. The story that my late parents told me. How do you know all that? Said Malik. Are you pulling this out of your ass? Even if the dude really is buried here, so what? What's so special? Don't you see? Johnny's son. It's for protection. Whatever black magic fuckery old Nico did here was to protect his family after his death. When someone comes near the tree in the house without the approval of his descendants, it triggers some kind of defense mechanism. What do you mean? Said Malik, his voice quivering a bit. It means we're fucked, buddy. Johnny laughed nervously. Let's just go home, dude. Malik said. This is our home now, replied Johnny. There was a loud metallic bang and the footage jumped. I recognized the sound of my gate closing shut. The camera spun around, but there was no one else to be seen on the property. You need to get up here quick. It's not safe down there, said Johnny. What the fuck are you talking? The clicking sounds again. But now they were loud enough to drown his words. Any other sound on the footage? They clicked faster and faster, and they were getting closer. Malik dropped the camera and let it fall on the grass face down, so the rest of the video is just a black screen with audio. There was a loud tearing sound, which was... I presume Malik's jacket getting caught on the barbed wire. Take it off, quick, get up. Johnny shouted. After a few moments, all was deadly quiet. Oh God, what do we do now? Malik said, his voice quivering. Johnny, my phone's dead. Yours? Same. Do you see them? Yeah. What do they look like? Almost human. Johnny said quietly, and it was difficult to hear everything he said. They serve. Malik replied something, but the conversation had lowered to a whisper, and I could not make out anything. 3.11 p.m. A groan pierced the long silence. Johnny, what's wrong? I can't lift my legs. R what? My shoes are like glued to the branch. Dude, look, the bark. It, it grew around. 
It's holding your shoe. I'll just take the shoes off. How are you so calm about this? 3.40 p.m. There was whispering, but again, I couldn't make out anything. Johnny, who are you talking to? Malik said. Johnny, hey, look at me. What are you saying? I don't understand. Wait, let me get closer. 3.50 p.m. What? Why are you looking at me like that? Malik said. And why are you smiling? He screamed. Johnny, no. Get off me. I heard a loud thud and the sound of clicking began again, drowning everything else. 5.13 p.m. There was silence until I got home. I could hear the sound of my car's engine and the door slamming shut when I got out. But I also heard something else. A distant whisper of voices speaking in unison. She's home. Click. She's safe. Click. We sleep now. I went outside in the dark. Rain drizzled. All was silent and nothing stirred around the old olive. I needed to get some firewood and I jumped as I saw what waited for me around the corner. Johnny's mask lay on top of the chopped pile of wood grinning at me. Tears went down my cheeks as I thought about the boys who could have been saved if I was home that day. If I knew that, someone would come. This was the first major incident in my time that I know of. I've heard tales from my parents about the things that happened here before, but I've never witnessed it until now. I won't allow this to happen to anyone again. The next day I installed security cameras and an alarm that would warn me if someone is on my property. The cameras are set up to record only motion, but on some days they are just recording non-stop. Even though nothing moves on the footage, I guess early retirement it is. You probably heard the saying, A society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they shall never sit. They don't mention what other things may sit and wait in the shade with us. Things I have to live with. Hey, I'm writing this out of desperation and fear. If you read what I'm about to tell you, please pray for me. I need this more than ever. I won't give specific details about me, as I don't consider them important. I never wanted to go through any of this. If I knew what was happening here, I would have surely moved away a long time ago. It all started last week when a thick fog came into the town, engulfing everything in its cold grasp. At first, I didn't give it much thought. It could just be a natural occurrence, and that's it, I thought. As the days passed, things started to get out of hand. The phone signal just disappeared, and when I turned the radio on, I just heard static. My neighbors suddenly started to act weird, knocking on their walls and screaming late at night. Oh god, those screams. Those screams weren't human. I was too scared to investigate, and instead barricaded myself inside my home. Some days later, after I woke up from the god-awful screams of my neighbors, I noticed something wrong outside. I looked through the window in my room and saw that it was snowing. It can't be. It's the middle of summer. How could there be snow outside? Just as I was trying to grasp the absurdity of whatever was happening, I noticed a fire growing in size. The town's church, located in the other side of the street where my home is, has been set on fire. In the distance, I could hear a loud siren followed by static voices, chanting some sort of incantation. The sounds were so loud I could feel my eardrums shattering, and I quickly lost consciousness. Suddenly, I woke up alone, on an empty and cold valley engulfed in the same fog that came into my town. As I looked around, I saw a woman dressed in a white dress, with black and long hair blowing in the wind. 
She slowly walked to me as a corpse dragging its feet. As I caught a better glimpse of her face, I quickly noticed her eyes, bloodshot and full of sorrow. Hello? I uttered. There came no answer. She just stood in front of me, frozen in time. Suddenly, she started shaking and turning into something horrifying. I could hear the bones in her arms breaking as they got longer and longer, with razor-sharp claws at the end. The same happened with her legs, and now, the pale, dark-haired woman, which was sitting in front of me, became unrecognizable. Her jaws protruded forwards, and empty, dark sockets replaced her eyes. I was so terrified I couldn't even move, or scream. She stood up and growled in the most dreadful way imaginable. I could feel losing my consciousness again, and I just passed out in the frigid grass. When I woke up, I had a terrible headache, followed by blurred vision. As I started to regain lucidity, I quickly observed my surroundings. I was located in the reception room of the town's hospital. The place was desolate. It looked like the people inside have moved to leave as quickly as possible, as there was a mess everywhere I looked. As I started to look for clues to find out what was going on, I found a note left on the reception table. I could feel the blood run cold in my veins after I picked it up. To whoever reads this note, you are not alone in here. There are creatures roaming the hallways, hungry for human flesh. If you want to have a chance at getting out, pay attention. All of the doors leading to the outside are stuck, and they won't even budge. Do not bother trying to break them, as the sound will attract the attention of the creatures in the dark. Instead, follow the path I've marked on the back of the note. At the end, you will find the way out of this abyss. While traversing the hospital, bear in mind the following rules. 1. The monsters inside are attracted to sound. Be as quiet as you can if you want to stay alive. 2. As long as the lights are working, you should be safe. The creatures are dormant in the light unless you make any sound. 3. If you see the lights flickering, hide as soon as you can. The electricity will turn off, and they will start to hunt you. It won't take long before the lights turn on again, so be patient. 4. Don't try to kill or harm the monsters, as they don't have any weakness you could exploit. 5. If you hear voices chanting some sort of incantation, cover your ears with something and don't pay attention to them, or you will succumb to the madness that the others have fallen into. 6. Don't trust everything you see or hear, as this place will try to deceive you. If you fall for its tricks, you will never get out of this hellish abyss. If you need a flashlight, you will find it in an old drawer in the director's office. Good luck, stranger. For a moment, I couldn't even lift my gaze from the piece of paper. What the hell was that? I decided to follow the rules as I didn't want to take any chances. Whoever has written on it surely knows more about this place than I do. I hastily went to grab the flashlight and quietly headed into the void in front of me. I made sure to follow the path indicated on the back of the note, walking through the seemingly endless hallways of the now desolate hospital, a place of pestilence and suffering. Not long after, I noticed whispers coming from all directions. I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I recognized the tone of an incantation. Slowly, the whispers transitioned into voices as they got louder and louder. I quickly covered my ears with the palms of my hands, trying to block as much noise as I could and continued my journey. After a few minutes, the voices disappeared into thin air, like they never even existed. With each step further, I could feel the atmosphere around me getting heavier and heavier, to the point of being suffocating. Each breath was a struggle. Each step felt like a burden. Deep down, I had the feeling of walking to my doom, and I couldn't do anything about it. 
as I didn't want to spend the rest of my life trapped inside this nightmare. I suddenly saw the lights above me flickering, and I knew I had to hide. I ran to one of the bathrooms, hiding inside a stall. Not long after, the lights stopped working completely, and I heard loud shrieks coming from the hallways. Whatever was out there was out for blood. My blood. I knew these creatures could sense my presence, feeding off my fear and despair. As I stood in the stall, I heard a loud bang at the bathroom door and something came inside. It growled and started searching for me. I thought I was done for. As the creature got closer to my stall, I closed my eyes. If I was to die, I wouldn't want to know what that thing looked like. The creature stopped in front of the stall where I was in, and I leaned back into the wall, holding my breath. My heart started racing as that thing scratched at the door, sniffing around. After a few moments, a loud siren echoed through the hospital. The creature rushed through the bathroom door, and for a moment, I was safe. As I regained my breath, the lights turned on. It was time to go forward. I exited my hideout and went back on the road to salvation. Something was off about these hallways. As I walked further, I felt like time suddenly stopped existing and had the sensation of walking into nothingness. I glanced at the note in order to make sure I was still on the right path and sure enough I was. Then, out of nowhere, I saw a woman sitting in the middle of the hallway. She was sobbing quietly and couldn't resist the urge to check what was going on with her. Finally, another human being besides me. Thought. As I rested my arm on her shoulder, she turned her head around and looked at me. Her eyes were so full of pain, and I could feel we both shared the same despair of being trapped here. Are you alright? I asked. I guess so. I know how to get out of here, but I'm too afraid to go alone. Do you want to accompany me to the exit? I agreed. As we walked together, she pointed her finger at a rusty metal door at the end of the hallway. That's the way out, she said. Just as we got close, the same loud siren from before could be heard outside, followed by the lights flickering. We need to hurry, she whispered. I rushed to the door and grabbed the handle, but it wouldn't move. The lights ran out and I started to kick at the door in an attempt to break the lock. I could hear loud growls throughout the hospital, and loud steps coming towards us. Come on, come on, just open. I couldn't bear the thought of being defeated right at the end. I was so close to getting out of that abyss, I had to find a way to open that door. One of the beasts came rushing towards me, and I pulled out my flashlight, directing the beam towards its skin. The beast screamed in pain and ran away. The woman suddenly came with a dented metal pole in the form of a crowbar, giving it to me. I didn't waste any time in cracking the door open without any hesitation, grabbed the woman's hand as we got out of there. The light coming from outside was so powerful it blinded me, and I recall passing out. As I woke up, I found myself to be inside my home lying in bed. Was it all just a dream? I got up from bed and looked outside. The fog was gone and it wasn't snowing anymore. I thought it was over. I could have never been so wrong in my entire life. It suddenly hit me. The last rule. Don't trust everything that you see or hear, as this place will try to deceive you. If you fall for its tricks, you will never get out of this hellish abyss. I froze in terror. I just broke the last and most important rule. I didn't have time to think about what I just did as the loud siren pierced my ears and I passed out. I woke up in the same hospital as before, but everything was changed. Everywhere I looked, there was blood and human remains. I panicked and started to run through the hallways in order to find an exit from the hell pit I found myself in. I could hear a mix of human screams of death and otherworldly growls coming from each direction. I could get a glimpse of a figure in the corner of my eyes. 
I'm pretty sure that what I saw wasn't human. The thing started to run after me on all fours, hungry for my flesh and shrieking in anticipation. As the ear-shattering screams echoed through the hallways, I felt the putrid smell of rotten flesh in the air. The electricity suddenly stopped moving, and I was left in the dark abyss with whatever was out there. Every school has their little weirdos, no matter what grade. Some more than others, but us weirdos kind of stick together. Back in the fifth grade, my buddy Tim got a lot of shit. Not like the kid dressed weird or anything, but was just a kid that got a target on his back. He was the best at playing swords and stuff, though. We'd be out in the field, flying around in spaceships, or fighting off a mob of samurai. Even then, the kids never messed with me. Only him, for whatever reason. Tim was my boy, and we looked after each other. Most of the kids couldn't understand why I was so nice to him, and I'd always say, Well, I'm nice to you, aren't I? They'd usually scoff and walk away while we snuck in a middle finger before anyone saw us. It was kind of our thing. That year, when the talent show came around, Tim was pretty excited. He has been honing his pretending skills, as he would say. Tim did everything to be good at making things seem real, because that was the only time he was truly happy. His dad was kind of a dick since he was drunk all the time and just wanted his boy to be a real man and watch sports and shit. Guy was a real douche. Anyway, a week before the talent show, Tim came up to me talking about how he figured it out and he couldn't wait to show everyone. I threw it out there that he could show me, but he shook his head with a giant smile on his face. The longest week of my life, but I was itching to see what Tim threw together. It was his turn and he came decked out in black and white. He was a hell of a mime. Granted, I've never seen one beforehand, but I thought he did pretty damn well. Whereas the other kids just laughed. He got pretty far along, but you can tell he started getting discouraged the longer it went on to the point where one of the cool kids ended up throwing something at him. Thankfully, the teacher snatched him up right then and there, but the damage was done. Tim burst into tears and walked off stage. You'd think he'd stay home for a couple days, but his dad just laid into him about being a baby and crying in public. So he made him come right back to school, and the kids just didn't let up. My birthday was coming up, and I thought I had a pretty good plan and set it into motion. I was going to give Tim a second chance and make the class sit and watch. I talked to my mom about it, and we made the invites that day. I passed them out the next day in class, and I told Tim about the plan, just so he wasn't blindsided. He was surprisingly ecstatic about it, and how he's gotten so much better, and how he couldn't wait to try out his new act. The day of the party, everything was going swell, minus the fact that Tim didn't show up. Well, at least I didn't think he was. The kid showed up fashionably late, suited up and ready to go carrying his imaginary bag of props. All the parents were saying how cute it was, and the kids did what they could to hold in their laughter so they wouldn't get scolded in front of everyone, especially when he put his imaginary back down and pulled out an invisible hammer, then went to work seemingly barricading every doorway and window in the living room. I was quite impressed. Tim called me over to help out, and so I did. Didn't think anything of it until he handed me that imaginary hammer, and it had weight to it. At the time, I assumed it was an in-the-moment type thing, and just started hammering away. When all was said and done, he walked me to the corner of our living room, made a box around me and motioned for me to stay still. The parents clapped as he took center stage in front of the TV, and the kids just sat on the floor in front of him. Tim put on a little mime show, you know, not being able to move a water bottle and running into imaginary walls, cute kid stuff. He stopped mid-act to walk back over to me and smiled when slapping his forehead like he forgot something. He then closed my box and pulled out what I assumed was a power drill to make holes in my box. Tim walked back up to the front and tapped that devil child Jacob on the shoulder for assistance. 
Jacob got up laughing like, oh, this stupid kid, and tried to make some fun, but Tim just played it off. Tim took out some imaginary tools and made another box around the kid, then turned around and bowed. Jacob tried to move and started freaking out while everyone applauded the mime as Tim put up a finger to silence the crowd. And that's when shit hit the fan. Jacob was starting to panic like he couldn't breathe or something, and Tim motioned like he forgot the kid was in there. Like saying, oopsie, but without words. Tim pretended to press some buttons on the side of Jacob's box and Jacob started to get smaller. Not like he was shrinking, but like the box was and at that point, he was full-blown panicking. The parents were looking around at each other nervously. But the kids just laughed until they realized Jacob was serious when he started screaming without a sound. The kids started screaming when they saw Jacob's bones had started snapping one after another while the parents were trying to figure out how to open his invisible prison. All while Tim took another bow and he looked over at me and winked with a smile. Not going to lie. I pissed myself right then and there thinking he thought I was a dick for putting him in this situation. Jacob's dad started freaking out and yoked Tim by his collar yelling at him saying, Get him the fuck out of there. Tim spoke no words and just shook his finger in the guy's face. Remember, we're in fifth grade at the time, so Jacob's dad could have beaten him senseless. But Tim had a show to put on. It was like being back at school playing pretend swords in the field where Tim was a lone ronin. That was efficient in the quick draw technique. He never lost a fight, and he wasn't about to now. Tim gripped the invisible sheath at his waist and ripped the imaginary blade diagonally across Jacob's dad's chest. Jacob's dad let go of Tim and flicked the floating blood off his blade before placing it back in his sheath as the guy started spewing blood from his wound. The other parents were too concerned with Jacob himself watching his body get compressed into a pile of bone and viscera, covered in a blanket of skin while his father fell to the ground in two. Tim took another bow, then walked to the center of the room, placing a device on the floor. The rest of the parents trembled in fear, trying to find a way out with their kids. But Tim had already sealed off the exits. Tim pressed something on the device he placed on the floor and left out the front door. The kid didn't even look back. Everyone rushed to the door behind him, but it didn't even matter. The door could have been open and they still wouldn't have been able to get out. They were like animals trapped in a cage, and I was still trapped in a box inside that cage. Everyone started getting pushed into the walls like there were walls closing in from the middle of the room. Some pushed against the invisible walls while others held on to their kids in uncontrollable sobs. I thought we were all screwed, and worst of all, it was all my fault. All my parents wanted to do was hold me one last time before we were all smashed from some invisible walls, but they couldn't even do that because I was trapped in a fucking invisible box. Like balloons, everyone just popped and painted the walls red. Tim had a cutout in the wall the size of the box I was placed in, so all that was left of my parents were their arms that were hugging the front of my prison, and their remains that were squeezed through the air holes. When all was said and done, my parents' blood covered the box, showing there was a doorknob on it that I didn't notice before, or it just wasn't there beforehand. I couldn't tell you, to be honest. I let myself out and held what was left of my parents until my aunt came back from the store and saw the bloodbath before her. Cops came, but it's not like they could get anything out of the kid who wouldn't talk. Not like I could have done all that. So they chalked it up as a wild animal wandering in, making a meal of everyone and leaving a kid mute due to the traumatic experience. They didn't explain the writing in blood, saying, Us weirdos gotta stick together on the front door that they chose to ignore. There's a niche activity that occupies most of my time, and it's risky. 
To many, it would seem unthinkable in its danger, but not to me. Not at first, anyway. I know how much of a mistake I made. The reason I started this in the first place is because while this activity is not technically legal, the cash rewards are incredibly high. Some would consider it murder. I would consider it well-paying. I'm sure if the UN ever found out about it, the activity would be banned, but hey... Even if that happens, I'll still continue doing what I'm doing. I really don't have any other option. There's a good chance that I'll end up dead because of this. Maybe it's inevitable, but still I dread it. Still I fear it. I'm trapped and I don't know how to escape. As for what it is I actually do, it's simple. I changed the flow of time. I make it so that certain people never existed. It's like murder, but with no evidence and no suspects. Apparently, I've killed all sorts. Businessmen, crime bosses, even politicians. But the thing is, I don't remember any of it. Once a person is erased from the flow of time, no one remembers them. They cease to exist. They never exist in. And so, therefore, I don't remember killing them in the first place. A freaky concept. One that probably appears interesting even to those who would never believe in. But not to me. All I want to do is get out, but I can't. I'm trapped, constantly looking over my shoulder, wondering when they'll get me. But I bet some of you are probably thinking, what about the grandfather paradox? Wouldn't it be impossible for me to stop someone from existing if they never existed? Well, my employer found a workaround, a way to cheat the system. Using that cheat has ruined my life. To sum it up, the universe has a natural defense network for paradoxes. A kind of immune system, but on a cosmic scale. Typically, if for whatever reason a paradox would appear naturally, the universe would send antibodies to eliminate that paradox. If that paradox happened to be... a human who shouldn't exist, well, the antibodies would take care of it in a very grim way. Gruesome things, those antibodies. They look kind of like people, but inside out. There's a million different variants. I doubt I'll ever see them all. The fact that I never know what the next one will look like is part of what keeps me up at night. Upon seeing their target, they absorb them alive, making sure every atom of their existence is disbanded in a horrific display of nature's power. The first time I saw it, I threw up. I was so disgusted by what I had seen. I just sat there crying for hours. There was no one to comfort me but my employer. He told me this was just the way of things. Those that are strong devour the weak. Those that are able to win claim victory. He told me that as long as I stayed strong, it would never happen to me. He lied, but that was years ago. I've learned so much since then. Things my job as a murderer rely on. Things I wish I didn't know. It was my employer who taught me. He found out that the immune system could be tricked and made to kill any person you want. A key detail that made the whole thing work was that when the antibodies receive orders, they remember them, regardless of if the timeline should change. Therefore, they'll remember orders issued from humans who in the new timeline never gave those orders. They exist separate from us and our rules. The antibodies will follow orders, even if they were given from a dead timeline. The fact is what makes us able to kill people. It's a bit of an elaborate process, but it works. I think. You see, I can't remember doing it. I know how to, but I can't remember having ever done the process. Though my employer says I've killed many people. Such a funny thing to be a mass murderer and not remember any of it. Maybe I'd be interested to know just how many people I've erased, but 
Bigger things occupy my thoughts now. With time comes wisdom. With time comes perspective. The antibodies are after me now. I've killed so many. Maybe it's just karma. Looking back on it now, it was only going to be a matter of time until the luck ran out. I realize now why my employer hired all of us instead of just doing it himself. One human should only draw so much attention to themselves. Because you see, the universe knows what we did. It knows we're a virus. An infection that's misdirecting cells in the body. And now it's fighting back. Sending those antibodies to kill me and save the host. I keep fighting them, but it's getting harder. They're getting stronger, and they never stop coming. My life is a living hell. The antibodies are relentless. Demons that are horrific in their ability to end human lives. I've seen some that spit ass in. Others that mimic human voice. Several small enough to crawl through air ducts. Others large enough to devour me whole. I can't do this, but I'm too scared to give up. I could kill five one day. There'd just be six the next. And though I've killed so many of them, it never gets easier. It never gets better. They disgust me. The thought of them haunts me. Because on some deep, unknowable level, they are wrong. Your mind knows you shouldn't be seeing them. They play tricks on you. Something about seeing them at all wreaks havoc on the human psyche. I knew a friend who gouged out her own eyes before they got to her. That's how I've been living. That's my life. Maybe if I quit this job and the antibodies would leave me alone, but I can't do that. My employer would just have another employee erase me from existence. No loose ends. And so that's how it goes. Oh god. I don't have long left. But I wanted to mention one more thing. One terrible fact my employer told me. He's the only one who can see dead timelines. The only person I can't send the antibodies against. And what he said shocked me. He revealed to me a horrible truth, and I believe him. He tells me sometimes what the dead timelines were like. And now that I know the truth, I am filled with grief for our species. A sense of loss I never knew I could feel. The worst part is no one knows. They all go about their daily lives as if everything is fine. But what we think is normal is merely the rotten corpse of what humanity once was. Before countless timelines were genocided in, and those who controlled time died out to just one victor, things were very different. And even though I hate the employer, hearing of our past, of all our atrocities, crimes, and vile acts we as a species committed to using this power, it brings me to tears. We used the antibodies once for a war out of a nightmare, a version of us long ago, and now we've fallen. We've fallen so far we can't even begin to understand what we once were. The human population in 2021 was not originally 7 billion, it was 50 billion, and we once spread so far, so far and wide across creation. Now all that's left is the scattered survivors of a massacre, the pathetic remains of something once beautiful. I am cursed to know this as long as I live. And though my life continues to spiral, and the monsters grow stranger and stronger, I won't give up. I'm too afraid of what it will feel like if an antibody devours me. Okay, this is something I experienced a few years back. During the summer break, my sister and I were visiting our aunt who lived in the country. 
Her house is located in a fairly wooded area, but there are several neighbors around. There's a man-made lake about a mile away from my aunt's place, and it is pretty much surrounded by woods. Me and my sister loved to walk around near the lake whenever we visited our aunt, ever since we were little kids. So this time too, we decided to go for a walk. It was about 5pm and the sun was shining brightly. We were told not to walk alone near the lake because there could be wild animals or poachers and whatnot. But we decided that we were old enough to go alone, 15 and 13 years old. So we snuck out while the adults were chatting in the living room and strolled along the path to the lake. The air is fresh, the sun is bright, and we were feeling like we could take over the world. We were walking along the wooded path to the lake when my phone rang. It was my mom who was at the aunt's. Because we snuck out without telling them and we were almost at the lake, I didn't answer it and put the phone into silent mode. Stupid. Yeah, I know. Then we reached the lake, take our shoes and socks off and dip our feet into the cool water. We talked for some time, regular teen stuff. I was telling a joke to my sister when this horrible feeling washed over me. It was like I was being watched. I instantly whipped my head around because I thought there was a perv or something stalking us, but there was no one around. My sister too seemed to be spooked by something. She asked me, did you feel that? And I said yes. We sat there for a few minutes holding each other's hands and hearts in our throats, but nothing happened. The feeling eventually went away, so we brushed it off. After some time, we got bored and decided to search for something to eat. The woods around the lake were practically full of wild berries, so we decided to go pick some. I found a nice patch of berries not far from the tree line, and we quickly started picking them up and shoved them into our mouths. I had finished half of the berries I had picked when I noticed a really cool bug on a leaf. I wanted to snap a photo of it because I hadn't seen it anywhere else. I searched my pockets for the phone, and it wasn't there. My sister asked what was wrong, and soon we both started crawling around searching for the phone. It was a fairly new one and quite expensive, so I absolutely did not want to lose it. Don't freak out, sis. My sister, M, son. Let's just give it a ring. If it's nearby, we'd hear it. She took her phone out and called my number. Instantly, my ringing tone starts going off to the left of us. It was near the path we took into the forest and was pretty loud, so I take a step to go and retrieve it, but M grabs me by the wrist and stops me. You turned the silent mode on, didn't you? She asks with a shaking voice. That's when it dawns upon me. I was 100% sure I turned it on. If the phone is silent, then what the fuck is making the ringing tone? Then we realize that the entire forest is silent other than my ringing tone. Dead silent. M's grip on my wrist tightens. We look at each other with sheer terror in our eyes. Suddenly the ringing stops. Silence. We waited for another ten seconds. That's when we heard it. My aunt called out to us from somewhere deep in the woods. M? T? I'm here. We froze. It sounded like our aunt, but my gut told me that it wasn't. Something was off about it. Like the usual emotions were absent. It was almost mechanical. Like someone mimicking something he had heard before. Then the voice called out again. This time, it was definitely wrong. It was closer to an animal trying to speak. I screamed at M. Run. So we ran. Ran like all hell was loose and fucking demons were driving us out of the woods. During the time we ran, I could hear something following us hot on our heels. Twigs snapping, leaves crunching, and occasional screeching noises. Almost like a wild cat, but far more sinister. It reeked of evil. We ran past the lake as fast as we could and finally reached the paved road where several vehicles were parked. The woods also ended there. We were out of breath and scared to the core. I turned around to look. 
there was nothing. Several people gave us concerned looks, but no one asked anything. We walked with a group of folks who were heading in the direction we needed to go. We kept looking around, but the usual sounds were there, like birds singing. When we got home, we were immediately grounded. We were not allowed to go for walks for the rest of the time we stayed there. Even with an adult, we didn't protest. Sometime later, I described this encounter to my aunt. She looked at me, her face as white as a sheet of paper, but she didn't say anything. I tried to press her for information, but every time she shook her head and refused to talk about it. Later, I heard their town had a lot of disappearances after our experience, especially kids and homeless people. I don't know if these things are related, but something tells me they are. Both my sister and I get shivers when we talk about it, considering how close we were to being abducted or even killed. I don't know about crawlers and rakes, but I believe that's what we meant. I've had headaches my whole life. Crushing, pounding pain deep within my skull. Often I'm afraid my skull will splinter and the shards will puncture my brain. There are days when the pain is a dull throb. Other days the pain can be blinding. If it's bad enough, my nose will bleed. Sometimes when the pain somewhat subsides, I find that I have the ability to think straight enough to wonder if some invisible monster is slowly crushing my hen. However, for as bad as my headaches are, nothing is wrong with me. I honestly can't remember the amount of times I've gone to the hospital desperate to find the source of the agony. No matter how many times I've gone, the doctors have never found anything wrong with my head. Multiple x-rays and brain scans show nothing amiss. Everything's fine. Unless my nose bleeds, people often don't believe me. I've had this pain for as long as I can remember. I'm often told I was a problem child because I cried so much. Of course I told them I was in pain, but when the doctors couldn't find anything wrong with me, it was easier to say I was being a brat. You'd think that after this long of complaining they'd believe me, but since I haven't died, no one is concerned. Suppose I'll have to live with this pain for the rest of my life. After all, I'm 18 and I can't even imagine what it's like to be okay. Sometimes I think I might lose my mind. The pain is maddening, constantly there like a parasite. The pain is there when I go to bed and it's there when I go to sleep. Although sleep is a rare thing, but I suppose I can't complain if I'm getting any sleep at all. It's probably my favorite part about life since it's the only time I feel peace. On the other hand, there are times where I've thought that the only way to get rid of the pain is to off myself. Yet somehow, I've managed to hold on to the foolish thought that someday, I'll be rid of these torturous headaches. Or maybe they'd better be described as migraines. I don't care anymore. The sad part is, I'm used to the pain by now. Don't get me wrong, it's just as awful as it's always been. However, I think I've managed to get better control over the crying and screaming and writhing in agony. Today, like any other, the pain pulses through my head. It throbs, a pounding sensation within my skull. However, I smile and grit my teeth, because today I'm visiting my aunt and her new fiancé. They've been dating for five years now and he finally asks her to tie the knot. They've invited us over to celebrate the engagement. I don't care, I just want to get this over with so I can go back to bed and deal with my headache in peace. It's not that I don't like my aunt or her new fiancé. I just can't stand the not-so-subtle attitude in response to my obvious pain. They all just think I'm lying, like it's some weird game I've been playing since I was born. When we... My parents, sister, and I arrive at my aunt's house. Her fiancé opens the door and greets us with a smile. 
He's handsome, but the poor guy lacks any bit of common sense. Though I suppose he's sweet and he treats my aunt right. That's probably what she ultimately sees in him. My aunt's fiancé, or Robert as we know him, shakes my father's hand warmly. Hey, how's everybody doing? Claire's in the living room. Claire, my aunt, is right where Robert says she is. She's sitting on the couch drinking some sort of beverage. I don't know what it is. I don't care. When my aunt sees us, she beams, quickly getting up to give my mother, her sister, a hug. It's so good to see you. I'm so happy you were all able to come today. My mother returns her smile, squeezing her back in their hug. I don't care. My head hurts so much. The food is done. It's already waiting outside. My aunt leads us into the backyard where no fence exists and ends at a road. I guess we're eating outside. Or something. I didn't even know we would be eating. As my mother and aunt began chatting with the familiarity of sisters, my father nudges me slightly. You keep grimacing. Well, sorry, father. I don't suppose you'd know what it's like for your head to be constantly sat on by Satan's fat ass. I let out a small sigh, walking ahead like a prisoner about to be sentenced to their death. Traumatic, yes. Do I care? Of course not. I wince as a screech pierces the air. Ah, uh, yes, I've forgotten about my three-year-old cousin. She's never quiet, and I remember the number one reason I dread coming over. She's running around with my aunt's dog. Cricket, the second reason I dread coming over. Cricket's horribly loud barking makes my head spin and I try not to vomit at the fresh wave of pain it causes. Please, I want to go home. For as much as I complain, I guess I should have mentioned that my sister is the only one who believes me about my never-ending headache. I should be thankful. But my headache leaves me constantly irritated at everything. However, I try to smile. She's trying to be considerate, which I truly appreciate. It's somewhat peaceful at first, until my vision is temporarily blurred as my head is pierced with agony. Why is my aunt screaming? I look up and I see the reason. My little cousin is running towards the road as a large truck is about to drive by. The pain in my skull makes it difficult to fully grasp the situation, but I still notice my sister leaping out of her seat. Conveniently, my sister happens to run track at school. She's apparently the fastest runner on her team. I can't even manage a whimper as I watch everything unfold, not even paying attention to everyone else getting out of their seat to run behind my sister. It all happened so fast. It's not like the world suddenly slowed as you often hear. I was barely able to even process it. My sister, faster than what I thought was possible, managed to reach our cousin in time. She yanked her back by her chubby little arm and onto the grass behind them, just as the truck drove by. However, as she'd done so, my sister had used her weight to yank our cousin back as fast as she could. As the truck kept driving, my sister fell forward onto the road, the vehicle's front and back tire running over her head. In an instant, her head split open like a watermelon as blood and bits of her brain coated the pavement. My mother's screams were deafening. I couldn't breathe. My heart was pounding and my palms were slick with sweat. In a blink, I'm sitting on my aunt's back porch with my cousin and Cricket as I watch the paramedics put my sister's body onto a stretcher and lift her into the ambulance. As my parents and aunt sob in despair ahead of me, I realize distantly that my head has stopped hurting. What I'd failed to notice was the stinging pain beginning to spread around my neck.
I was born and raised in a calm town. Crime was non-existent and everyone got along with each other. It was the last day of school. I met with my friends at the end of the day as we made a plan to camp in the forest for the whole night. Finally arriving home, I greeted my parents. Hey, how was school? My mom said excitedly. It was fine, like usual. I said while releasing a sigh. My dad never greeted me. It didn't mean he didn't love me. He was just so invested in watching the football game. I headed to my room and started packing some food in my backpack. My parents didn't know about the plan me and my friends had made. It didn't matter. They were going to leave at 5pm for a baseball game. I was planning to leave the house at about 12am and meet my friends at the gas station near the forest. After I took a shower, I applied some mosquito repellent and went on to leave the house. It was roughly 11.55 p.m. The walk to the gas station took about five minutes. While walking to the gas station, I couldn't help but notice the light fog that was covering the town. About 200 feet away from the gas station, I could already see my friends huddled up. When I arrived at the station, I greeted them. Sup, Jay? Said Michael with a slight smirk. I proceeded to then greet all my friends. We decided to enter the gas station to pick up some marshmallows and lighter flew in. After we bought the extra supplies we needed, we headed towards the trail that led into the forest. We could hear the sounds of owls hooting and the howls of coyotes. We walked for a good 10 minutes until we found a great flat area to set up the tents. We were pretty deep in the forest. We had five tents. It was decided that there was going to be two people per tent. I was assigned the job to start the fire. I started looking for small sticks to medium sized ones to start the fire. After finding about 20 good ones, I planted them in an upwards position which I had learned from a survival documentary I had watched. It supposedly made the fire last longer and made it stronger. I doused the wood with lighter fluid and threw a lit match. Immediately after I did, a huge fire sparked and all my friends cheered. I kept feeding at the sticks I had found. The fire, now too big for the small sticks, I went and found about 20 big sticks which would surely last way longer. After all the tents were up and good and everyone had finished their assigned job, Kayla, my friend, suggested we sit around the fire and roast the marshmallows we had bought. Everyone agreed to the idea wasn't really hungry, so I didn't eat any. I don't know why, but I kept feeling patches of cold touching my neck. Every time it happened, I turned around just to see the tall trees that towered over us. I decided not to tell anyone, not wanting to worry them or ruin the vibe. Conveniently, my friend Gabe had bought a couple packs of beers with his fake ID. After a bit of hesitation, I agreed to drink a couple of beers, hoping that it would ease me a bit. It was now getting real late. We all agreed that we should get into the tents. Michael was the person I had to share the tent with. I decided not to put out the fire, thinking it would provide us with heat and protection from the animals. After struggling to fall asleep, I heard a sound from the tent. I thought it was my mind playing games with me. While trying to sleep again, I heard the same sound again. This time it was louder. I decided to tap Michael on the shoulder to ask him if he had also heard it. Hey, wake up. I said while tapping him on the shoulder. What? He said with a tired look on his face. Did you hear that? I said, no, oh, chill out. You had a few beers, remember? He said, he then fell asleep. What he said was true. I did have a couple more beers than I had planned. I had never been drunk before. This is probably what it felt like, I thought. I finally fell asleep, but then I woke up again. This time a loud crack. It sounded like a tree had snapped. Startled, I reached over for Michael to ask him if he had heard that. He wasn't there. I thought he probably had gone out to pee, so I opened the tent. I peeked my head out, trying to look for Michael. 
I noticed that the large fire was now non-existent. After fully coming out of the tent, still searching for Michael, I called out his name. He didn't answer. I yelled out his name again. Nothing. I went to the tent that was next to me and Michael's. I opened it. No one was there. I then went to the tent that was next to that one. No one was there. After checking every tent, no one was in them. I then heard a low hum sound followed by the scream of Michael's voice. He yelled out a cry for help, then silence. I noticed his yell came from the west side of the forest. Moving my head to the direction I heard the yell come from, I saw something that still haunts me to this day. It was big. Very big. Bigger than the 40-foot trees that flooded the forest. It had large, glowing red eyes and long, slim arms. Frightened, I grabbed my backpack and started running. I ran as fast as I could. The weight of the bag was holding me back. I dropped it while running. And at that moment, my life was more precious than my phone or anything in my bag. As soon as I had run roughly 20 feet, I heard that thing start knocking trees over while chasing me. Too scared to look back, I kept running. After a good minute of running, which felt like an hour, I guess it stopped chasing me. I didn't hear the trees falling over anymore. I was sure as hell not going to stop running just because of that. I kept running at a pretty good pace until I made it to the end of the trail. I ran to the gas station and asked the old man for a phone. I called the police. After arriving on the scene, they went into the forest to try to find my friends. It has now been ten years since this happened. I don't live in that town anymore. My parents still do. After multiple manhunts, my friends still haven't been found. I'm also pretty sure that the thing that killed them is still alive. For several generations, my family has managed the town's lone cemetery. From father to son, for generations, male candlesuchiers have passed it down. It has been this way forever, and I will inherit it one day. My father summoned me to the graveyard a few hours after dusk last week, and we were completely alone. With just the wind in the trees for company, he brought me to Mr. Constam's freshly excavated grave. Mr. Constam had died just a week before, and few people in town had the decency to hide their joy. Everyone suspected he'd murdered his wife a few years before, but there was never enough proof to condemn him, and every time his name was mentioned, there was always a good riddance to be heard. My father smoked a cigarette while standing over Mr. Constam's freshly filled grave. He shifted his gaze to me. You did a fantastic job on this one, son. Within a year, there will be plenty of grass here. He took a deep pull from his cigarette, the blazing flame illuminating the darkness. I think it's time to tell you the Candlesukier secret, son. I had more faith in my father than anybody else, but curiosity overcame me and asked, Father, what's the secret? Go over to Mr. Constam's grave and put your ear to the ground. I was perplexed for a minute as I gazed at him. I took a careful step around the grave and strained my ear to the soil once it was apparent he wasn't joking. I could clearly hear thumping and scraping from underground. I jolted to my feet. Down there. He's still alive. We need to get him, father. He isn't. My father says as he takes another pull of his cigarette. I could hear banging from underground. He's still alive. Do you recall who embalmed Mr. Constam's son? I did recall. I recalled because I had embalmed Mr. Constam with the help of my father. Right, my father said, tapping the ash of his cigarette. 
All of his blood was drained and replaced with embalming fluid. I'm sure you remember. I opened and closed my mouth knowing he was correct but refusing to accept it. He let out a sigh. Son, funeral customs exist in every society to prevent the dead from rising again. Do you suppose we build a concrete slab over their coffins to protect them from robbers? You are telling me Mr. Constam is dead, and yet scratching at the top of his casket down there. I said. That's exactly what I'm saying. Let's get going, son. It will take him longer to settle down if he hears people above him. I wasn't sure what to make of it. Was my father a murderer with a sadistic streak? Did he strike a pact with a local doctor to assassinate Mr. Constam? Was there any sort of kangaroo court or frontier justice going on here? My father continued to speak, attempting to explain things to me, but I was unable to pay attention. My thoughts were focused on the subterranean banging and scraping. We returned home by car, and my heart was beating as I lay in my bed, unable to sleep. I had to see whether there was even a remote chance he was still alive. It's funny. I had worked in cemeteries all my life, and yet my greatest fear was being buried alive. I snuck out of the home a while after midnight and sprinted the distance back to the cemetery. I climbed into our excavator and drove it to Mr. Constam's grave, where I started excavating. My pulse was pounding and I was sloppy with the digging, but I got the job done in the end. I slid the bucket under one of the concrete slab's corners and pulled it away from the coffin. I leapt out and slid down the grave, lifting the casket's lid. Mr. Constam laid there with a scowl on his face. His hands were no longer clenched together as they had been when we left him when he was buried. One was by his side and the other was by his head. I saw shreds of silk had been ripped away from the casket's roof and a cursory examination of his hands revealed that the majority of his fingernails were gone. Evidence of his desperate attempt to escape. Mr. Constam... I screamed and shook his chest. Mr. Constam, wake up. I'm here to save you. My hand rested on the side of his neck. It was cold and I sat on the side of the casket at that point, unsure of what to do. I was drenched with sweat and grime. Finally, I went into my pocket and pulled out a pocket knife, cutting the back of his left hand with it. The incision dripped a little amount of clear embalming fluid but there was no additional reaction, and it seemed he was no longer alive. My blood became ice cold all of a sudden, and I knew he was dead. I backed up slowly while watching his expression. Then, I jerked backwards, crawling out of the hole in the ground. My progress was slowed as loose soil crumbled under my hands. Mr. Constam, I was certain, was sitting up in his grave, gazing at me. I dug further and was able to pull myself up and out. I rushed back into the grass, trying to keep my breathing under control and not shout or weep. That's when I spotted my father smoking another cigarette on the excavator's tread. He knelt alongside it and patted the tread. I sat down next to him, carefully getting to my feet. Do they all come back? I inquired. His voice was low and steady as he answered. No, it's rare that you have one that comes back. The ones that do are usually the ones that have done the worst, and they'll do anything to avoid being judged, including returning to a body that no longer lives. They seldom stay long with our ways, though. They're only active for a few hours at most before giving up and accepting their fate. It seems Mr. Constam tried to escape his fate, but... Death comes for all, son. No matter how hard you try, and Mr. Constam was ready to meet his maker. I couldn't think of anything else to say, so I said, Oh. Come on, son. Let's cover him up again.
We were almost done cleaning our new home. Only the attic was left. We were putting it off till there was nothing else left to do. Attics creeped us both out. After an hour of coughing, lungs full of dust, inhaling random bugs into our mouth, spiders tickling our neck, webs hanging from our clothes, we were completely on edge. So when his fingers brushed my hand, jumping four feet into the air was a natural outcome. Losing my balance, I crashed into the side and the plaster gave way. I landed into a well-hidden cubby hole. Hands on our hips, we surveyed the belongings of the time capsule we had inadvertently opened. Things in the cubby hole were well preserved, untouched by the hands of time. There were trinkets, but the main attraction was a pristine dollhouse, an exact replica of the house we were in. We peered inside to see two dolls peering back at us from the attic. They looked a bit like us. What are the chances, we thought. We brought it down to the kitchen. It was too beautiful to be left in the attic. Exhausted, we slept as soon as our heads hit the pillow. When I came down the next morning, my husband was hunched over the dollhouse. I checked over his shoulder to see a small baby doll in a pink gown looking up at us and the two older dolls were lying in a heap in the kitchen. That wasn't there before, I exclaimed. He turned so fast that we both crashed onto the floor, all arms and legs. That is when the doorbell chimed. We opened the door to a little girl in a pink gown. She looked like the baby doll. We looked at each other. Did the dollhouse foreshadow this? We were being silly, right? Mama, Papa, I'm back. The little girl said. We tried explaining we weren't her mom and dad, but she just hugged me and, well... She was adorable. I was very happy to play mom to Gia, but my husband had doubts. One day while she slept, we had our first argument. Who is she? Where did she come from? He asked. How does it matter? We wanted a kid and there she is. Don't you just love her? I asked. No, I don't. This whole situation is creepy. He huffed turned and slept. He didn't come down the next day. While I made lunch, Gia played with the dollhouse. I gasped when I saw her throw the male doll from the roof. The doll's leg bent at an awkward angle. Some instant, I heard my husband shout. I ran out to see him clutching his leg as he writhed in pain. His leg was broken. He later told me that he felt as if a hand plucked him from the balcony and threw him off it. I was very stressed taking care of everything on my own, so when Gia broke my grandmother's urn, I shouted at her. She looked at me angrily, her eyes dilating into black discs before she ran off. Immediately feeling guilty and afraid, I ran after her. She turned and grinned at me as she taped a toy cleaver to the male doll's hand and walked him down to the kitchen. Sam, run! My husband's pained voice called out from behind me. There he stood as if propelled by a force, arms swinging a cleaver, broken leg supporting his twisted frame as he tried to fight whatever it was. It was too strong and he lunged towards me. I remember screaming and I ran towards the old broom closet. I just managed to close it as he pounded the door. I switched on the bulb in the dank, cramped closet as I rocked on my haunches. That's when I saw it. Scribbled behind the frame was a note. Hide the cursed, indestructible dollhouse in the cubbyhole and cover it well on a moonless night. That is the only way to stop, Gia. Save yourself. Stroking Gia's golden curls that night. I shivered a little, realizing how close we had come to dying that day. I'm still amazed that we survived. Sweetie, I'm sorry. I will never shout at you again. Let Mama come out. You know Mama loves you a lot, right? I begged Gia. Thankfully, that was enough to placate her, at least for now. My husband looked like a rag doll that's been through a wash cycle, but hey, he was alive. I hugged Gia first, then took care of my husband. 
didn't want to antagonize her till the next moonless night. As the realization hit me, my hand stopped just for a moment. Gia looked up, her eyes boring into me as they turned darker, eating away at my soul. I hastily started caressing her again and sang a lullaby to distract her. My mind was racing, so she doesn't know what is written, only what is said after all she had no idea what I posted that night. That can work to our advantage. Leaving the sleeping Gia snuggled to her doll, I went to our bedroom. I signaled my husband to be quiet and I messaged him to let him know about the note on the closet door, and then I went digging in the attic. The cubbyhole must hold some clues. I found rolled up notes looking as fresh as the day they were sealed in with the dollhouse. If you are reading this, that means the cubby has been opened and the demon is back. These notes contain the story of Gia the best I could find them from the locals, newspapers, and more means. I have already lost my whole family. Save yours. I hope this will give you some answers. This house belonged to the renowned doll makers Jeremy and Brooke. Jeremy had designed this house himself using a doll house. Yes, the same doll house that you found. Their specialty was making lifelike dolls and intricate details made them look alive, but with the advent of modernization, cheap dolls were flooding the market and nobody cared for handmade dolls anymore. They had to make sales to make ends meet, and one of their buyers was a shaman practicing the dark arts. They had suspicions, but were in no state to object to good money. Through a stroke of luck, they got a contract from the city's council. They had to create dolls for all the contests and giveaways the council will conduct. They didn't need to sell anywhere else anymore, but their good fortune brought a curse in its wake. They had a daughter, Gia apple of their eye. She loved to play in the beautiful woods outside till her mom would call her for supper. Brooke's voice went hoarse that day, calling Gia for dinner, but only the silent, damp darkness of the woods returned to her heart, empty-handed. The search lasted for two months before the heavy rain made it impossible to continue. In their grief, Jeremy and Brooke turned to making small dolls that looked like Gia. One day, Jeremy came down to breakfast and Gia was waiting for him at the table alongside Brooke. Overjoyed, he hugged her limp body and recoiled in horror as he realized it's just a doll. Brooke didn't even look up. She kept mumbling, I will never let you go, again and again. The thunderous knock of the door snapped them both out of their paralysis. The shaman had come with a proposal they couldn't refuse. He could bring back Gia, if only they gave all of the Gia dolls to him. Of course, they jumped at the opportunity. After three days of rituals involving blood sacrifice, black smoke, and occult symbols, Gia's doll was animated. Mama, Papa, I am back. What had come back was clearly not Gia, but the couple didn't care in their grief. Shaman left with the other dolls, and those have been playing havoc on their unsuspecting couples ever since. That's a story for another time. The couple was seen with bruises covering their body, black, blue, green, each hue telling a different story. They would brush it off by saying how they tripped or fell due to clumsiness. Then the unthinkable happened. Cops actually found Gia. She had partial amnesia and didn't know where she was held captive, but otherwise fine. When the cops reached Jeremy and Brooke's house with Gia, the imposter Gia had vanished. What happened in that house that day is a mystery, but the cops had to come back to the house the very next day. The entire family had vanished without a trace under suspicious circumstances. None of their belongings were taken. It just seemed like they fell off the face of the earth. Anyway, after a few years, my family bought the house. We redecorated, but didn't touch the beautiful dollhouse in the living room display. 
I will not go into the specifics of my story as the new moon night is already upon us. And I need to seal this in as well. To cut a long story short, my family started seeing a little girl around the house with gleaming black eyes and then accidents started happening. Our family seemed to be plagued with tragedy. My sweet, never heard a fly grandma had gone on a frenzy. That's when I hid in the kitchen closet and found the scratched note. I think either Jeremy or Brooke scratched it on the fateful night. Sadly, it was too late for my family, but these notes chronicle the summary of all my research. Hope they help you. I will be sealing this along with the dollhouse today. September 5th, 2013. I stood with my mouth agape. The last owner had abandoned the house in 2013 and vanished, and that's why we got it cheap. They were definitely successful in sealing the dollhouse. And what happened to them? I didn't have the luxury of time to worry about it, so I went about planning and preparing. Some ideas I got from my commenters and I hid survival kits. Hid most things that can do serious harm and just worked on keeping Gia happy. I made it to today. The new moon night. Gia seems especially weak today. I think I can pull it off. Wish me luck. I remember thinking that I had never felt so small. I stood on the deck of the largest ship I'd ever seen in my life, in the middle of an ocean that stretched out to forever in every direction, with what seemed like the entire universe spread out above me. I couldn't stop snapping pictures, but not a single one seemed to capture the sheer magnitude of what I saw. My last picture had a strange sort of blur in it that I couldn't immediately place. At least until the wind shifted and a small cloud of something was blown into my face. It smelled... smoky. Seconds later, watching the direction it came from, I saw more of it drifting downwards towards the ocean. I leaned over the railing and craned my neck to see where it was coming from. A man stood on the deck above me, young looking and wearing a crew uniform. He had a large cardboard box propped against the railing and was scooping out handfuls of sandy gray matter to toss overboard. I hate to admit how long it took me to put it together, but once I did, I freaked out and started swatting at my hair and coat. I had just taken in a face full of human ash. When I looked up again, the man was staring down at me. I gave him what I hoped was an apologetic look. He grabbed the box and ran. The next morning over breakfast, I was confiding in my cabin neighbor, Anne. I told her about the guy spreading ashes and how much it freaked me out. She told me she thought it was a nice way to go out. I guess at her age, she thinks about that sort of thing more than I do. Before we could finish discussing it, an announcement came over the ship's speakers. An overly chipper voice was telling us that a storm was forecasted tonight. And for safety reasons, we would all be asked to stay in our cabins from 10 p.m. until breakfast. I immediately pulled out my phone and checked the satellite maps online, but nothing I saw suggested rough seas or any kind of storm front. I spent the day relaxing. It's a cruise, after all. But the later it got, the more I found myself watching the sky. Where was the storm that was supposed to be coming? Even when time was creeping towards our new curfew, there wasn't a cloud in the sky, just millions of stars. And it was breathtaking standing at the railing and seeing the Milky Way touch the horizon. My thoughts were interrupted by a crew member asking me to please move to my cabin for my own safety. It was after 10 now and the decks were occupied only by the crew and the last few stragglers that were ushering indoors. I apologized with a smile, which the crew didn't return. I assumed he was one of the less friendly ones, but the longer he stared at me, the weirder it got. He didn't move or take his eyes off of me until I was completely out of sight. Even then, I think I saw him peek around the corner when my door was shutting. A few hours passed before curiosity got the best of me. I snuck out of my room. 
not that there was anyone watching anyway, and went out onto the deck to see what this dangerous storm was. It was nothing. Not a raindrop, not a snowflake, not a single rough wave. The sea was calmer than it had been in days. Even the wind had died down completely. I wandered down the deck towards a row of lifeboats, absently staring at the gentle waves rolling in the distance. A faint voice caught my attention. I could barely make out two dark figures in the distance, one leaning on the rail and another standing and holding a large box. I snuck closer, ducking down behind the lifeboats, trying to hear what they were saying. That's so gross. A feminine voice giggled. Grosser than touching it? A male voice responded. He pulled a large plastic scoop out of his box, the kind you'd normally use for ice, and poured a scoop full of something over the railing. After last night's discovery, I assumed it was more ash. Do you put it back in the kitchen? What if I do? The conversation devolved from there into teasing, with him randomly acting like he was going to throw a scoop of ashes at her, and her squealing and giggling and swatting him on the arm. I was about to move on when she picked up a second box and started to tip it over the railing. He jumped forward and snatched it out of her hands. Is this what you've been doing? He half shouted. I'm not touching that. She whined back. You can't just drop it all in. He wasn't teasing anymore, and her face fell at the dark look he was giving her. Why does it matter? It just does. I know you're new, but the rules are important. He gave her such a look of contempt that even I shrank back. I shouldn't even be here. He mumbled half to himself. I was supposed to be on 12. Then maybe you should go. She snapped back. He threw his plastic scoop back into the box and stormed off, thankfully in the opposite direction from me. She watched him go, and as soon as he was out of sight, she dumped her entire box of ash over the edge and left too. She was trying to look tough, for who, I'm not sure, but when she passed my hiding place, she was chewing her lip and fidgeting with the chain around her neck. I waited a few minutes before coming out and going to the railing. I looked down into the ocean below. The clump of ash had already disappeared somewhere below the surface. As I searched, another faint cloud drifted past somewhere below. I scanned the decks beneath me and finally spotted another hand reaching out, scattering ash to the sea. A cold chill crept down my spine. I looked back and forth along the decks. The more I spotted, the easier they were to find. Both above and below, more than I could count. Every deck, every section, as far as I could see in every direction. Every last one of them was tossing human ash to the depths below. Anne came to check on me around noon. I had been holed up in my cabin since last night, and she got worried when I didn't show up for breakfast. I must have looked crazy, checking both ways down the hall before I let her in. I told her everything. I had to tell someone. This was just too much for one person. She patted my hand and said it had to be some kind of program. You and I are lucky. There are a lot of people that never get to see this part of the world. Some people never get to travel or sail at all. I knew she meant well, but she wasn't there last night. I needed her to understand how big this was. I made up my mind before she had even left. I was going back out there. I was taking my camera, and I was getting evidence. A little after midnight, I crept up the stairs to a higher deck. I didn't want to take the risk of running into anyone who worked near my cabin and might recognize me. Our new curfew had become a standing order on the ship, although I still saw no evidence of foul weather. The deck up here felt bigger and it was high enough to give me a touch of vertigo when I looked over the railing. I kicked myself for not choosing more carefully. There was hardly any place to hide here. I was just thinking about moving to another deck when I heard a door open behind me. 
I crouched in the darkest shadow I could find, armed only with a camera, praying that my breathing wasn't too loud. Another crew member with another cardboard box emerged and started making his way down the deck. He placed the box next to the railing and looked out at the ocean for a minute. I switched my camera on as quietly as possible. I had already turned off the screen so the light wouldn't give me away, and I had a long zoom lens equipped so I wouldn't have to get close. From here, I could see every detail. I zoomed in on his face and breathed a sigh of relief. He had earbuds in. As long as he was listening to something, he wouldn't hear my camera shutter. I snapped one shot of his face just to make sure. Zero reaction. This might be easier than I thought. I backed off the zoom a little to get a clear shot of his jacket with the ship's logo. Then I noticed he was wearing a piece of jewelry. A silver chain around his neck that I felt like I had seen before. I zoomed in again to see a shining pendant dangling over his chest with some kind of symbol carved into it. I got a few shots, but none of them came out very clear. The boy dipped out of frame and I had to zoom out. He had bent over and was reaching into the box at his feet. My finger touched the shutter, waiting for the scoop of ash to be visible. He pulled out a human arm. It was charred beyond reason, but completely unmistakable. It had a hand, four fingers, and a thumb. And I think it even had a ring on it. Bile crept up the back of my throat and he threw the arm overboard. Cold as it was on deck, I began to sweat. I found enough focus to hold the shutter and close my eyes. My camera clicked rapidly, catching shot after shot of something I couldn't stand to watch. Eventually my fear of being caught overcame my revulsion, and I managed to open my eyes again. I watched the boy throw his last few chunks of, thankfully recognizable, flesh over the railing. Then he just stared down into the box. I held my breath. Not sure if I could handle another twisted revelation. He pulled his sleeve over his hand as a barrier and reached in. What he pulled out, I see that scorched face every time I close my eyes. I was still dry heaving in the shadows when he walked away with his empty box. I stumbled to the railing, hoping some fresh air would soothe me. Like an idiot, I ended up looking down at the ocean. I saw hundreds of them bobbing in the water. Just pieces. Every one burned to a crisp. I followed the railing towards the back of the ship, too stunned to care about being seen. The sea below was littered with human remains, with more still falling from the ship. I stood at the farthest point of the deck watching them float away in the wake of the ship. Maybe it was paranoia sinking in, but I swear I could see a few disappearing. Someone shouted from an upper deck and I ran. I didn't stop until I was barricaded in my cabin trying not to cry. I was pretty sure I had stayed far enough ahead to lose them, otherwise they'd have been breaking down my door. There was no way I was supposed to see any of that. I didn't turn on any lights that night, and I sure as hell didn't sleep. I dragged my laptop into my closet and loaded my pictures onto it. I decided not to post them until I was safe and off the ship. I regret that now. As soon as I heard noise in the next cabin, I ran over and begged Anne to let me in. She was shocked to see me so early. The first thing I did was sit her down and make her look at the pictures I had taken. She tried so hard to explain it away, but I think she realized how messed up it was. She thought we should just stay quiet and go back to our normal cruise activities. Keep our nose out of business that wasn't ours. I wanted to argue because whatever was happening was clearly shady and probably illegal. But after last night's close call... I didn't think I should be taking the risk, so I let it go. I still wouldn't leave the cabin. Anne was nice enough to sneak food from the buffet to bring back to me, and we passed the day with card games and TV shows. 
I even managed to sleep a little after dinner. I was wide awake and reviewing the pictures on my laptop for the tenth time when the knocking started. They announced themselves as maintenance, saying there was a problem with the room. Anne woke up and went to answer. I swear I tried everything to stop her. Looking back, it probably wouldn't have helped. I hid in the closet. It was really the only place to hide in these cabins. I just knew that whoever was knocking, it wasn't good. And I didn't want them to know that I was here. It was over before I could even think about intervening. Anne's voice had gone from confused to muffled in an instant. It sounded like she tried to fight, but she was easily overpowered and dragged out of the room. She's not here. The voice through the wall stunned me. Probably snuck out again. They were in my cabin. If she's outside, she's fair game. Should we get a backup? Better ask the captain. I waited until the voices were gone and then took off down the hall. I wasn't even sure I was going the right way, but I thought it was the direction they had taken Anne. This ship felt like a maze tonight. I ran blindly down hallways, making wild guesses and finding more dead ends than I knew existed. I opened every stairwell I found, listened for noise, and moved on. I prayed they were still on this deck. If not, I might never find them. After what felt like the millionth wrong turn, I had to stop and catch my breath. A little clarity finally came to me, and I found the nearest door out to the deck. I looked both ways and thought I saw movement near the back of the ship, so I ran. I came around a corner to see Anne alone, gagged and bound to the railing by her wrists. With no crew in sight, I ran to her, pulled the gag off, and started untying her. She thanked me, her face wet with tears. I heard a door open behind me and worked faster at the ropes. There was at least two people judging by the yelling, and one of the voices was familiar. I untied Anne just in time and yelled for her to run and get inside. I wasn't sure why, but something I had heard back in the cabin made me think she'd be safer indoors. Two young men from the crew were rushing at me, and the first thing I did was put myself between them and Anne, hopefully giving her time to get away. I need the first one, the angry guy from two nights ago solidly between the legs, dropping him to the deck. The other one tried to shove past me, but... I grabbed him by the jacket and pulled him off his feet. I managed to stay on top of him for a minute, but he was struggling hard. I held on to whatever I could until something broke and I was shoved off and onto the deck. The first guy stumbled back to his feet. I thought he was coming for me, or maybe going after Anne, but he ran back the way he had come. I looked back towards the railing. Something was creeping up the side of the ship. So pale it was almost translucent. Four long digits felt their way up the railings. Then a fifth. A fully formed hand. Each finger larger than my whole body slid up and over the railing, skimming along the deck. It hovered near the guy I had just been fighting with. He reached for his neck, searching. He looked to me and I opened my hand to reveal the silver pendant. He dove towards me, screaming incoherently. The hand was faster. It descended on him like a cage, then wrapped its fingers around him one at a time. Everywhere the pale white skin touched him, his clothes were burned away and his skin was scorched black in an instant. Screams of pain echoed around me, and I was choked by the scent of burning flesh. I clutched the pendant to my chest and prayed it wouldn't notice me. He kept eye contact with me the entire time he was being lifted over the railing. I think he expected me to save him somehow. Driven by shock, I crawled to the edge and looked over. I could see the rest of the monster's arm glistening under the moonlight. Its skin stretched thin over bones and bulging at the joints. The elbow was crashing into the sea, where I'm grateful that everything else was hidden in the pitch black waters below. 
I watched the man I had inadvertently doomed being dragged into the water still screaming. For his sake, I hope it was quick. After the water had gone still, I heard a shout. Within seconds, I was surrounded and being dragged back inside. They took back my stolen pendant and locked me up in the little cell in the security office. They tried to interrogate me, but I answered their questions with my own. They wanted to know where my camera was. I wanted to know where Anne was. They wanted to know everything I saw. I wanted to know why they were doing this. We went in circles for a good long while. No one got any answers. Right now, I'm still locked up in security with a phone I stole from one of the crew. It doesn't have cell service out here. Only the ship's Wi-Fi. And I don't have my pictures for proof. This is the best I can do. I still don't know why they were feeding that thing. I'm starting to wonder if it's the real purpose of bringing a cruise this far south. I'm pretty sure I at least know why Anne and I were chosen. Both traveling alone, seemingly easy targets, and easy enough to make up an accident, for me, or natural causes for her. On a ship this size, they've got plenty more to choose from. I don't know how many others they're going to sacrifice. They spent at least three days chumming the waters, so I'm betting they warmed it up for a good feast. It's only a matter of how many they think they can get away with. I have no use for age anymore, but I know I was 10 when it started. My mother came into my room to say goodnight, as she always did pulling the covers all the way up to my chin and tucking them around my miniature frame. A bear hug and a kiss on both cheeks. And a final reaffirmation that there is no one on this earth she could possibly love more than me. Our routine complete, she tugged the cord to my bedside lamp, extinguishing the stars that twinkled on its shade from the lit bulb, and followed the light spilling in from the hallway, pulling the door closed on her way out. Just before it clicked shut, she peered back over her shoulder, smiling at what I'm sure was a charming image. Me. So innocent in the world and pure of heart, peering over the blanket to catch one final glimpse to assure me she should see me in the morning. With those final words, the door would click shut, and I was surrendered to the darkness. It was in the stillness of that night, Ten years old, protected from the cold by my mother's warmth, it dawned on me that I would never again feel her embrace. I knew, without a doubt in my mind, that I had just seen my mother for the last time. Surely I could fling off the covers my mother so purposefully wrapped me in, throw open the door and tear down the hall shouting her name. I'd find her most likely in her bedroom doing some light reading before she, too, turned in for the night. She'd console me, stroking my hair in such a way that would instantly put me at ease, before walking me back to bed, insisting that she would be just down the hall. But in that moment, I found myself unable to move. An impossible cold had overtaken me akin to the cold of a winter's night so dreadful it takes a scalding hot shower or hours entombed in blankets to fully return feeling to one's body. The feeling of never being warm again. Even amidst the horrible realization, I was unable to stave off the tide of sleep, my eyes growing heavier as I became colder. The weight of my sarcophagus of blankets betraying me to the point of suffocation. That night I dreamed of her. A vicious parade of what I somehow understood to her memories. Lies told. Fights with loved ones. Buried secrets. Hateful looks. Anything and everything monumentous or incidental alike. A carousel of the dregs of her subconscious 
funneled directly to me in unrelenting succession. I awoke in the morning with a crushing weight in my chest as if my mother had been relinquished of her transgressions and, in turn, the burden was forced into my own heart. Free from my invisible bonds, I approached her room to find her laying peacefully in bed. Her body cold, a social worker would later explain to me, very delicately, that a previously undetected problem with her heart had resulted in her sudden demise. But at least she passed in her sleep, they would say, as if a positive takeaway was even possible. The sentiment was appreciated, though it was lost on me as a child, painlessly, in her sleep. Why was she allowed to leave this world peacefully with a young child in the wake of her passing? For years, I tortured myself, unable to relinquish the darkness weighing down my heart. Endlessly, I speculated how, if maybe, just maybe, she was awake when it had happened, she would have thought of me. And maybe, just maybe, the thought of leaving her only child alone in this world might have kept her alive. But I'd felt it when she closed my door that night. I knew there was nothing to be done. That was the first time. In the beginning, it was impossible to grapple with this new reality, compounded by the fact that I was alone in my curse. Or maybe there were others, and much like me, they were simply too afraid to talk about it. Either way, I was alone. But as with all things, I settled into this new reality, continuing on as best I could. After a while, it became predictable, mostly after visiting elderly relatives. At least I could brace for the potential and the inevitable, which somehow began to offer the smallest shred of comfort. I learned quickly that not every experience was personal, though that didn't change what followed. The cold, the dreams, the memories, the sin, the weight, the death, the helplessness. Each piece worked in tandem, each as bad as the last. Some were much worse, saying goodbye to a friend after a night out, dead from choking on their own vomit. A young child down the street, working on his dribbling. They never caught the driver who hit him. And then from that pain being forced to relive the child's sins that very night, Stealing Halloween candy when his friend wasn't looking. Pulling the hair of a girl he had a crush on. It was enough to ruin me. I had no choice but to become completely desensitized. If only to find some way to cope with the reality of bearing witness. The worst was having to pretend I didn't know. But I had already started to grieve when someone called to tell me the news. Because the night before a dying soul bled their humanity out to me. That I'd exhausted my tears years ago thinking about how I could stop it from happening. If only I could pick up the phone or pound on their front door until they had no choice but to answer. That I knew how to save myself, but simply couldn't. I thought of my friends and family, random passerby, even my mother. I thought of all of them. So fortunate to be blissfully unaware of our final parting while I absorbed their dormant sin. Would they believe me if I told them? Would they change their actions, cancel their plans, and wrap themselves in a sarcophagus of blankets until I no longer felt the cold in my heart? Would that even change the outcome? It was as if, in my final moment with them, the cold took it upon itself to absorb all of their negative energy. To leave them free of burden, free of sin, free of everything. But that weight could not be destroyed, only transferred to me. Eventually it became too much and I gave up on any connection to the outside world. I had already made my plan, just as my mother had so many years before. I wanted to go peacefully in my sleep cut ties with my friends and family, and it was then I began to feel the cold. Only this time it was different. 
I was making the conscious decision that I would never see them again. For a brief moment, I was in control. The cold lingered as I prepared myself for what was to come, and for a week I slept, subjected to a ceaseless procession of everything those closest to me wanted to hide from the world. I emerged. My chest contracted from the weight inside, a hundred lifetimes worth of pain added on top of an already unbearable mass. For the cold, it must have been a feast. On the chosen day, I stood in the bathroom and stared at the bottle of pills on the counter, assuring myself it was truly what I wanted. A glimpse of my reflection in the mirror repulsed me. My skin was nearly translucent, my face gaunt, the bags under my eyes deep. I felt empty, everything left in me, siphoned off by the cold to a rotting heart burdened with the affliction of others. I felt like a ghost. Resigned to my fate, I reached for the bottle, still resting on the counter. At least, in my mind, I did. No matter how hard I tried, my hand would not move. I stood there, white-knuckling the edge of the sink, gritting my teeth, tears blurring my vision as I cried for the first time in years. But I could not pick up the bottle. I looked in the mirror for once in my life, wishing more than anything that I would feel the cold again, that I could allow myself to die. I tried for what seemed like hours, but it would not come. In the wake of my inability to end my own life, as I collapsed into a crumpled heap on the floor of my bathroom, I realized the full extent of my curse. With the knowledge of my planned death, I had cut myself off from everyone forcing myself to see them for the last time under the assumption it wouldn't matter when I was done. But I lived on. When I was finally able to pull myself off of the floor, the tile greased with my sweat and tears. I knew there was nothing to be done. Too burdened by the weight, I could not pass on, no matter how much it pained me to remain. A heart too heavy to bear judgment, could not be silenced, ever beating despite my wishes. This time, no one called. In fact, I surmised no one would ever call again. In my arrogance, I had foolishly believed I could control my power to free myself, but what came of it was more death than my soul could comprehend. I had removed myself from their lives, taking all pain and leaving them free of burden, free of sin free of everything, free of me. I had prepared them for the afterlife, and now my job was complete. In that moment, trapped in the agony of oblivion, I wrestled with what led me to this moment. I thought of the relatives, the friends, the strangers who foretold deaths I felt. I thought of everyone I let go of prematurely, believing it was a means to an end. I thought of a ten-year-old child, their mother kissing them on each cheek for what they would soon learn was the last time, and again I wondered if there were others like me, if they would ever find me, huddled on the bathroom tile, unable to die, or if they were doomed to suffer the same fate. I thought of my mother and how glad I was she wasn't awake when she passed. I wondered what her last thought was before she went to sleep, unburdened by the knowledge that she'd never wake up, a fate I was not fortunate enough to receive. For here in the darkness, I found that which I have denied myself for so long. Fear. I had spent most of my life disconnected from most emotion to shoulder the weight, but with no end in sight, I was forced to realize that nothing could save me now. Fear is the only thing I have felt as my heart beats on despite my wishes. Unable to live or die. I sit perfectly still, heart too heavy to bear, praying for a final judgment that will never come. It's... it's so hard to breathe.
I have no idea how long it's been or how old I am. All I know is I was 10 when it started. I hope her last thought was of me. My name is Julie Winters. I was born on December 13th, 1997. I should be 39 years old now, but I'm not. I'm 24. I've been 24 for 16 years. I can't grow older. I can't die. I've tried both. I was here before. You were here before. All of us were here before. But somehow nobody remembers. Nobody ever remembers. Only me. It's the same thing every time. December 31st, 2022. We're standing in the middle of Times Square, landlocked in the Sea of Revelers. The ball drops. The countdown. 3, 2, 1. And the calendar turns to January 1st, 2022. Again. In December of 2022, my friends and I had planned to go to Times Square for New Year's Eve, just as we always do, but this time we were going with special purpose, to give a huge middle finger to the past year as well as sail away toward New Horizons. Some friends even flew in a few days early for the event, when Prince and the Revolution said they were going to party like it's 1999. I think they had the right predictions. Just the wrong year. But on December 30th, the police announced that while they were still going to drop the ball, nobody would be allowed in Times Square on New Year's Eve. To say that we were disappointed was the understatement of a lifetime. What would we do now? Sit home and watch a live stream of the ball drop? After friends flew here from across the country? They could have stayed home and done that. No, this was not going to go down like that. We were not going to be denied our rite of passage out of this year. When Clark Griswold drives across the country to take you to Wally World, you're going to Wally World, whether Officer John Candy opens the gate or not. I knew that many of the elites were being given permission to watch the ball drop from surrounding locations, and police presence was going to be cut by 80% which definitely worked in our favor. The plan was to approach from several blocks away, avoiding 8th Avenue and 42nd Street at all costs. We would gradually get closer while maintaining an aloof presence, as if we were simply on our way somewhere else, not trying to enter the square. With these covert measures, it began to feel like we were trying to avoid detection by occupying forces. It was close to midnight when we made our approach, we couldn't go in early, or we'd risk being pushed out of the area completely by the police before the ball dropped. As some random, nameless pop star finished a bland cover of a John Lennon song, the 30-second countdown began. When the countdown hit 15 seconds, we picked up our pace. 10 seconds. Started running. A cop saw us and yelled, Stop! You can't be here! But it was too late. We were already there, less than a block away from the ball as it was landing, in perfect view. Three, two, one. Came through the broadcast and the earbud as the cop was just yards away from us. Happy New Year. I don't remember anything after that. All I remember is that we were in front of the one Broadway Avenue when midnight hit. And suddenly, it was 3 a.m. and we were back in my place in Queens. I didn't say anything about my missing memory to the others and they didn't say anything to me. I wondered if the occupying forces had been keeping people away for reasons other than a virus. The next New Year's Eve? 2022. The same group of us met up. Except for John. He couldn't make it this year. This time, the streets were full. Everything was back to normal, or so I thought. Everything was going as you'd expect. The flavors of the month were lip-syncing their current radio hits. 
talking heads from radio and TV were all talking into microphones and telling their audience how much fun they were supposed to be having. When the countdown reached 10 seconds, the crowd chanted along. 10. 9. Someone cracked a joke about Ryan Seacrest balls dropping. 3. 2. 1. Happy. That's when I came to consciousness back at my apartment in Queens, along with my friends. The same friends, including John, who couldn't make it this year. I turned on my TV and flipped through the playbacks of the celebrations. The number 2022 was splashed everywhere, even across the huge plastic glasses that they were all wearing. My phone said it was January 1st, 3 a.m., just three hours prior, it was December 31st, 2022. I woke up the next day thinking of what a strange dream that was. That is, until I started flipping through social media posts. Everybody was wishing everyone a happy 2022. I thought I must still be dreaming. But the dream didn't end. I continued living every day just as I had the year before. I knew when many things were going to happen before they happened. Some of the things that I didn't remember would hit me after they happened, making me laugh. I tried seeing a psychiatrist. I didn't tell them that I still thought I was repeating the previous year. I presented it as a thing that temporarily plagued me. But I was now aware that it was not real and I was just trying to figure out how it happened and work with the fallout of it all. When the doc asked me if I still think I'm repeating the previous year, I hesitated before stumbling and saying no. I think he knew I was lying. My birthday came on December 13th, and I turned 25 again. As I had the year prior, before time reset. Again came New Year's Eve in Times Square, and again at midnight, I woke at 3am in my apartment in Queens celebrating January 1st, 2022 with the same friends. And it happened again, and again. I tried changing things over the year, thinking that I did something wrong and needed to fix it in order for time to finally continue moving forward. None of this worked. After my eighth time repeating 2022, I decided that I couldn't take it anymore. I was going to end it. In mid-July of that cycle... I drove across the George Washington Bridge. Halfway across, I pulled over to the side and leapt. My next memory was of waking up in my apartment in Queens at 3 a.m. January 1st, 2022. I can never die. No matter what happens to me, time keeps resetting. This year, one thing changed. After the ball dropped and the countdown hit zero, I did not suddenly wake up at 3 a.m. in my apartment. This time in the stroke of midnight, we stayed exactly where we were on the street in front of one Broadway. The sea of revelers from December 31st, 2022 suddenly disappeared. One second prior, we couldn't move. Now we were standing alone in front of the ball. Streets empty. Still New Year's Day 2022. Just no three-hour time and space shift to my apartment. I no longer care if I am deemed mad or insane. I am telling my story publicly in order to try to find anybody else who remembers the reset. I haven't yet met anybody who remembers. So now I am casting the widest net possible by telling my story online. Please contact me if you remember. There has to be someone. Signed. Julie Winters. I love my family cat, but it is the most insufferable pet at night. Before I go to bed, I'll give him plenty of opportunities to come into my room because I know, eventually, I'll hear that light scratching on my door at ridiculous hours of the night for him to be let in. And every night, I give in and open the door and listen to his tiny claws tap across the room to jump onto my bed to fall asleep by my foot. Yesterday, I offered again, but nope. He refused me like he refuses me every night. 
With my ego crushed, I closed my door and my heart, cruel cat, and went to bed. Maybe he resents me for moving out, or maybe he likes to spend half of the night in the comfortable king-size bed that my little sister has snatched from me instead of the single bed in a box room that I have to now stay in whenever I visit. Shut up and go to sleep, I told myself, smiling. Last night, I was woken up again by the scratching, so I walked to the door mostly asleep and opened it without greeting the bugger. I slipped straight back into the comfort of my bed and lifted my feet up. I could hear the tapping on the floorboards as he jumped up the foot of my bed and under the covers. I lowered my feet and it landed on him. Normally, my heavy feet would make him claw at them until they moved, but there was no reaction. Just gentle purring. That and the soft breeze from my open window lulled me into a deeper sleep. I began to automatically do the usual thing of stroking my cat's head and back with my toes. My eyes opened fast. Instead of the dense, smooth fur, I felt something hairless and cold to the touch. Like something dead. And when I reached the back, my toes felt like they were running across metal bars. and There was too much resistance and tug on the skin. My body froze. Its deep purring began to sound gargly and started to get louder and louder. Alarm bells went off in my brain and signals fired through my body to make it jump out of bed. The reach out to turn the lamp on. As soon as the light switch clicked and the room flooded with dim light, my back pressed against the wall near the bedroom door. My wide eyes burned as they adjusted and I stared right at that thing, still at the foot of my bed, all curled up and naked. It was the size of an average adult man. It was very slender with its almost transparent skin clinging onto every bone on its body like a thin, wet shirt. Its legs and arms were unusually long, and it had enormous hands and feet attached to them. The feet and hands had disgustingly long, yellow fingernails that were cracked on the edges. There was no hair on its body, and since its skin was so thin, I could faintly make out the contents of the inside of its body. It began to crawl out of bed with its arms reaching down on the floor first. I could hear the tapping of the fingernails on the wooden floors as he brought down the rest of his body into a squat. His hands were on the floor, and his knees by his ears. It looked up at me with its big, wide eyes, which were mostly covered by its black pupils. It was still purring, but it was starting to sound more and more distorted, which didn't stop until it began opening its mouth a few moments later. It was so bizarre. It should have stopped opening, but it kept dropping lower and lower. It also had no teeth, but that didn't make it any less threatening. It finally stopped, and it let out a meow, and then repeated in a familiar voice. Can I come in? Its mouth didn't move at all when those sounds came out. It just stared straight into my eyes. Fear struck me even harder when I recognized the voice. When I woke in the morning today, I told my mom that I must have been dreaming her asking if she could come into my room at 3 a.m. because she would never ask for permission, but also, what would she want to do at 3 a.m. in my room? We had laughed at my comments, but I definitely wasn't laughing now because I know now that that wasn't a dream. This thing was trying to get me to let it in. As it saw my face distort out of fear and my eyes pooling up, it began to smile a toothless smile. The widest smile I had ever seen. I began to tremble as it licked its lips and began walking towards me in all fours. I could see the outline of its arched spine shifting as it crawled and it didn't take long to reach me in that tiny room. Jerking its head forward, it pressed its icy nose against my skin and inhaled deeply. Its eyes rolled back, exposing only the whites and its body began to shudder. I was so taken my fear that all my pathetic body could conjure up was a soft whimper. It looked up in its thin, Crackled lips curled back as its mouth opened to make my shaking finger into it. Once it was in, 
it closed shut. At first, I could only feel the wetness and then I began feeling pressure pushing down onto my finger from above and below. When I found the courage to look down, it was staring right at my face whilst moving its jaws like it was warming up his mouth. Then its eyes widened and I felt it, its gums pushing down, crushing my finger so easily, like it were the cartilage on a chicken bone. Pain shot up my arm and I opened my mouth to scream, but I could only let out a long, dry wheezing like my breath had been knocked out of my body. It smiled again whilst letting go. My finger almost looked flat like it had been crushed by a hydraulic press. The shaking of its body began to get aggressive, and once it noticed that, it stepped back. All the way back until its back pressed against the wall on the opposite side of the room. Its final act began. It inhaled deeply and began opening its mouth again. This time, once it opened as much as it could naturally, it reached both its long hands into its mouth. One of its hands clasped onto the gums on the floor of its mouth, whilst the other reached from behind its head and clasped onto the gums on the roof of the mouth. It began to pull from either direction as horrifying noises of cracking and tearing ensued. Not once did his eyes leave my gaze. He held me hostage throughout the entire nightmarish scene. Once it looked like it could fit a human head into its mouth, it stopped. Then, it began to walk towards me. I started to say my prayers as my vision blurred from the tears. I couldn't move. I was going to die. This thing was going to tower over me, envelop its mouth around my head to crush me and consume me. I began shaking as I imagined the immense pressure on my head making the blood rush to every orifice in my body making it ooze out of my eyes, my ears, my nose, my legs, my legs. I could feel the familiar feeling of warm, soft fur rubbing against my shins, purring. This time, I knew this purr. It was my stupid cat, and for some reason, although my body had frozen when my own life was being threatened, it became swift and mobile when I thought about this thing crushing my helpless cat. I looked down, grabbed it, and jumped onto my bed. This damn cat was fighting me and managed to leap out of my arms. He arched his back whilst the ginger hairs on his body puffed up and began hissing sharply at the monster. I almost leaped at it, but I noticed the monster looked scared with its mouth wide open. It let out a sharp screech, and before I knew it, it was out of the window. I have never seen anything move so fast. I was left stood on the bed, frozen again. The cat jumped onto the bed like nothing happened, rubbed against my legs a few times, and decided to crawl into a ball at my feet to sleep when it realized I'd need longer to thaw. My back slowly began to slide down the wall, and I was sat with my savior snoozing by my feet. I stared at him for what seemed like an eternity, and daylight finally began to seep into my room. Eventually, I started to hear the hustle and bustle around the house as my family began their day, but I just sat on my bed, defrosting. Then I fell onto my side and fell asleep. I avoided my family all day under the guise of illness. I'm awake now, and it's night again. Earlier, I called my cat, and he did the weirdest thing. He came in and curled into bed with me. It's strange, but whenever he's purring near me, my injured finger doesn't throb with pain. I've got the night light on. The door and window closed, and my cat in my arms. I'm waiting to see if it comes back again. My friend Astrid was the most beautiful soul I have ever met. She was the kind of person who would do anything for her friends, and when she was with a person, she was 100% invested in them. 
their story, their life. When she asked how someone was feeling, she genuinely meant it. She was the friend who made me want to be the best version of myself. A friend I would do anything for, even if it meant leaving my comfort zone far behind. That's why when she led me down a narrow path in the remote Michigan wilderness along the vast Lake Superior, I followed her unquestioningly. I didn't remember exactly how we got there or what came before. All I could think of were my immediate surroundings. The lapping of the waves against the distant shore. The cry of the gulls circling for fish. The slight chill of the August air as it weaved through the towering pines promising an early autumn this year. But the warmth of the sun against my skin letting the air know summer wasn't quite done playing. Most importantly out of all those things, I saw my beautiful companion, my best friend in the whole world, walking ahead of me, talking and laughing. There was no place else I would rather be. My heart was full. I followed her without question, not knowing or even caring where we came from, where we were going, or hell, even what time of day it was. It was usually a meticulous planner, but... The details I would fret over before a trip simply did not matter. I couldn't help but notice how lovely she looked. I mean, she was always radiant, but this time she was simply ethereal. Unnaturally, almost. Her wavy brown hair fell gracefully to her lower back, emitting a soft glow I assumed was from the sun. She was in her best hiking outfit. REI pants, keen boots, and an L.L. Bean wicking shirt. She even wore the bright red scarf I made her for Christmas this past year. I noticed her boots made no sound as she walked, making her look as if she were floating. A fairy princess leading me into the mystical forest. I laughed aloud at the thought, the sound stopping her abruptly. She turned to face me with a questioning look. Where are you taking me, dear? I asked. She pressed her finger to her lips, urging me to be silent, then pointed ahead of us where the trail broke through the trees, leading to a cliff overlook. I walked ahead and as I got closer to the cliff, the blissful feeling I had throughout our journey turned to a bitter coldness within my heart. I stopped just shy of the cliff, not wanting to go any further. For some reason, I was afraid. Afraid to look over the edge. I felt something ice cold on my shoulder. It was her hand. She squeezed reassuringly, urging me to go forth. When I got to the edge, I felt a gust of cool air whip my face. As I squinted my eyes for a better look, a flash of bright red appeared in the lower edge of my vision. My heart was pounding. I looked down and there it was. The scarf I made Astrid for Christmas last year. The one she was just wearing, but how? I turned around and she was nowhere in sight. I stepped back into the woods. The path we walked turned out to be more of a makeshift footpath or deer path. I frantically tried to retrace my steps. I didn't get too far when I saw a group of individuals in neon vests walking side by side. It looked as if they were combing the forest. I looked down at my own clothes to find I was always wearing a similar vest. As if a spell were broken, I realized I was here out in the woods. Astrid had gone missing last week after a solo hiking trip. I managed to tell the police where her scarf was. Sure enough, her body was found in the lake shortly after a boat was dispatched to the bottom of the cliff. The most wonderful day in my life spent with my favorite person ended with me losing her forever. It had been almost two months since Astrid's body was drawn from Lake Superior. The results from the autopsy came in. Nothing suspicious showed up. She died from the impact of hitting the water. The lead investigator told us it was impossible to determine if the fall was an accident or on purpose, but assured us there was no sign of struggle, no DNA on her person, nothing to suggest anyone harmed her. I suppose that means I should take comfort in the fact that my best friend was either being reckless and fell, which I highly doubt, 
or that she was in so much emotional turmoil that she didn't want to live anymore. The thought of her doing that was unfathomable. She never once mentioned anything about being depressed. She never showed any sign of being sad. However, the possibility left me with a nagging feeling. Maybe there's something I missed. Maybe she was showing signs and I was too dense to notice. I'm a terrible friend. I dreamt about her every night since we found her. Every dream was the same. I saw her walking through the woods and slowly approach the cliff. Her eyes glossy and mouth slack as if in a trance. The moment she jumped, her expression went from vacant to terrified as she plummeted toward the lake. I always woke up before she hit the water. I figure the dreams were a part of the grieving process. With so many unanswered questions, my brain tried to fill in the blanks. During the memorial service, I sat next to her parents, Bob and Linda. As the priest delivered the sermon, I felt a sense of deja vu as it was only five years ago when I joined Astrid and her parents to say goodbye to her brother, Tyler. He was killed by a drunk driver on his way home from work. He died instantly. After the service, Linda pulled me aside. There's something I want to give you, she said. My heart dropped as she pulled Astrid's scarf out of her purse. She would have wanted you to have it. Choking back tears, I managed a meek, thank you, and wanted nothing more than to go back to my house and cry. Before I could turn away, she added, there was something else I wanted to give you. She reached back into her purse and pulled out a forest green notebook, Astrid's journal. Bob and I can't bring ourselves to read it, she said, but if you find anything off, would you let us know? I told her I would take it. How could I refuse? It felt like an invasion of Astrid's privacy, but I figured it didn't matter much at this point. That night I flipped through her journal, focusing on her more recent entries. About a week before the disappearance, she mentioned the trail and that she was going to clear her head after a long day at work. Sounds like her, I thought. The following page was far from ordinary. I saw Tyler today at Red. I stared at the words in disbelief. She saw her dead brother on the trail. The same place I saw her on, rather. What I thought was her. I kept reading. I know it sounds crazy, but I saw him. I couldn't believe it. He didn't say anything at first, but he smiled and gestured for me to follow him. I didn't. He then spoke, saying, there's something I want to show you. I wanted to follow him, but I was scared. Now I'm regretting it. I miss him so much. Maybe it was his ghost trying to say goodbye. As I read her last entry, my heart sank. I'm going back to see what Tyler wants. I finally understood why she went. What I didn't understand was how or why she fell. I know curiosity usually gets people like me killed in horror movies, but armed with the ability to separate reality from fiction, I took my chances and drove to the trailhead. My plan was to retrace my steps to the cliff. I wasn't sure what I was hoping for, but I was desperate for closure. Somehow, I believed returning here would accomplish that. When I got to the trailhead, I sent my parents my location and an ETA for my return. Considering all that's been going on, I didn't want to take any chances. It was unreasonably warm for late November. The snow hadn't fallen yet, so I was hopeful I'd be able to spot the turnoff to the cliff. Sure enough, after hiking less than a mile, I found it. I had only taken a few steps off the trail when I heard a faint whisper coming through the trees. At first, I thought it was the wind. But when I listened more closely, I could make out a woman's voice. Is someone else out here? Maybe the police found more evidence. Or maybe a ranger was here setting up a blockade so no one else would get hurt. I decided to check it out and wound up in the middle of a clearing with a circle of stones. They looked as if they were placed there by someone. When I entered the circle, the whisper stopped abruptly. In fact, 
All sounds seemed to stop abruptly. The forest was completely silent. I noticed each rock had an odd symbol etched into it. It wasn't anything I recognized before. The symbol was an upside down triangle with an X through the middle and a V underneath. I took some pictures on my phone to bring back and see if anyone knew what they were. I don't know why, but there was something about it that made me feel uneasy and that I needed to get far away from there. I had just turned the way I came when I heard my name loud and clear. I froze. It sounded like Astrid's voice, but there was something off about it. Like it was warped somehow. I refused to turn around. I didn't want to see who or what was behind me. Follow me, it said. I couldn't speak. My tongue felt like iron. I managed to shake my head instead. Follow me, it repeated, this time with a hint of annoyance as if warning me not to refuse again. There's something I want to show you. A sudden realization came over me. Those were the same words Tyler spoke to Astrid. Adrenaline took over and I sprinted down the trail like a scared deer. I could hear twigs snapping behind me as I ran. I was being pursued spoke to me again and I started to feel dizzy. I couldn't understand what it was saying. It sounded like a different language. I managed to get to my car after what seemed like an eternity. I threw myself in, locked the doors, and sped down the road. I couldn't see anything coming after me. I didn't stop until I got home. When I pulled up to my garage, I scrolled through the pictures. Black screen. All of them. I then pulled out Astrid's scarf and held it in my hands and sobbed. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't her depression. There's something in those woods, and it took her away from me. It's been almost two months, and I haven't been able to sleep through the night. Every time I close my eyes, I see the symbols on the rocks. Every time I let myself drift asleep, I hear that voice in my head repeating, There's something I want to show you. I've always been fascinated by entropy, the concept that things are irreversible and chaos increases over time. That is just something natural, something that happens in the universe. It's a law. Before I go into what has happened, maybe I should spend a little bit talking about myself. That way you might understand my actions better. I'm a quiet and passive person. I speak when spoken to. I don't drink and I don't smoke. I have a job and I do it well, but it's nothing out of the ordinary, just an office job. So you understand when I say I'm not someone that would attract much attention in a crowd or speak up in class when I had a doubt. As it sometimes happens to people like me, I turned inwards and started developing lonely hobbies. Every new hobby, a new addiction, I jumped around quite a bit. I spent some time drawing, but I could not advance at all. Then I tried photography, but my sense of framing is terrible, and honestly, I'm not much of an artist. Then it was woodworking, and that was almost cost me a finger and most surely a couple hundred euros. The tools still lay around somewhere in the basement because I never had the energy to sell or give those away. I'm trying writing now, so excuse me if my prose has low quality. I write these letters frantically because I can still feel the dust in my skin. I write because I need to move on from my last hobby. Observing. Maybe this way things can go back to normal. I called a hobby for simplicity's sake, but it was more a change in my lifestyle. I discovered occultism. I used to go to a church as a kid and I found it amusing. Although I never judged myself a devoted person, what attracts me are things that are unseen to naked eyes. 
The outside world doesn't interest me, so when this new door unlocked, I became quite hooked. I started with the basics, the Kabbalion and the Hermetic principles. Then I began devouring books one after the other. I learned the Kabbalah, chaos magic, Thelema, everything. A basic pillar of all these traditions is the meditation and I picked up on that new activity quite early. As for now, I can sit for more than a full day in meditation. This was the reason of my downfall. I became trapped. In Chaos Magic, it's stated that the best system of magic is the one you create yourself for yourself. So I decided I would reformulate meditation, the very base of every system. It was bound to work. I stopped calling it meditation and renamed it observation. The changes were quite simple and, as I found out later, not original at all. Instead of closing my eyes and freeing my mind, I would go somewhere and observe. Simply observe. The receptacles of my observation would vary. I started with things at home, some sigil I had traced, a picture of somewhere, or even some action figure. Then I started going to parks. I would find somewhere quiet, preferably deserted, and sit in observation. I would focus my attention in one thing and let it guide me. I've observed plants, ants, animals. I've seen flowers bloom, leaves open up, but that didn't hold me for long. I don't have the most cheerful personality, so things started changing. Life didn't interest me anymore. I became interested in death and corruption. I started watching things rot, mold grow, entropy doing its thing, taking things away, the irreversible path of decay. One day I took a new way to work through a more deserted neighborhood, full of abandoned houses and falling structures. My practices were starting to affect my daily life. When you practice esotericism, for a while your intuition becomes powerful. You are able to feel things. It's not something you perceive rationally, but it comes from the subconscious and are not easily explained. You simply know. Passing through this forsaken part of town, a specific building caught my attention. An unfinished construction full of bushes, broken windows, and fallen walls. Some kind of warehouse, not somewhere that would make a big impact normally, and could even be repulsive. Before the rest of that day, I could not think of anything else. I had a feeling something was waiting for me there. On my way back, it was already dark. I really should have waited for the weekend or something. Planned my observation properly, but I couldn't hold myself. I stopped immediately there after work. As entering the place, I felt a chill running through my spine. It was completely dark, so I turned on my phone's lantern. When I looked around, I saw the most incredible work of entropy. Things were in apparent good shape. There were machines, wood planks, metal pipes. Everything apparently new. Apart from this thick layer of gray dust, I found myself a good place to sit. Entered the lotus position, turned off the light, and began my observation. At first, it was hard, but then my eyes accustomed themselves with the lack of light. And the shadows started to dance around in inebriating movements. I felt myself leave my body. My eyes fixed on the stack of abandoned machinery and wood. It was then that I had lost track of time. I saw the dust start to accumulate even thicker around me. In the few moments of conscious thoughts, I could not believe what I was seeing. The wood started to rot. The metal started to oxidate. Nature started to reclaim its space. I saw people. Lost souls walking around. Specters from the future. Things there were yet to be. Everything decayed, including myself. 
The dust that gathered around the building also stick to me. I felt myself become part of the surrounding. Just one more forgotten piece left to be reclaimed by time. Entropy reached me. Slowly but constantly, I became inoperative, irrecoverable, neglected. I felt a kind of pressure in my chest that could only mean the fear in my heart, but I didn't sense it as I should. Not as I normally do, anyway. It was as if my consciousness was far away from my feelings, as if my mind had been taken away while the brain felt the fear and the link between the two weakened persistently. Decaying like the rest, I longed for my body, but I was trapped in my mind. Or better saying, something trapped my mind and took it away. It took ages for my mind to die, but it finally did. Not by some disease or old age, but simply because there came a point that it surrendered itself to me. When I felt my mind die, I finally came back. The sun was shining. My phone battery had died out. I went home. I'm not quite sure how I drove, but I reached my apartment. When I looked at the mirror, I saw it. My face was covered in gray dust. The same dust I watched cover everything. It's all over my body. I feel it sticking to me. Sometimes it seems that the layer is thickening more and more. I've tried washing it away. The water always comes clean, but the dust stays. People don't seem to mind it. So I go to work every day and pretend I'm not slowly drifting into abandonment. Time reclaimed a piece of myself that night. Something I'll never get back. There are people downstairs and I don't know who they are. I don't remember why they're here. I don't remember why they are shouting my name. I don't remember a lot of things anymore. Please don't forget me. Remember, remember, remember. I made my fortune selling some middleware I had been working on in my spare time to a growing tech company. This was back in 2002, or was it 2003? A long time ago. I was barely in my 30s and rich beyond my wildest imagination, but you quickly realize money brings little joy when you've got no one to share it with. I had someone back then. I still remember her face. I do. I promise. She had eyes that would weep at Christmas adverts. She had hair that would turn brown at the roots when she hadn't been to the hairdressers. She had a crooked smile that would reveal itself when she danced. She was mine, then she wasn't. She was killed the day after we celebrated one point something million pounds arriving in our bank account. October 19th, I remember. We were rich, we were happy, then we weren't. A snowstorm, black ice, car found at bottom of cliff, her green eyes, her dyed hair, her crooked smile all wiped from the earth. I remember trying to identify her. It was near impossible. I don't remember much else. Since then, I've been trapped in this crumbling village in the middle of Yorkshire Moors. My wife and I had stumbled across it on our way to a seaside holiday. We fell in love with the rugged ruralness and bought a cottage on the outskirts. It was to be a private getaway where we'd grow old together. Now I'm just old and alone. The last 18 years have found me drinking away my fortune. There's one pub in the village, the Steel and Oak, built in 1797. You'd be forgiven for thinking that decor hadn't been updated since then. A 
cold and barren place where only the desperate would drink. I'd spend my nights with one or two alcoholics. Farmers, mostly, I think. We had nothing in common, so we kept ourselves to ourselves. Occasionally, a lost tourist would stumble into the decrepit pub. They were always on their way to something nicer, most of the time, but had gotten lost or their car had broken down. I helped a few of them, I think. I remember giving lifts as long as they didn't mind a bit of buzz driving. None of them stayed very long. Why would anyone want to spend their days with a sad drunk? As my wife would say, I think. This afternoon, a blizzard came in from the coast. The forecast said snow was going to hit the valley for at least the next three days. Around three o'clock, a young couple came blustering in from the snow. You could tell they were tourists, dressed in bright neon winter outfits that stung against the dark pub. I was going to take a few bottles home and drink myself through the storm, but the fella insisted on buying me another round. There was a desperation in his voice that made me suspect I was in the presence of a fellow alcoholic. Don't get many free drinks in this village, so got to take them where you can. He was called John, a tall man, slim in some places, fat in others. His receding hair was partially hidden under a green bandana. She was called Jane. A pretty young thing, dressed in a yellow puffa jacket with dark hair and blonde highlights. And so the drinking began. John and Jane were happy and beautiful and polite. It made me sick. I wanted to hate them. Their joyousness made no sense in my world, but I was having an unfortunately good time. She asked if I remembered her. Something had been floating amongst the burnt remains of my brain. A flickering image. Maybe a smell. I couldn't grasp it, though. My memory was turned to dust. I've been known to even forget my own name at times. Her smile faded. She said her last name was Hardwick. Family friends, I think. Must have been one of the wife's many acquaintances. She was always entertaining people, hosting weekends so friends can enjoy what she liked to call the real outdoors. Jane must have been young when my wife was obliterated at the bottom of that cliff. Jane asked if I ever redecorated the hallway. It was a phrase that stung. My wife despised the garish pink and blue flowered wallpaper and constantly demanded it get stripped away. The problem was the room had towering high ceilings, meaning the walls stood like giant monoliths. It would have taken at least a week to strip it all, and at the time, I thought I had better things to do. John let out a sharp, harsh laugh. I changed the subject. After a few more drinks, I excused myself to go to the toilet. The urinal had been mysteriously smashed the week before, so I locked myself away in the cubicle and treated myself to a sit-down piss. Just as I was about to start, the bathroom opened and I heard someone squeak in across the tile floor. They stopped outside the cubicle. A pair of expensive walking boots looked up at me from the gap underneath the stall. The shoes had barely got a lick of dirt on them. That you, Josh? I slurred. It was John. He didn't realize the urinal was broken. I sat in silence for 20 seconds as I tried to piss. No chance, so I surrendered the cubicle. John had been waiting so close to the door his nose must have almost touched it. He said that it was a shame that I didn't remember his wife. I agreed. It was. I had forgotten a lot of lovely things in my life, and she seemed like a lovely young lady. I told him. She was, he said. He stared at me for a moment before sliding into the cubicle. Back at the table, Jane was staring out the window. The snow was picking up something fierce. 
It was being thrown around the landscape by an angry gale. Strange tunes whistled through the holes in the window frame. There was a newfound sadness on Jane's face. She asked again if I remembered her. I lied and said that I did. It was unconvincing. Her face drooped further. The blizzard pounded against the window. A pang of guilt spurred me to offer them a lift. They were staying at Old Man Farm, just a bit further out from my house. Jane gave me a wonky smile, but I could tell it wasn't real. She put her hands over mine. They felt soft and warm. Her eyes were like emeralds dazzling in the firelight. She told me that she was sorry. What for? I asked, but John appeared at the table and down the last of his pint. He said it was time to leave. The blizzard was raging when we clambered into my rusted Land Rover and left the village. I could barely see beyond the car bonnet as the white flakes whipped around us. Everything had turned into mounds of snow of varying sizes. Hills, trees, houses. Even the road signs had vanished into the whiteness, meaning I had to make my way back from memory. I made several wrong turns and had to spin the car around on the gathering ice. Julie and Jim were barely paying attention. Harsh whispers formed small clouds of fog from their mouths. The word pathetic was muttered a few times. Eventually, Jane folded her arms and stared down at her feet. The windscreen wipers were the only sound for the rest of the journey as I watched Jeremy scowl at me through the rearview mirror. By the time we got to mine, the blizzard was screaming and pulling at the car. The rest of the journey would be downhill and treacherous even in the best of weather. There was no way Julian and Janet were getting back. I offered for them to wait it out back at mine. I had a few frozen chicken tikka masala meals and more than enough booze to tie us over. John looked ready to deny the offer, but Jane cut him off. She would love to stay, apparently. John glared out the window and told her not to waste her time through his gritted teeth. The passenger door opened and Jane silently got out. Women, eh? Son. John leant his head against the glass and told me that he hated me. He would never forgive me for what I had done to Judith. What did I do? I asked. He told me that I don't remember. My head started to hurt. It was piercing. Like a hot needle through the eye. My mouth tasted like sulfur. The rush of blood squeezed through my ears. I told him that I was sorry. He just grunted and got out of the car. I took a bottle of golden ale out from the plastic bag beneath my feet and popped it open with a twist of my car keys. Three deep burning gulps and it was done. I felt better. I couldn't see John and Jane at the front door. I called out their names into the freezing void. Every shout was taken by the breeze. After a few desperate attempts of calling them, I gave up and decided to warm up inside. Maybe they would be easier to spot from the windows of the upper floor. I slid my key into the lock, but the door was already open. I've never been too fussed about home security, but I could have sworn I locked it today. Jamie and Jill were already inside, their voices barking away from the kitchen. Their argument turned fierce. Wails bounced off the pink and blue hallway walls. Jennifer cried out that Jordan was a self-absorbed monster. Justin accused Jade of being a dirty little flirt. A plate smashed on the floor. I asked if everything was okay. Jim told me to fuck off and that I was a fat waste of space. Jill screamed at him to stop talking to me like that. I held my breath and crept upstairs. I snuck into the bathroom as the shouting continued. I clicked the lock closed and sat down on the side of the bath. John accused Jane of wanting to leave him. He was slurring. 
Jane asked why would anyone want to spend their days with a sad drunk. And I began to cry. I wish I could say I remembered her. I wish I could say I remembered my own name. But my mind is ash. A burnt inferno of crushed steel at the bottom of some cliff. My name is John Hardwick. My wife Jane was killed when her car skidded off the road and rolled down a 150 foot cliff. I was supposed to take the car to the garage and replace the worn brake pads. I went to the pub instead. I forgot to tell her. I forgot. I forgot. They've stopped arguing now, but I can still hear them moving around the house. I think they're looking for me. Stop crying, Jane. I remember now. I remember. I remember. It all started when I was 12 years old. I was living with my mom in a small house out on the countryside of Sweden. From a young age, I never believed in boogeymen hiding under my bed or monsters in my closet. But it all changed the night of my 12th birthday. I did my normal before bed routine of brushing my teeth, reading my favorite book and then turning off the light ready to fall asleep. I woke up around 1.34 a.m. to a weird noise coming from somewhere in my room. At first, I just thought it must have been the tree branch of an old oak that was stood beside outside my bedroom. But then I heard something whisper my name, Jacob. That's when I started to get scared. I hid under my sheets thinking it would protect me from whatever was in my room. But the scratching and whispering continued for hours. It was almost dawn when it stopped whispering my name. After what I believed was an eternity of waiting for that voice to disappear... I mustered up enough courage to peek up from my blankets. All I saw was my normal room, but in the middle of my floor was a note. On that note was something that looked to be written in blood. The note said, Won't you come play with me, Jacob? That's when I heard my mother walking around downstairs. I rushed down the stairs to show her the note and tell her what had happened. But when I started to explain what had happened only hours ago, she shook her head and said it was due to a mix of my imagination and all the stories I've read before bedtime. I reached for the note which I had put in my pocket, but when I put my hand in my pocket, there was nothing. The note had disappeared. I stood there dumbfounded over how that note could have just vanished. Every night without exception since I was 12, I've heard that voice whispering calling out to me from my closet. One time when I was home alone, I decided I'd had enough of the constant whispers and scratching. I went over to that door at exactly 1.34 a.m. and opened it to see the closet wasn't full of clothes anymore, but that it had a huge hole at the back leading to, into the wall. That's when I saw it for the first time. The thing, the monster that had haunted me for the last five years was a large and skinny man with a top hat and a permanent smile that went from ear to ear. When it saw me, it walked slowly toward me. In a panic, I closed the door and started to run out of my room. I was midway on the stairs when I heard my closet door slamming open with a quick crash like it had been ripped off from the hinges. When I was all the way down the stairs, I looked up to see if that thing had followed me. And when I looked up those stairs, I saw something that would haunt me for the rest of my life. I saw the creature on all fours with a wide smile on its face. I got a better view of the creature's face in the light, and I saw two hollow sockets where its eyes were supposed to go. It let out a demonic screech that forced me to cover my ears as I ran outside my house. It followed me as I bolted towards the forest where I thought I was safe. As I ran for what felt like miles, I could still hear that creature's screech, as if it was right behind me. A few minutes later, the screech got quieter. That's when I took the opportunity to hide behind a fallen tree a few hundred feet in front of me. I waited for what felt like hours when I remembered that my mother would be home soon. 
I ran as quickly as I could towards the direction I thought was leading to my house. But after being lost for hours, dawn finally came, and I had found my way home. But when I got to the house, I saw a tall silhouette with a top hat that was waving to me from my living room window. My stomach sank when I saw my mother's car wrecked in the driveway of my house. I saw a trail of blood leading towards my front door. I walked inside to see blood and flesh was shredded all over the hallway and kitchen. When the police came, they didn't believe my story and arrested me for the murder of my mother. This was 25 years ago. Now I'm a free man. I went to therapy for my trauma, but from that night, I will always remember that silhouette waving towards me. But my son recently started complaining about scratching and hearing whispers from his closet. I'm 22 female, an avid nature photographer. I regularly go on hikes into the deep middle of woods and forests to catch the rarest beauties of nature. Anyway, I head out to this location I've been meaning to go to for a while. Some of my photography friends have been there before and got stunning photos of deer, badgers, and various rare birds. I drove as far as I could before the woods started, parked my car up in a lay-by, grabbed my tent, camera, and supplies and headed into the forest. It was quite misty, but the forecast said it would clear up overnight. I found a badger den about 30 minutes of walking into the forest, so decided this would be the perfect spot to set up my camera to hopefully catch some badgers on film overnight. I pitched my tent just far enough away not to disturb or scare the badgers, and went over to set up my camera. I had it facing so it would catch lots of the entrances in the same shot, plugged it into the power back, and left it running. I had a motion sensor, so if it was to catch movement overnight, it would begin filming. Everything seemed fine. I was in the middle of the woods, away from any paths, so it was very unlikely anyone would disturb me in the night. The next morning I woke up and could see fresh trails around the den. So I knew I would have caught some badgers on camera. I was so excited. I tried to check the footage on my camera straight away, but both it and the power pack had died. And unusually, the power pack was no longer plugged into my camera. Weird. I was sure I had plugged it in. I just hoped it had enough battery to catch the badgers on film. I'd have been gutted if I'd missed them. Nervous I'd messed up. I decided to head back to my car to charge up my camera and have a look at the pictures. I packed up everything and walked back to the car. It took about half an hour for my camera to charge up and turn back on. It turns on and I go to my camera roll. The first video was of the badger den, but I couldn't see anything there. There must have been some movement to trigger the camera to begin recording, but I couldn't see anything within the shot. It was recorded at 2.30 a.m. After about 20 seconds of nothing, the recording stops. I flick to the next recording and it's a photo of my tent. I flick to the next and it's a photo of me alone, asleep, inside my tent. This was followed by about 40 more photos of me sleeping in my tent. The final photo, taken at 5.30 a.m. About half an hour before I woke up was a picture of my car. I could feel the fear rush over me. My hair stood up on the back of my neck. I began driving and I drove as fast as I could. There was no signal and no one else around for miles. I managed to get home safely. I still don't know who took the photos or why they were taken. I've not been camping since. My family and I live in a duplex that is split into an upper and lower level. 
My two daughters and I have lived in the bottom portion of the building for many years and we've seen various people move in and out of the upper portion of the building. There was this old man who lived upstairs for a few months. Before the pandemic, we called him Mr. Woodtips because he smoked these very distinctive wood-tipped cigars. The old man probably smoked 15 of these cigars a day. He just stood outside pacing on the stairs in front of our building for like half of the day, every day, but there walking around and smoking these little cigars. I actually liked the scent though, but he would pace by our door and we would smell the smoke when he walked by. And we would hear him out there coughing and hacking away. The man was in poor health. I think he hacked and coughed more than he did any actual breathing. Like I said though, the man only lived there for a few months, but my family and I became very familiar with him over this short period of time. He would often yell and curse at people walking their dogs or sometimes fall over and knock the trash cans in the street. The police came on two separate occasions because the man was causing problems. My daughters were very cautious of him and when they walked by, they'd look down at their phones. The man always stared at my daughters, though, which made me extremely uncomfortable. But I wasn't sure there was anything I could do aside from confronting the man publicly. It got to the point where my youngest daughter would not leave the house if Mr. Woodtips was outside. She'd peek through the blinds in her bedroom and wait for him to go back inside before running out to the bus stop. She started talking about wanting to move somewhere new, which was a major red flag. We had lived in the building since she was a baby. I eventually sat her down and explained that Mr. Woodtips was an old man who had probably experienced a lot of pain in his life and was down on his luck, but that didn't mean he was a bad person. I told her to be cautious, but treat the man with respect. I stopped seeing Mr. Woodtips a few weeks later. His newspapers began stacking up on his doorstep and eventually someone called the police to do a wellness check. The duplex manager came a few days later to move his things. I assumed he died, but looking back, I'm not totally sure. There would be times where I'd still smell his distinctive cigar smoke. Like someone was smoking really close to me, but there was never anyone nearby. My girls were still terrified of the man, mentioning him constantly. They also talked about smelling the smoke. There would be nights where my younger daughter would scream and cry, and I would run into her room and turn on the lights. She'd swear she'd seen Mr. Woodtips looking through her blinds. I would open the window and look outside and tell her everything was okay, and it was just her imagination that Mr. Woodtips had passed away, but it freaked me out, especially because sometimes I would smell that distinctive cigar smoke when I opened the window. It began affecting her sleep and I considered hiring a therapist even though I really didn't have the money and my job didn't cover healthcare costs. After a while, it began affecting my sleep too because I was so worried about my daughter. My daughter's school called me in for a parent-teacher conference after she got detention for screaming at another child in her class. At this point, we decided it would be best to involve a professional. She was still having trouble at night and was convinced Mr. Woodtips would watch her sleep and was hiding in the flower bed outside her window. It literally broke my heart because I didn't know how I could help her or fix the situation. All I could do was continue the therapy and hope for the best. A therapist believed my daughter might be having a difficult time processing the death of the man, and this was her way of dealing with these new existential feelings she was experiencing. He explained that it was a fairly common thing for girls my daughter's age. After many months in therapy, things seemed to be improving. My daughter was having less panic attacks and seemed to be sleeping better. She was still scared of Mr. Woodtips and would sometimes have nightmares that he was underneath her bed or hiding in the walls. She described hearing his lungs wheeze and pop, and seeing the faint orange glow of a cigar from underneath her bed. Despite the nightmares, the therapy was helping her. I could see it in her face. She was getting in less arguments with her sister, and would go and visit 
friends on the weekend. She even joined a few clubs at the school. It wasn't long before my daughters seemed to forget about the whole Mr. Woodtip situation. I guess I'm really the only one who is still hung up on it. There will be times where I catch a faint orange glow out the corner of my eye, and I will run to the window, but it will be someone's brake lights or something. There will be times where I'm walking outside and I still smell the smoke. I have no idea where it is coming from, but it seems to follow me sometimes. I know it is a popular brand of cigars, and it's possible I'm just paranoid, but it's a very distinctive smell and I smelled a lot. There have been times where I'm laying in bed and I smell it. I guess I'm writing this post because it's gotten to the point where I really can't ignore this anymore. And constantly thinking about this person is really starting to affect me negatively. I'm afraid to bring up the topic with my girls because they seem to be doing so much better. And I really don't want to add any validity to their stories or make them think this is a problem. It's taken us so much to even get to this point. I guess I'm just looking for help. Please tell me there is no way this dead old man is stalking my family. Do you think I should try seeing a therapist? Or voicing these concerns with my daughter's therapist? There have been many times where I've considered calling the police to look around the outside of the building, but I'm afraid it might make me look crazy. And it may have negative consequences for my living situation. I've also considered setting up a camera in my daughter's room or putting a smoke detector by the window just so I have some form of evidence. When I smell the smoke and hear noises, many times I'm too terrified to get up and walk outside, or even look out the window at this point. Please help. I really have no idea what to do. Are you a special kind of thrill seeker? So utterly bored with reality that you dance with death just to get your kicks? If so, I have just a thing for you. This game, if you wish to call it that, is called Cracked Doors. Your average Joe wouldn't be caught dead playing this game, but you're no average Joe, are you? The rules are complicated as all hell, but I'll try my best to explain them anyways. Here are a couple ground rules you should follow before attempting to start the game. Ground Rule 1. The game must start and end while it's dark outside. The exact time is irrelevant, just as long as the sun isn't showing. The length of the game can range from anywhere between 1 to 3 hours, so it's best not to start right before dawn. Ground Rule number 2. Don't play this game if you are easily frightened or suffer from any anxiety. You want to keep your wits about you at all times if you want a chance at winning. Ground Rule 3 It's best to play this game in a room with as few doors as possible. Playing with only one or two doors is optimal, but there are cases of people winning the game with three and four doors. Windows do not count. Closets do. Ground rule number four. It's best to play in your home. While you technically could play this game in an office space or some random other building, it's best to play in a place where you won't be disturbed. Ground rule number five. Make sure all lights are off in your play space. The dim light of an electronic clock or some other small light source is fine, just as long as it's still dark. Ground rule number six. Do not leave at any time during the game. You've blocked off all of your exits, and you'd basically be walking straight into your demise if you attempted to leave. Ground rule number seven. It's best if you're well rested when attempting the game. Trying to play while fighting off sleep will put you at a major disadvantage. Do not fall asleep. It's basically an automatic loss. Now that we got the ground rules out of the way, Let's move on to how to start Cracked Doors. Once you've gotten all affairs in order, you're ready to play. To start off, you want to open all the doors in your play space slightly, just enough to fit your fingers through. You will then want to sit in the center of the room, make sure furniture is out of the way if need be, and say, come and get me. 
in a soft whisper a total of three times. This will summon your opponent. It's unclear what your opponent is. A ghost, a demon, a creature from another reality. Whatever it is, it's now in your presence. What you could potentially see on the other side of those doors will be replaced with dark, oppressive void. It will be completely pitch black beyond your doors. You may even smell a foul odor if you get close enough. There is a chance that your opponent will not wish to play with you. For whatever reason that may be, your doors will slam shut. Wait a few minutes and you should be safe to leave. Do not attempt the game again. It will remember you. The rules of the game are as follows. To win, you must survive until your opponent leaves. Your opponent will not leave until they have given up. You will know when the game is over when the void on the other side of the doors is gone. Over the course of the game, your doors will slowly start to open on their own. You must try and keep these doors at their original cracked positions for as long as you can. As the game progresses, the speed at which the doors will open will increase. It is believed your opponent will get frustrated as the game elapses and will be trying harder to get at you. You will find that it is impossible to close the doors completely. The entity will be keeping them open as you are both now bound by the rules of the game. Your opponent may attempt to speak with you. They may sound like an old friend or family member begging you to open the door and enter the darkness. They may even try and offer you whatever you want. Money, good looks, fame. I shouldn't have to tell you that this is obviously a trick. Don't be a fool. If you start to hear soft singing, cover your ears and scream as loudly as you can. They should make the singing go away. The singing can drive you mad, which obviously isn't good, and will definitely affect your outcome of the game. If you let one of the doors completely open, you've lost. The dark void will completely swallow your room. The floors and walls will become pitch black. You are now in the void, left to endlessly wander until you are stripped of all hope, until you are ready to be digested. If you manage to succeed, the void will lift. Your opponent has left. You should be safe to leave the room, but as a precaution, you should wait a few minutes. Once the coast is clear, you're fine to do whatever you wish without the threat of letting the void in. Congratulations, you survived the horrors of the night. I hope it was worth it. You now have the bragging rights to claim that you have won a game against some horrific entity. Just be warned that it now knows who you are. Attempting the game again could show arrogance and anger the entity. The more you play with fire, the more likely you are to get burned. At first glance, Shelly seemed like a good enough girl. Her role in our company was an entry-level thing. She had that childish nervousness where you could tell she sees us all as adults, superiors, people with insights that remain hidden to her. She was reluctant and insecure, but that much is to be expected. We've all been there. Shaky voice the first time we negotiated salaries. Acting over-grateful, over-enthusiastic, feeling over-panicked about bullshit. Yeah, I've been there too, sort of, but I got out of it fast. Incompetence, though? That's the real problem. With some people, you can't say if they're just that unlucky or that incompetent. Incompetence is a vortex. When the label sticks onto you... Every move you make is seen through that lens, and Shelly thought that's what was happening to her, that it was unfair. Our boss is a dickhead. He wrote half-literate emails, was almost stubbornly hard to understand as if he wanted people to feel perpetually confused, until you realize he just wanted to preserve the right to blame others if things go wrong. 
and got into blaming rants whenever there was an issue or someone made a mistake. We've all been there, and I usually moved on quite easily or let him have it right back, then talked shit about him to a colleague over drinks. For fuck's sake, he was our boss, not a dictator. But poor, insecure little Shelly got pretty traumatized when he let her have it the first few times. Sometimes she felt just awful because he was right and she did wrong. Other times she was broken by the injustice because she just didn't understand what he wanted of her. He wasn't clear. She was just trying to do what he said. Use your fucking head, Shelly. He'd interrupt. Of course, when she attempted to take any small initiative on the verge of panic, it would go unnoticed or it would go wrong and he'd yell again. Panic doesn't really help a nervous and inexperienced person do better. And Shelly's panic was growing more and more every day. Why didn't she just get another job? Who knows? Maybe she needed the money. Maybe it was hard getting through that door. And a few month long work experience with a pissed ex-boss doesn't look good on an unimpressive resume. Or maybe she just didn't have it in her to even initiate that topic with him. The problem was that soon it wasn't just him who had an issue with Shelly. Well, the rest of us there mostly commiserated with each other's feelings for him and did our job the rest of the time, she never quite fit in with us. For one, we were all at least semi-useful to each other. We know how to do our part. She was unsure about hers and no one had the patience to teach her. Lara... The girl who interacted with her most often due to her position, always had an aversion. She had no patience for this girl who walked around asking stupid questions, hoping for validation and approval. Plus, Shelly did make mistakes, and correcting them was annoying. So she started lashing out at Shelly too and making comments about her to the rest of us. Whether she was being fair or not, None of us cared that much and it quickly took on. Now everyone noticed everything that was wrong with Shelly. Eye rolling and snickering were common when she did or said something dumb. Even if as an isolated incident, it was a fair mistake. We all made mistakes, sure, but our image was solid. We weren't labeled. We could say, ah oh, fuck, and move on. But she couldn't. Quite literally too. She always over-apologized or stupidly apologized, like by using emojis when called out on the group chat. Fair enough. It was informal and others used emojis too, but when she did it, we could only see immaturity and stupidity radiating from it. I had a phase when I was in a pretty good mood. I handled some major projects well. Dickhead was talking about a promotion. Colleagues appreciated me. I could spend half a day on Reddit and no one would notice shit because I was competent, comfortable, knew my shit. My personal life was going great too. Me and my girlfriend Cynthia had a lot of fun. Going out was fun. Netflix in bed was fun. Hangovers were fun. I was happy. I normally didn't pay much attention to Shelly. I was played enough with her, but didn't shy away from some ridicule at times. But when I saw her all nervous and alone, I took pity on her. Filled with energy and the idea that I had awesomeness to share, I gave her a little special attention one day, chatted with her a bit, showed some interest. She was so grateful for this attention, she latched onto me. She started opening up a bit. Asked me about some projects she was unsure of. It was all so easy. It just took some knack to understand our boss. I took some time with her and deciphered the request. Gave her some pointers. She looked at me as if I were Jesus. Later she asked me if I could take a look at her work. It took me a few minutes to validate her. Compliment her. Point at some small error. She thanked me profusely as I saved her from a death sentence. Give a little suggestion to make it even better, and she was done. Apparently it went well and she didn't get yelled at. 
I truly enjoyed feeling like a good person. For a while, I dug the whole thing. Her admiration and respect. Playing a mentor. I even defended her in front of others. I said she's just inexperienced and anxious. Lara said I'd regret getting involved soon enough. She was right. As work life went on, new projects came along. Dickhead was in a shit mood and my happiness started wearing out. I started feeling overwhelmed, irritable. Cynthia started taking too much of my time when I didn't work. It seemed I had little time to focus on anything else between the two and I was in a shittier mood. Nothing major, just regular ups and downs. Moods that come and go. Nothing was horribly different than the phase before. It just didn't feel as good and my energy and attention span felt tested. Suddenly Shelly's little interruptions didn't give me a feel-good ego kick anymore. They were just bothersome. She became a burden. She now saw me as her knight who will protect her against dickhead and mean co-workers and she didn't dare to fart without checking with me first. It was always, could you take a look at this? Or, hey, does this look fine? Or, Richard asked me to do blah blah. What does that mean? First, I got colder. I ignored her more often or replied much later with, Sorry, no idea. Check with him. Or, kind of busy. I'm sure it's fine. Or, ask Lara. That's her department. I stopped encouraging and validating her victim complex. Yeah, Richard is a pain. Lara has a bad temper. Whatever. In the end, it's still your job. You're an adult. Fucking handle it. I came to agree with everyone. She was just not competent. I shared my analysis based on my first-hand experience. As much as she seems like an abused little puppy, she's a professional victim. The narrative in her head that probably makes her so prone to mistakes is that the world is conspiring against her. I mean shit. I started agreeing with Richard's point of view more than with hers most of the time. And trust me, there wasn't a situation where I didn't consider him to be a moron. But she's not learning. She's not handling herself. As soon as she got someone to listen, it was just complaint after complaint. Yeah, she gets shit for a small grammar error or a missed attachment, but she's also oblivious about her level and about the amount of responsibility others handle. It was her job to focus on small shit and do the nonsense that should make our lives easier. She'd take about one hour to even draft an email because she's so paranoid. The rest of us don't have time for that. She had this misconception that everyone else was relaxed, that everything fell on her, that everything was unfair. She just didn't get it. Although she had no self-confidence in her victimhood, she seemingly found the way to be the martyr. And that made her more arrogant than any of us. It made her distasteful to me. I went from losing interest to seeing her as a nuisance I had an urge to put down. I guess because she chose to be down and useless. Finally, I snapped at her for sending a message when I was relaxing at home on my day off. I was already telling her more and more aggressively to figure things out herself. I said, Shelly, stop asking me inane questions. Do your job, or look for something else. I'm not your tutor. She profusely apologized, used some dumb emojis. I didn't bother to reply and appease her. After that, I made a point I was not available for conversations with her, and she got the message. Now she was fully alone. Mistakes continued and got progressively worse. Well, all of our moods were pretty intense due to the workload. The more people snapped at her, the more people felt comfortable snapping at her. Fuck, it felt so good to snap at her. We snapped at each other too, but there was always a line. Not so much with her. At one point, she tried to stand her ground. I am sure she felt she's a victim of bullying who will now stand up for herself. Except, like everything she did, it completely missed the mark. 
The moment she gave one of us the attitude was when people went from talking down to her to downright animosity. People called her a moron practically to her face and within her earshot. She gave up. Now she was just sullen, gray in the face, looking physically sick. The air around her was heavy and poisonous. Then she started missing work. Whenever something went on where she knew she needed to coordinate a lot of things with a chance of something not running smoothly, she'd stay at home. Richard was already talking about her as a goner. She was now just a running joke. In fact, I'd even say it bonded us all through the stressful work period. When things went wrong and someone pointed at her, we all sympathized. Even if it was Richard saying it. Shelley's days were numbered. Thinking of it now, I'm sure she could feel she entered a state of limbo. No one even asked her to do things. In fact, sometimes one of us would ask for something she'd normally do and another person would help fully volunteer. Or we'd just politely ask someone else right past her. She was practically ignored all the time. At best, Richard would send her to get coffee or order us lunch. There was something morbid about that time. Although I have to admit her pain gave me some kind of satisfaction I find hard to explain. I guess I just didn't like her. Beyond that, I didn't want her associated with me. There was this divide between people like us and people like her. And in that, she lost her humanity to me. Who she was was wrong. She was a leech. She was an irritant. She became even physically ugly, although if you asked me at the start, I'd say she's a cute-ish average. A solid seven. Now she just seemed bloated, sickly, her skin got really bad. But the morbid part I mentioned, it was like having a dead woman walking. She was a corpse. She didn't speak. She tried to make herself invisible, but also imposed on us with her presence. You'd think she'd have the dignity or the decency to just end the misery and quit. But she would still show up where she wasn't wanted, and we watched with more morbid fascination. Richard started interviewing replacements. And then, one day before work, we got a message from Richard to stay home for the day. Apparently, that night, when everyone left, Shelley managed to stay in the building and jumped down six floors falling right in the middle of the lobby. She actually did it correctly and managed to die. I was almost impressed. Of course, there was a shock I felt at first. More accurately, surprise, but was I sad? She didn't really mean anything to me. I contemplated if I should feel guilty, but I didn't really. You don't do that for this. There must be a big, huge context behind why she didn't, and whatever my role was, it was marginal. Plus, what should I have done? Kept holding her hand and appeasing her? Even my coworkers showed some irritation after the first few generic, shit, I feel so bad for her messages. In fact, isn't it really sick to do it like that? To make it the company's issue? Well, she wasn't right in the head. We all knew it. Wasn't this just the ultimate act of passive aggression, bordering on evil? I couldn't feel bad for such a person, but I did feel defensive at the same time. I felt that her act pointed the blame at us, including me, and even though I disagreed, I couldn't shake off the discomfort that she found me responsible for what she did. But then it started. Like a virus that spread from her to us. We all started making mistakes. Not just the type of mistakes everybody makes, but bigger, stupider, more and more frequent mistakes. Some were really embarrassing. Brand showed us his Reddit profile while screen sharing during Zoom. I accidentally copy-pasted a morbid curiosity internet search to an email subject line and I can't for the life of me explain how. Mistakes got bigger. Offensive typos. Mentioning the wrong company name, sloppiness, forgetfulness during important presentations. Richard was more and more furious. 
we were annoyed at each other and downright paranoid of getting called out. The more worried we were about people noticing our mistakes, the more we were on defense looking out for those of others. We never actually talked about it to each other, because talking about it would be a type of admission of incompetence. But I'm sure we all felt that something was wrong about all this, that something was being done to us. You can say that it's easier to think you are cursed than admit your own mistakes. And on one level, I could rationalize that that was what was happening in many ways, but it also felt completely outside of my control. There was a part of me that toyed with the idea that she cursed me, or even worse, that her presence was still there doing it. This is why, of course, I never say it out loud or think it for real. Why we never talked about this suspicion and instead just got more and more frustrated with others around us. Richard started firing people. He was a wreck. I got into an argument with him and got fired too. I was shocked. I had fights with Richard before, but I always knew he'd never fire me. I was way too valuable. Now, though, he informed me that for the last few months my work had not been up to standard. That I've been informed about this several times and failed to improve and that the company suffered for it. Man, fuck that job. But I was pissed. It was actually the most literate email I've ever seen him write. Fine, I thought. I'll regroup and go somewhere else. It's a good thing I'm not working for that imbecile anymore. Plus, maybe in a new place, the curse of Shelley's incompetence would leave me. Cynthia's reaction kind of irked me, though. Instead of being supportive, she was asking me about my financial plans. She's been very naggy lately, and the more stress I had at work, the more she liked to point out my failings or absent-mindedness around the apartment. All trivial nonsense, only relevant to a bored mind. I didn't even tell her that I got fired. I told her we all got let go because the business is going bad. But I could see some doubt in the way she looked at me, like she's doubting me and my abilities. Her resentment made me resent her, though she insisted she suggested no such thing. She wasn't unsupportive. What did I say? She asked. It's not what you did. The look on your face and shit you didn't say that says it all. I replied. Perhaps a tad bit dramatically in retrospect. She called me insane. I broke something on my way out. I could hear her curse in the bedroom. It was on purpose. I shouted while slamming the door. We eventually made up, but it wasn't the same. I wasn't the same. It took me a while. Five months, actually, to find another job worth doing. And the bit of freelancing I did in between wasn't always as good as promised. I got paid only 50% of what I was supposed to for my last project because I didn't do it so well. And it had many mistakes. And no one was really rehiring me. I blamed working from home in this fucked up atmosphere with that Karen in the other room. Who'd roll her eyes whenever she passed me by as if my presence in the apartment is a sign of my fatal failure. But that little part of me had an entirely different idea about what was happening, and it certainly didn't serve to appease me about my failures. Instead, it was growing anxiety pressing on my chest. I wished it was my fault. I wished it was in my control. But not only did I know that it wasn't, that I didn't know how to change it, I also knew that no one would take my fears seriously. They'd say, a girl cursed you. She's an evil ghost that causes bad grammar. No, my friend, you're just trying to avoid taking responsibility for your own actions. You don't need an exorcist. You need a therapist. I had some savings. Mom sent some money, but Cynthia's patience was wearing thin. Good to know. I thought, well, we fought more and more. 
When I finally got a job and got fired in the first week because of a fuck up, she dumped me. Like, it wasn't about that. It was about me being different. Kind of fuck off. The way I saw it is when things start breaking down, everything follows. Of course I was fucking up. I got it into my head that I am cursed with bad luck and now I couldn't shake the insecurity and paranoia that things will go wrong. Which of course makes things go wrong. I lost my natural touch. Yes, I tried a therapist, although I wasn't crazy about it. Soon enough, I could tell he seemed annoyed at me. When I said that much, he told me I didn't say anything. I told him I saw him roll his eyes. He told me to lower my voice in a condescendingly calm tone. I flipped. He asked me to leave. Not doing that shit again. One day I ran into Richard. He looked disheveled. I've never seen him not wearing a suit before. Now he wore flip-flops, had a neck beard, and just generally looked like shit. Gained some weight, too. We didn't really talk much. He said he was fired by the board of directors, that it was for the best and that he's working on his mental health now. He was kind of hostile and reeked of alcohol, so I didn't push. I looked up Lara and found out that she attempted suicide and was now in a coma. Her sister left this message on her Facebook. I'm fucking serious. This one shocked me. I imagined this person I knew lying in a coma and felt sick to my stomach. To be fair, she wasn't a friend or someone I was that interested in aside from work. She was fun to flirt with at times, but not my type. But her humanity suddenly felt as real as mine, and her being in a coma felt like an attack on me. I can't explain it. Was it empathy or fear? But I was paralyzed. I tried getting in touch with other ex-co-workers, but found surprisingly little. One left the country and all trace of him seems lost. The other was not responsive and seemed to have deleted all accounts. Much later I learned he butchered his girlfriend and her daughter around that time, after an argument, and then calmly waited to be arrested. My life continued. I got another job eventually after my painful Discouraging interviews and eating a lot of shit to get a chance with this employment gap. I'm still not quite there. I'm so scared I'll fuck this one up. I stay working until 10pm every day just double checking everything. It's not like I have much of a life outside of work anyway. Or enough money to buy one. Even so, I'm not highly regarded and mistakes still manage to find their way into my work. Stupid errors I can't explain or understand. I notice my new co-workers rolling their eyes at me sometimes and it takes all that I have to stop myself from reaching and reacting and losing another job. Who the fuck do they think I am? Well, I know the answer to that question. I can't trust myself or my judgment, which causes me to feel constant fear. Saturday nights are the worst. The idea of a whole new week opening up in front of me, with new demands and tasks I have to go through. So many mistakes I'll fail to avoid. It makes me want to stay in bed forever. It's more panic-inducing than anything I've experienced in my life. No horror movie can match the terror of Monday morning. The worst thing about it all is that it's so unfair, and everyone who looks down on me for it is taking part in this injustice. I am being made into something I'm not, and they're all reinforcing that wrong image. For that, I hate them all. Every day I dream and fantasize about getting a gun and just shooting every motherfucker in my workplace. All these idiots who think they're better than me. And maybe Cynthia. Than myself. I stop and with less and less conviction tell myself it's just a phase. There's no curse. No ghosts. I'm not doomed. It'll pass and I'll be myself again. Just how long can a phase last? Because I'm running out of patience. And another, more and more convincing part of me wonders. 
if there is a curse that worked like a virus, could I not spread it onto them just how she did it with me? So that at least they all know what it's like and that it was never my fault. I think about life, how it all starts, how it ends. We come into this world screaming and kicking, fighting for that first breath. We are so small, so defenseless. Yet mere seconds after we emerge into the world, we are thrust into a battle that we will lose. Some begin to battle strong, fiercely challenging death, and others begin with death already at their door, fighting not just for their first breath, but... For each one that follows, I was born a cripple with a twisted spine and half-formed lungs. I should have died shortly after entering this dark world. The midwife had given me no more than two days to live and told my parents to cherish the little time they would have with me. Yet when two days came to pass, I still fought. Death would not claim me. I would not let it. So I battled with it like a lion. My father wanted to take me out into the woods and leave me to the beasts. My mother would not let him. Day in and day out, she sat there with me and she prayed as I waged my war to live. Two days turned into two months, and two months became two years. I grew stronger, breathing deeper, and my spine grew straighter. Yet, I was still weak. And this displeased my father greatly. All the village warriors were blessed with strong, healthy children who would someday take up arms and carry on the legacies of their fathers. My father was cursed with a cripple whose every breath was uncertain, a child who couldn't carry his own weight, much less the honor of the generations before. By the time I was ten, I was able to walk on my own, but still unable to run. I had no friends and spent most of my time reading books. You will never be able to swing a sword, my mother would say. But your mind is sharper than any blade, and you will use it to conquer nations. My mother was the horn that urged me on in battle. She would not let me give up. I could not quit. The children taunted me in the streets and their fathers would laugh as I limped my twisted form causing me to put forth great effort with each step. My own father had scarcely said more than ten words to me in my entire life. My mother, however, was always there to catch me when my weak legs trembled and I fell, her gentle hands always there to wipe away my tears. By fifteen, I was still the weakest amongst all the village children, yet... I bore a strength within that none of them could ever grasp. I had dueled with the cold claws of death more times than the most seasoned of warriors. I had stopped breathing more times than I could count, had fallen sick so often that I could count the days. I had been healthy on one hand, and yet I fought on. My mother often worried at the hard look in my eyes and my father no longer failed to meet my eyes out of disgust, but rather out of fear. I was a monster, often lashing out with cruel words to the healers, or coming up with wicked plans to gain revenge on those who had taunted me in the streets. The children no longer taunted me, their fathers no longer laughed at me. They all knew that I was weak, but I was also capable of doing horrible things to those who wronged me. When the Black Death came, the people placed the blame upon my shoulders, and they cursed my parents. You let that demon live among us, and now God is punishing us. Maybe they were right. Maybe my existence was an abomination. Maybe my very breaths were likened to blasphemy. My whole village would fall victim to the sickness. I myself was not spared. It's a horrid thing watching someone die of the plague. It would begin with a fever, 
the patient would get cold sweats and become extremely weak. Within hours, the tumors would appear. The death sentence. Once the tumors appeared, there was no surviving. And soon black spots would begin to form all over the afflicted. After this, death came swiftly. It is one thing to watch the sickness take someone else, but to watch it work its way through you is something entirely different. When it first came on, my mother prayed that it was simple, one of my normal bouts of sickness. But when the tumors formed, all our hope vanished. The pain was unbearable, and the fear was even worse. I had survived 16 years of the most miserable afflictions known to man, and I was simply going to die. This would be how death took me. I could do nothing. I was even more helpless now than I was as a newborn baby. Soon after I fell ill, my mother and father caught the plague as well. My father, the big strong warrior, was gone within the day. I was brought in to die next to my mother on the third day. I could scarcely recognize her. Her eyes were sunken into her skull and bulbous tumors disfigured her. But still within those cavernous sockets, I saw the loving eyes of my mother. She had been my strength, and now here she was with hardly enough strength to open her eyes. It's time to go home, Con. Her voice was weak, almost a whisper. You have to keep fighting. Death hasn't claimed you yet. Don't let it. With that, my mother let out her final breath, sighing softly. A final trumpet blast urging me on to my final battle with mortality. They had brought me here to be with my mother as I died. Yet it was she who had passed, and now, for the first time in my life, I was truly alone. I bared my teeth, and through my tears I looked out at the dark window into the night. With all the strength I had left in my dying body, I screamed a challenge into the darkness. I will not let you take me. My head collapsed back onto the mattress behind me and I softly whispered, I won't let you have me. I think it was then that death decided that it didn't want me. I fell into a deep sleep and though I had finally lost in my battle for life, but I was awakened by the sounds of birds. When I opened my eyes, light shone all around me. I was in a meadow that I recognized well. I had spent many hours laying here in the grass, daydreaming about being strong, going on raids with my father and becoming a great warrior. Now, however, everything was different. I was no longer in pain, and when I breathed in, it felt as though wind filled my lungs. I felt stronger, and when I went to stand, it was easy. I had strength in my legs and was able to stand up tall. I laughed as I ran back and forth in the meadow. I thought, surely, I had died and this was heaven. Maybe dying wasn't so bad after all. I ran back to the village, hoping to find it full of all those who had perished, hoping to find my mother. When I arrived, however, my eyes were greeted by a different sight. My village was reduced to ashes, and plague signs stood on each road entering the town. It was not hard to figure out that the town had been burned to stop the spread of the sickness. Tears welled up in my eyes, and I ran to where my house was hoping to find something still standing, but I was greeted by nothing more than burnt timbers. I slowly walked where my room had once been, and I wept. I did not know how I had suddenly grown strong, or how I had overcome the sickness, but none of that mattered to me now, because now, I was alone. I no longer knew anyone, and though I had been hated, that was better than this soul-crushing loneliness that I now felt. After sitting in the ashes for what must have been hours, I stood to my feet and wiped my eyes. A small movement in the wind caught my eye and I moved closer to inspect it. Nailed to the only beam left standing in my house was a paper with letters scrawled across it in scarlet ink. It read, If you so dearly want life, and I want no part of you.
Signed, Death. I stared at the paper incredulously for a while, and then I turned and wandered aimlessly. I wandered for years, living off the land. Several times I met the sharp end of a bandit's dagger, or felt the teeth of wolves, but each time I awoke again, I continued to age until I turned 20, and from then on nothing changed. The years passed by and the world changed around me, but I always remained the same. I lived many lifetimes and had many names. Sometimes I was a simple farmer, and sometimes a great scholar. I became a great swordsman and fought in many wars. Over the years I accumulated great amounts of wealth and influence. Yet I still felt a deep ache in my heart because I was alone. Soon life became boring and painful. So I began seeking out ways to die. Poison didn't work. It just made me mildly sick. And when I fell on my sword, I would simply reawaken in my library, the place in which I found the most joy. I tried every possible way I could think of to end my life. I joined armies and went on death missions. I incited riots, stole from nobles, and even sank ships I was on, hoping that I would find a permanent solution to the ache in my heart. Centuries passed and I could not end it, so I chose to simply try to live as normal of a life as possibly could. I came to the Americans on a boat in 1851 and bought a small piece of land in the south where I grew crops and hoped to live peacefully. My peace didn't last long and when the Civil War hit, I was driven from my land by the devastation of battle. I fled the south and went to Kansas. And it was there that I was able to make a home for myself and settle down. I was able to live peacefully through both world wars and evaded the draft in Vietnam. But life, I have learned, is much crueler than death. I moved up into Nebraska in 1996 after the residents of my Kansas home discovered that I was the same person that had been living there for over a century. Nebraska... Much like Kansas was a forgotten state, and I knew that I could avoid notice out on the plains. I spent many years on the plains, however. I grew bored and decided that it was worth the risk to move to the city. In 2015, I moved to Lincoln and got a job working at a gas station. It wasn't the best job, but it was low-key, and that's where I met Violet. It pains me to say it, but I hadn't loved anyone since my mother died. Other people seemed like ants to me. They were barely noticeable. One moment they were there, and the next, they were gone. I had lived for over six centuries and learned very quickly not to draw close to anyone, because they would die and I would live on. At first I saw myself as superior, then I looked at others with envy, but that too disappeared and was replaced by an emptiness that is, until I met Violet. It was raining that night, and the gas station hadn't had any customers. I was sitting at the counter reading a new novel and wondering how anyone could think that it was real literature. When I heard the bell ring as the door opened, I looked up to see a short young woman with long brunette hair pulling down her hood as she looked around. I inwardly groaned, annoyed that I would have to clean up the water that she had just tracked in. Then her eyes met mine, and my heart stopped. She wasn't the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. There was honestly nothing truly remarkable about her. But there was something in her eyes that made my cheeks flush, and I couldn't look away. Can I help you, dude? She asked, sounding kind of annoyed. Uh, sorry, you're just uh, the first customer I've had in a few hours. She grinned as I tripped over my words. My car broke down a little way back. Is the mechanic in? She gestured towards the auto shop sign flickering outside. I'm sorry, but he won't be in until tomorrow. I can leave you a note if you'd like. She let out a sigh of defeat and plopped at one of the chairs by the coffee machine. Is it alright if I sleep here tonight then? 
I looked at her curiously. Uh, we're about to close and I can't just leave you here. She rolled her eyes and pointed outside at the gas station sign. Dude, it literally says open 24 hours. I sighed. Yeah, it hasn't been open for a full 24 hours for a couple years. Pete, the owner, can't afford to pay us all day. If you need a ride home, though, I can give you one. She shook her head and said, Home is on the other side of the state. That's why I wanted to stay here. I shrugged apologetically and told her I wasn't sure what to tell her. She simply turned around and walked out the door saying, I'll find somewhere else. I shook my head thinking that was weird and began to start closing the station. As I was mopping up the mess she made on the floor, I looked outside and felt bad for just sending her out into the rain. There was nothing I could do now, but I didn't feel any better about it. I finished closing the store and got in my car. The roads that night were slick with rain, so I drove slowly, and it took me longer than usual to get home. As I was driving, I saw a figure hunched over the side of the road and pulled over. I rolled down my window and shouted, You okay? The figure lifted their head and my eyes met those of the gas station girl. Once again, it felt like electricity was coursing through my veins. Do I look okay, man? In case you haven't noticed, it's kind of raining out here. I wasn't sure what to do, so I just said, I, Do you want to stay at my place for the night? I've got a couch you could sleep on. I expected her to say no, but she just looked at me and said, no creepy shit, bro. And she quickly opened my door and sat down in the passenger seat. The first few minutes of the drive were spent in silence until I spoke up. I'm Connor, by the way. She pulled back her hood and looked at me with those strange eyes. My name's Violet. Nice to meet you, bro. It had been a long time since I had to have a genuine interaction with another person, so I just awkwardly sat there in silence for a few minutes. So, uh, what do you do for a living? She smiled and said, I don't really have a steady job. I've been trying to write a book for years, but I never could finish a story. I chuckled and said, I understand that. I'm having a hard time finding a good ending for my own story. Her eyes lit up. You're writing a story? What's it about? I looked out the driver's side window. I guess you could say it's a tragic story. She seemed to note the change in my mood and just nodded. When we arrived at my house and hurried inside and I flicked my light on, Violet gasped. How does a gas station attendant afford a home like this? My house wasn't necessarily a mansion, but it was large and well furnished. I uh, just inherited some money. She looked at me incredulously and said, And you are making me sleep on the couch? Don't you have guest rooms? I grinned sheepishly. They're all kind of full of books. We walked into the living room and she just stood there in wide-eyed amazement at the sheer amount of books I had lining the walls. Why do you have so many books? There's no way you could read all of these, even if you had a lifetime. I ignored her and went upstairs to grab a spare pillow and blanket. When I came down, she was holding a copy of Don Quixote. Dude, this is awesome. Where did you get all these books? I handed her the blanket and said, When I was little, my mother told me that with our minds we could conquer nations. So I've just been collecting books ever since then. She looked at me thoughtfully and said, Your mother sounds like a very smart woman. I smiled slightly. She was. If you want anything, I have some food in the fridge. Help yourself. Plates and glasses are in the cupboard above the sink. With that, I wished her a good night and headed up to my bedroom. I changed into shorts and a t-shirt and laid down in my bed. But try as I might, I couldn't sleep. My mind kept going back to those green eyes of violets. What was so special about her? Around one in the morning, I finally fell asleep, but I was awakened several hours later by the sound of banging coming from the kitchen. I got up, 
put on my jeans and a hoodie, and walked downstairs to see what was going on. The smell of scrambled eggs permeated the air and my stomach began to grumble. I walked into the kitchen and saw Violet reading Don Quixote while she sipped at some coffee and ate from a full plate of eggs. You said to help myself, she smirked. I was thinking about making you some, then I remembered that you kicked me out of the gas station. I sighed and grabbed an apple off the counter. I'll drive you to the gas station today, and we'll see about getting your car fixed. She waved a hand at me. Already taken care of. I called and some guy named Jerry towed it to the shop already. He said he'd call back when he figured out what was up with it. As if on cue, Violet's phone rang and she picked up. From the tone of her voice, it sounded like Jerry had bad news. After about five minutes of heated discussion, she hung up and glared at me. Looks like I won't have to steal this book. She said, holding up the copy of Don Quixote. The mechanic said it's going to be at least a week before it's repaired. Then he proceeded to tell me that I shouldn't drive if this is the kind of damage I do to cars. My eyes went wide and I said, uh, So what are you going to do in that week? She scratched her head thoughtfully. Hmm. I'll start by finishing this book. Then I'll drink all your coffee. And maybe I'll start writing my own book. She nodded like she thought that was a great idea, then sat back in her chair and started reading like nothing had happened. Violet wouldn't leave that week, or the next week for that matter. For the first time in six centuries, I felt love in my heart. Somehow my icy heart thawed and, though I was ancient, I felt young once more. My simple words are inadequate in describing her. And for that, I apologize. Violet was wise beyond her years, and she bore the most compassionate heart I had ever seen. She was always willing to stop in order to help someone in need. She certainly helped me. I often found her changing my perspectives or offering up wisdom that changed the course of my life. I was worried about telling her who I was, and that constantly stressed me out because as she aged, I never would and the truth would come out one way or another. One day, I finally worked up the courage to talk to her about it, and that memory is forever etched into my mind. It was a nice day. The sun was shining brightly, and we had just gone to dinner. As we were driving home, I reached over and took her hand before saying, I need to talk to you about something, babe. She looked at me with a concerned look. What's wrong? My heart beat faster than I thought possible. I was terrified that I would lose the one person that mattered to me. I told her everything. From the beginning to the end, hoping beyond all hope that she wouldn't think I was insane. When I finished, she wiped the tears from her eyes and said, I don't care if you outlive me. Just promise me one thing. I squeezed her hand. Anything. A loving smile crept up on her face and she said, Promise me that you'll love me as long as you live. A week later, I proposed to her, and we were married two months later. She wanted it to be simple. We didn't invite many people. She invited her parents, and I had no one to invite. We were married in my library. She said that was where she fell in love with me. I told her I fell in love with her the moment I saw her, and she said... Well, we aren't getting married in a gas station. I had five days with her, and then the unthinkable happened. Like I said, life is much more cruel than death. One morning as we were sitting at the table, Violet stood up to make coffee and found the coffee can empty. I didn't necessarily need coffee, but I came to learn that coffee was all she drank. I had to go to work, so I told her I would bring home some coffee. But she decided that she needed it then and there, so we walked to the cars together. Before we went our separate ways, I leaned in and gave her a kiss, taking in her beauty and staring into those caring eyes. She was my world. 
I had barely gotten to work when I received the call. I fell to my knees as the voice on the other end told me that my whole world had come crashing down. Violet had been driving to the store to buy coffee when she was T-boned. She wasn't paying attention and ran a red light, resulting in the accident that would take her from me. I was told that she died on the scene, and my heart broke. I didn't even get the chance to tell her goodbye. She was there one moment and gone the next. My whole world gone in an instant. Violet's funeral was beautiful. I made sure that she was laid to rest with everything that she loved. It sounds strange, I know, but I had to give her something. In her coffin, I placed her favorite book, Don Quixote. I knew she would have liked that. People from all around showed up to the funeral. People she had helped, friends, and her family. Her father gave me a big hug and said, She loved you, son. After her death, I tried to end it again and again. It never worked. No matter how many times I tried to do it, I would wake up at her grave. I turned to alcohol to ease the pain. I was broken and had no hope. I had only ever had two people in my life that truly cared about me. And they were both gone, ripped away from me, and I bore the curse of life so I could never see them again. It's been a year since she died, and the pain hasn't gone away. It hasn't ebbed at all. I lost my job because of my drinking, and I have been unable to find a new one. I can't pay the utilities on my house, and I have to go to the homeless shelter to get food and water. Life is no longer worth living, yet I must go on living. I had lost all hope. Until two months ago. I received a package in the mail. It was raining, and I didn't hear the mail truck drive up, but I heard a knock at my door. I pulled myself off the floor and took a long pull off the whiskey bottle in my hand. When I opened the door, there was no one there, but on the ground there was a small rectangular parcel wrapped in white cloth. I picked it up and walked to the kitchen counter, where I unwrapped the package. Inside was a book, the very same one I had buried with the woman I had loved. I ran my hand over the hardcover and tears welled up in my eyes. I didn't understand what kind of sick joke this was. Who would do this to me? I opened the book and on the first page there were words written in scarlet ink. My mind took me back to the paper that I had found in the ruins of my home 600 years ago. It was the same handwriting, but this time it said, Death is a raven. It flies overhead. Taking the brave and the craven and claiming all the den. Look, you fool, the raven cries. Can't you see the gift that you've been given? Another good person dies, and you just go on living. Violet. I looked at the paper in shock and tears welled within my eyes. I could see my folly. I had been given a gift and I wasted it. In my long life, I had served only myself, but Violet had shown me how to be selfless. I had wallowed in my own self-pity for hundreds of years and not taken notice of the gift that was given to me. A lot has happened in the two months since I received the package. I will make it short for your sake. I am dying. It seems that my body is finally failing me after all this time. Usually I heal quickly, but... The doctors say that the cancer is spreading faster than anything they've ever seen. I sold my house and donated the profits to the homeless shelter. I donated all of my books to the library. Hopefully they will find some use there. I kept one book though. I couldn't part with it. I feel like I have done so little to help the world and that is my greatest regret. This is my letter to the world. When I was young and weak, my mother's love showed me how to be strong, it showed me how to not quit, how to never let anything stop me. It gave me strength, yet when my mother died, none of that strength could help me, and my heart filled with ice and even death could not thaw it. 
Yet when I was old and had seen the changing of the world many times, Violet taught me to be vulnerable, to be caring. It was love that made me strong, and in the end, it was love that made me weak. I see them both now, Violet and my mother. They both beckon me home. I apologize for cutting this so short, but the door stands open. And I must walk through before it closes. The hills around the cabin were barren, nothing but ice and rocks, but I knew we'd find the tree here. My brother and I had been in the cabin for two weeks, completing ritual after ritual. Jason was frustrated with the process, but I kept the faith for us both. Once again, I prepared for an ice bath. I redrew the pagan runes on the floorboards around the clawfoot tub while Jason made trips outside bringing snow and chunks of ice by the bucket full. Help me get inside, I told him. My brother was just shy of his 23rd birthday, but his red beard was already streaked with gray. He took my hand and helped me into the tub where the ice set upon my bare skin like a thousand tiny daggers. The book, I said. He retrieved the faded leather-bound text from the vanity. It was old and brittle, and we took great care to not get the pages wet. You can't even understand that stuff. He complained as I began repeating the prayer. Jason knew quite well that one needn't make a literal translation. It was less about the words and more about the intent behind them. But we'd already had that argument a dozen times now. He sunk into the chair near the tub and held his hunting rifle in his lap while I repeated the rough proto-Norse text through chattering teeth. After a time, my skin went numb, even as those icy daggers sunk into my bones. But the ice had begun to melt. M more ice, I told him. Jason went outside with the bucket. I continued the prayers. He returned a few minutes later, but without the ice bucket. Premature wrinkles had set in around his eyes, and I could have sworn his beard had grayed further. Morgan? He said. It worked. The elder pine had sprouted through ice and rock, roughly fifty yards from the cabin. I gazed upon it from the window. It was a towering thing, thick with pine needles. The trunk, at its base, must have been twenty feet wide. The pine blocked out the sun, casting an impenetrable shadow over the cabin. The elder pine was both majestic and stomach-turning. Just looking at it filled me with dread. A passerby might have wondered how a mere tree, however large, could permeate such foreboding. Such a sense of wickedness. But this was no mere tree. The whimpering started in the basement again. Jason glanced at the trap door, securely padlocked. He wore the key on a chain around his neck. His tools sat on a table near the trap door. An acetylene torch with an accompanying face shield. Jute rope and string. Pincers and knives. A battery-powered angle grinder. Needles and bits of thread. Let's just go home, he said. It's too late to go home, I answered. I rushed outside before I could reconsider. The raw North Arctic wind promptly gnawed on my naked body. I hadn't gotten dressed after the ice bath, and Jason shouted for me to wait. As I approached the tree, I swore I could see a pair of silver eyes watching me through the pine needles. I stopped before the elder pine. Its shadow was so thick it was like night had fallen. Its branches rattled and something hidden within them let out a low, rumbling growl. It was me, I told the elder pine. I called upon you. The silver eyes narrowed. The branches rustled again. 
I very nearly gave in to my fear, but somehow stood my ground and opened my mouth wide to accept the elder pine. A wet, fleshy proboscis shot out from the branches and filled my mouth. I gagged reflexively, but didn't pull away. Somewhere behind me, Jason was screaming my name. The proboscis pushed through my epiglottis aside and entered my larynx in a crude pantomime of medical intubation or oral sex. Panic rolled through my gut when I attempted to draw out and couldn't. The tree's appendage wiggled down my airway, then released its sap into my lungs. I don't remember much about the way we grew up. I guess I blocked most of it out. Maybe due to selective amnesia or PTSD. Our father kept us in a room beneath the basement. A room he'd constructed himself. I don't remember what he did to us. I mainly remember the room, the dingy mattress, the ever-present musk of shit and piss from the tin buckets that served as our bathroom. Jason used to say he remembered it all, the things our father did before the cops closed in and he ran off, before they found us. I don't remember very much aside from the way our father would enter the room with hungry eyes, Eyes like a jackal, and a flask in his fist. A week passed. There were more rituals. Prayer. Days long fasts. In the den in front of the fireplace, I'd drawn a series of runes in a rough circle. I slept there each night on the floor. It wasn't an easy sleep. The visitors outside the cabin didn't help. I could see them in the dark, moonlight dancing off their blue eyes as they gathered like rats around the cabin. They chittered and growled and liked to throw rocks. Jason jumped every time a stone thumped off the walls of the roof. He'd been keeping his rifle close. Morgan, we can just go. He said. If you really want to go, then go. I said softly. But I'm not leaving until we know where he's hiding. Jason wouldn't leave. He hadn't left me before. He wouldn't leave me now. Down in the cabin's basement, the whimpering started again. I noticed the start of the transformation the following morning. As I brushed my hair, I found pine needles in the comb. Something on my back had begun to itch fiercely. I took off my robe. It was tree bark, gray-brown and dripping with sap. As I ran my fingers across it, my stomach suddenly cramped, like something inside wanted out. My knees buckled before I could reach the toilet and I retched on the floor. I gagged and strained, yet the thing rolling up from my guts came slowly, scratching at my throat and unable to breathe. I got it up with one final violent spasm. I'd vomited a nearly perfect sphere of sage and mistletoe, though something was moving inside of it. I cracked it open, although a film of blood and bile and saliva, and found a writhing cluster of insects, mostly weevils and bark lice. Morgan? Jason asked. He'd been watching from the doorway, he covered his mouth from the smell of the halved sphere and the insects inside it, then attempted to squash it under his boots. I wouldn't let him. I closed the halves and massaged the sage and mistletoe until the sphere was whole again. It's a gift from him. I said, holding the pulsating ball in my hand. It's our first decoration. Several seconds passed before Jason realized what this meant. We'll be needing more decorations then, he finally replied. Better get into the basement, I said. There would be three days of midnight sun, a time to feast and prepare. After, there'd be polar nights until the ritual was over. The midnight sun was peaceful, though, and it kept our blue-eyed visitors away. 
As the bark sprouted across my skin, the cold bothered me less, which was good, as I spent most of my time outside. This was a feast, after all, and I could no longer eat solid food. I stood outside, naked except for the bark, and drank in the sunlight. Little roots grew from my feet, slacking my thirst via moisture in the soil. And when the wind gusted across the hills, my branches swayed and my pine needles rattled. It would have been pleasant, if not for the sounds coming from the house. Blood-curdling reminders of what horrors awaited us. Jason was still busy with the decorations. The woman in the basement, of course, simply would not stop screaming. Though driven by vengeance, my heart wasn't made of stone. Every wail of anguish that escaped the woman's lips felt like a nail being driven through my body. Truthfully, I don't know how Jason went through with it. Every thump of his machete, every corresponding scream from the woman reminded me just how much my big brother loved me. There is one memory from just before the cops found us. When our father had realized he'd have to flee the law... Again, I don't remember the specifics, precisely what my father had done to me before he made his hasty getaway. Whatever he'd done, though, he did it in a rush. He wasn't gentle. Jason had begun to reach puberty. Despite our scant nutrition, he was growing larger, more muscular. Once or twice, Jason intervened when our father set his sights on me. Soon our father found that it was easier to keep Jason chained to the wall with a steel collar around his neck. The memory begins with me on that dingy mattress. Jason was sitting, staring at the floor. His neck had turned purple with bruises. While our father had tended to me, Jason fought and struggled against his chains so savagely that he nearly crushed his windpipe against the collar. I'm going to kill that motherfucker. Jason rasped. Then the cops broke through the wall. As the first polar night set in, I struck my pose in the den, across from the fireplace. Though it sounded utterly mundane compared to the other rituals, holding one's pose was of critical importance. My feet ached, especially when more roots sprouted from my toes and soles, inching across the floorboards in a Futile search for water and soil. A terrible pain flared in my shoulders. As I wasn't able to rest my arms or lower them to my sides. What with all my new branches. I spoke only when necessary and took immense care not to move my bark line lips too much when I did. It's time to hang the ornaments. I told Jason. Outside, the visitors had returned. They were louder now and dared to creep ever closer to the cabin. I fought my growing dread, tooth and nail. Now that I was mostly rooted to the floor, escape was likely impossible. If I gave in to my fear, my mounting panic, and let myself even for one fraction of a second consider blacking out, I knew I'd be unable to recover my willpower. So I stood perfectly still as Jason hung the ornaments. There was a tongue, bright red, the color of poinsettia. There were bits of the woman's scalp with the hair still attached, through which Jason threaded silver tinsel. There were lengths of flayed flesh, wet and dripping, that Jason draped around my branches like garlands. He finished with those, but the ornamentation wasn't done. He still needed to crown my head with a star. She won't survive the last part, Jason said, so we'll have to wait. Then the lights went out, not just those powered by our generators, but our flashlights as well. Their bulbs suddenly winking out. The heater went soon after. Jason lit a candle. Down in the basement, the woman began to moan again. Jason's watch and cell phone died with the lights, so there was no way to tell how much time had passed. 
Jason wore extra layers to keep warm as he sat near me with his rifle, a candle burning on the floor between his boots. Every time one of the visitors scratched at the walls or thumped across the roof, he gripped the rifle tighter. My eyes were drawn to the fireplace. There was frost in the firebox, not snow dust from the open flue, but a layer of ice. As I watched it, little frozen tendrils spread wider. Make the star. I whispered, he's coming. Though all our electronics had died, somehow the battery for the angle grinder was still at full power. This was a small mercy for the woman in the basement. I suppose as it meant Jason wouldn't have to use a hacksaw. He went to the basement. I heard his muffled voice saying, just hold still, it's almost over. When the grinder blade shrieked against bone and the woman screamed. She screamed so loud that it nearly drowned out the wild, chittering from the visitors, crowding around the cabin. Jason returned with a seven-pointed star built mostly from the woman's ribs. He fashioned it to my head with some string. Jason's hands were still slick with blood and, I noticed, he didn't bother locking the trapdoor behind him. He collapsed into his chair. The frost from the mouth of the fireplace had spread farther, creeping now across the floor. Once the star was in place, the visitors quieted down. A bolt of fear shot through me as I knew the final test was going to begin soon. Jason? I gasped, right before the visitors kicked in the front door and swarmed inside. My big brother shot up from his chair and aimed his rifle into the dark. Outside the halo of candlelight, I saw little shapes and their bright blue eyes, then muzzle flashes as the room filled with gunshots. Still, I didn't move a muscle. Not even when the candle blew out and Jason screamed in pain. The visitors worked feverishly in the dark, grunting and squealing as they went about their wet, messy business. The room was pitch black. It made no difference at all if my eyes were opened or closed. Jason had known this might happen. The text made it clear that while the visitors were unlikely to harm the tree, there was no guaranteeing the safety of anyone else taking part in the ritual. As the visitors pulled him apart, Jason never tried to run. He would never leave my side. Through it all, as always, he remained with me until the end. The visitors finished and left the cabin. Several candles sparked up on their own, placed on the floor in the shape of a seven-pointed star just like the one Jason fashioned to my head. I'd been in the dark so long the candlelight stung my eyes. The visitors had placed Jason inside the star, or the bits of him that were left. They'd gutted him, then hung his innards around my branches, adding to the ornaments. Using his blood, they left elaborate paintings on the walls, though one stood out more than the others. It was a painting of Jason and me, holding hands with our father looming behind us in the background, and I remained perfectly still. The polar nights remained silent, not even the visitors made a peep outside, and the ice frosting in the fireplace spread across the room like cancer cells, metatastasizing in a smoker's lung. Then the winter took a deep breath and exhaled. The ice that had overtaken the room hardened into something like permafrost. Since my transformation, the cold hadn't bothered me much, but now I felt it gnawing at me. A dusting of ice crystals gusted from the firebox, then danced before me like broken glass shards caught in the wind. Though I'd been still for days, this was the critical moment. Any movement, however slight, would anger him, for Father Christmas was quite stern. I didn't want to think about what punishments might await me if this humble tree displeased him. The ice crystal spun and danced, then coalesced into the ghostly shape on his face, angular and nearly skeletal, with a white beard of snow jutting sharply from his chin. 
The ice of his face was so immaculate and flawless that when I looked into his eyes, I saw my dreadful reflection. He spoke. I didn't understand his rough, ancient tongue. A language even older than the Proto-Norse from the texts I suspected, but I grasped the meaning of it. I want to know where my father is hiding, I said. He studied me. He inspected the ornaments upon my branches. He even brushed against me. The chill of his touch was unearthly. It was the cold one must have felt naked in space. The cold that resides in the frozen bellies of glaciers. The cold of a dead universe that has never known so much as a flicker of starlight. Father Christmas nodded. This humble tree had pleased him. Your gift? He said, and his voice was the sound of tectonic plates scraping against one another, and the icy ghost before me blew away like loose snow in a wind gust. The polar night retreated. The sun returned vindictively, setting the world aflame, and I screamed as the morning fire turned my branches to cinders, as it burned the bark from my naked flesh and reduced the ornaments to ash. I tumbled to the floor, fully human once more. The seven-pointed star atop my head shattered. On my hands and knees, I noticed a small red gift box sitting beside Jason's remains. The box was tied shut with a ribbon woven from gold and silver. It came apart with the gentlest tug. I pulled the lid of the box. There was a single piece of paper inside. Upon the paper, there was an address. Our father's address. It was time to go claim my gift. 